Testing. Testing audio. Testing, testing board chambers audio. This is a test of the board chambers audio. Testing, testing. Testing. Awesome.
Maria Hernandez, if you could come see me. Maria Hernandez, if you could please come see me.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much. Good morning. This is our August 13th regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors. The first item of business is the roll call, which will permit us to establish the presence of a quorum. Let me ask the clerk to please call the roll. Supervisor Ellenberg? Here. Supervisor Wasserman? Here. Supervisor Cortese? Here. Vice President Chavez? Here. And President Simidian? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you very much. The presence of a quorum having been established, we are able to do our business. And the sound of a phone out there reminds me that this would be a good time for me to ask you to all please check your cell phones and make sure they're in the off or silent position, if you could, please. <coughs> Thank you very much. The next item of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you are able, please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be led today by Supervisor Susan Ellenberg. Supervisor? Thank you once again. And that takes us to item number three, which is our invocation. And item number three, the invocation, uh, I will turn to Supervisor Cortese, who will introduce his invocator today, please. Supervisor Cortese, thank you. Well, thank you, President Simidian. Um, please um, come on up, uh, Samina. Uh, Samina Sundas has lived um, her life in Santa Clara County since 1983, right? And um, we're going to let you get, let me give you a brief introduction before you start, all right? Um, in 19, her life changed like so many uh, others of us after the terrorist attacks on September 11th, 2001. Uh, after 9 11, fear of Muslims rose and hate crimes against Muslims increased. Uh, Samina felt she was being treated as an outsider, so she decided to do something about it and form an organization that would ease the fears and build relationship with members from the Muslim community. Two years later, Samina founded American Muslim Voice with the purpose uh, to foster lifelong relationships between Muslims and all communities through interfaith dialogue. Um, she has certainly succeeded at that and has uh, often hosted many of us in, in large events, including iftars during uh, the time of Ramadan. She often devotes 18 hours a day to social activism and serves as a member of the steering committee for multi-faith voices for peace and justice. She's also a co-founder of the Fear to Friendship group, which is dedicated to promoting cross-cultural friendship. She founded Global Peace Partnership, a partnership of American Muslim Voice, Global Peace Partners, and Peace Alliance, to foster friendships among all Americans by bridging the cultural and religious gap. She has been working with our local peace partners to create a culture of peace, acceptance, mutual respect, and harmony for our children. And she has served, uh, directly served the County of Santa Clara as well. So uh, thank you for being here, uh, Samina. If we can just give her a round of applause before she gets started for invitation. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. May peace be upon all of you. First of all, my deepest condolence to the family of victims of Gilroy and every other place on earth. Dear God, grant my fellow human beings the hearts that could feel the pain of others and help them understand immigrants are people just like them. Help them understand when immigrants come to USA, they bring their hopes and dreams and cultures and the goodness and the food and everything good. All they want is the same thing what we want for our kids. Immigrants are mothers, fathers, children, grandparents, uncles, aunts, and friends, just like we are in America. Please, when you see them, see them as human beings and allow them to nurture here. Open your minds, hearts, and homes for your fellow immigrants. When Prophet Muhammad moved from Makkah to Medina, Medina people asked him, 
how can we help the people who migrated? Now, let me just assure you, this is not practiced anywhere on earth right now, but that was a beautiful brotherhood he created. He said, go get everything you have in your house and share 50% with your people, with your brothers who have migrated to Medina. Can you imagine the life? Forget about sharing 50%. If only we just help them establish their families here and treat them as human beings. Dear God, please allow us to do just that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, members of the public, uh, that takes us to item number four, which is to announce adjournments in memoriam. Uh, we have uh, a number today, regrettably. Uh, the first uh, is um, for Christopher Dawes, and it's my privilege to say just a few words about the passing of Chris Dawes, who was the CEO of the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford, um, and someone I had the privilege of knowing for probably 25 years. Um, in addition to being CEO of uh, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital and the good work they did there, Chris uh, was kind enough to serve as a member of our Santa Clara Family Health Plan board uh, over a great many years. Um, he was um, a real contributor there. When he passed away at the end of June at the age of 68, um, Susan Packard Orr, who was a longtime member of the hospital's board of directors and the daughter of the hospital's founder, Lucille Packard, described Chris as a very gentle and low-key guy. Uh, that was true, but he was much, much more than that. He was a person, in my every experience, who carried himself with decency uh, and dignity and who was dedicated to the well-being of everyone he served. Uh, he will be missed. And uh, I am appreciative that the board has uh, given me the opportunity today to ensure that we remember Chris as we adjourn our meeting later today. That takes us to the next adjourn in memory, which uh, I believe Supervisor Wasserman and Cortese uh, will be um, handling on our next item. Let me start with Supervisor Wasserman. Thank you. I'd like to adjourn today in memory of Eddie Poppy Owens. Eddie Owens passed away on June 28th at Stanford Hospital with his wife, Helen. Their sons, grandchildren, and other close family surrounding him as he lost his valiant fight against a rare autoimmune condition. Eddie was a husband, a father, and a grandfather. He was a friend to almost everyone he met with his welcoming smile and easy conversation. He loved golf, cowboy boots, country and western music, fine wines, Italian foods, jokes, good cigars, and hunting trips with his son Dominic and close friends. A San Jose Sharks fan, Eddie went to games with his son Chris and family for the past 25 years. If help was needed, Eddie was there. When Helen frequently said, Eddie can do it, he always did it willingly. Their mutual love and strong partnership benefited many charities and nonprofits throughout Silicon Valley. Eddie was a past president and board member of both Christmas in the Park and the American Musical Theater. He also served on the board of San Jose Children's Musical Theater and chaired many golf tournaments benefiting O'Connor Hospital. Eddie always partnered with Helen in her philanthropic, excuse me, efforts for area nonprofits, including JW House, Hope Services, Sacred Heart Nativity Schools, Cristo Rey High School, Italian American Heritage Foundation, Little Italy San Jose, Notable Music and Arts, American Cancer Society, Fundraisers such as the Cattle Barons Ball and the Santa Clara University and the School Boards of Fellows. Eddie and Helen shared the Distinguished Citizen Award from Silicon Valley Monterey Bay Council, Boy Scouts of America in 2007, and were recently recognized by Little Italy in San Jose. He was born November 19, 1945, in Bakersfield to Louise, excuse me, Louise and Maude Owen, moving to San Jose at the age of three. A graduate of James Lick High School, he attended San Jose City College and worked to, at Coast County's Trucking. Friday and Saturday nights were cruise nights in downtown San Jose. One night, in a scene reminiscent of American graffiti, Eddie spotted Helen, who was cruising 
with her cousin Carol and her good friend Rosalie. Eddie followed them as they cruised first and second streets, and when they pulled into Mel's drive-in, Eddie parked right next to them, saying his car radio wasn't working. Eddie asked to listen to Helen's radio, joining her and her friends in her car to listen to the radio. Later that night, Eddie told a buddy that he had met his future wife. After their wedding in 67, Eddie went to work for his father-in-law's, bless you, Marchese Farms, with properties in both Santa Clara and the San Joaquin Valleys. Eddie's job working the ranches was often dawn to dusk, seven days a week, supervising the planting, growing, and harvesting of cherries, apricots, tomatoes, onions, beans, and other row crops. As his two sons, Chris and Dominic, grew, they learned about the family business. The Marchese Farms Cherry Orchard at the corner of Homestead and Lawrence is now the site of Kaiser Permanente's Santa Clara Hospital and also JW House, which Helen and Eddie were instrumental in establishing. As orchards and farms gave way to housing and buildings, Marchese Farms became Marchese family properties, focusing on shopping centers and other properties. Eddie and Helen shared a love of Christmas, and every year, right after Halloween, Eddie would pack up much of their house and bring out their 250 cartons of holiday decor from wall hangings, towels, soaps, and china salt and pepper shakers. By Thanksgiving, the Owens home was Christmas central, and they generously invited friends to come by and enjoy, especially those with small children. Many considered Eddie the Valley's own Santa. In 2017, Eddie and Helen celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary by renewing their vows at Mission Santa Clara and hosting a party at Seascape in Aptos. That same year, they attended the Country Music Awards in Nashville, where Eddie was very much at home in his cowboy hats, boot, and Western clothing. He loved creating family memories by organizing trips to Hawaii, Disney World, and Disneyland for his sons, grandchildren, nieces, and nephews. In addition to Helen, Eddie leaves behind their sons, Chris and Dominic. Grandchildren who will remember the man they called Poppy are Nicholas, Caleb, Bailey, Jolena, Cheyenne, Callista, and Charlotte. He's also survived by his sisters, Helen, and her family in and her family of Pearland, in Pearland, Texas, and Donna Sweet and her family in Renton, Washington. Eddie will be missed by his brother-in-laws, Chris Marchese, his wife Lisa, their children Joey, Elise, Pauline, and Andrew. And with that, I turn it over to Supervisor Cortese. Well, thank you, uh, Supervisor Wasserman and President Smitty. And um, I'll just say a few words um, uh, on a personal note. Um, we have, uh, my own family has a long family connection um, uh, going back uh, to James Slick High School in the 1940s, uh, Eddie uh, and one of my uncles, John Cortese, were in school there at James Lick uh, together. Um, and then subsequently um, with uh, the common agricultural history between the two families, um, uh, there had been steady communication uh, between us um, uh, for at least 60, 70 years or so as, uh, as the generations of the family unfolded. Um, I know um, that the county employees here who have staffed uh, the Sister, uh, Sister County Florence Commission um, extend their condolences as well. Um, Helen Marchese Owen and Eddie Owen um, were very, very generous uh, for years and years in, in supporting the work of that commission, uh, which has now been um, one of our successful commissions um, for over 30 years. Uh, I know that they celebrated 50 years of marriage in, um, in 2017, um, and uh, over that period of time, uh, probably um, uh, one of the most grateful um, beneficiaries of, of their work in the community was uh, the University of Santa Clara. Um, I was uh, able to attend the celebration of life. It was no surprise um, that there, were, uh, there was an overwhelming uh, crowd of people there uh, from the entire community, and particularly those from the Italian-American community that, that went back generations uh, with his family. So we'll miss uh, Eddie. Uh, I know Helen will miss him more. Um, and I appreciate um, my colleagues giving me a chance to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Cortese and Supervisor Wasserman. Supervisor Cortese, I believe you have one more adjourn in memory today. Yes, and I know there's uh, no one here representing um, uh, Ernie Brolio's family, but we wanted to uh, ask uh, for the adjournment today to acknowledge his passing as well. Ernie Brolio was a former major league pitcher um, who, who really became kind of a favorite son of this 
uh, community here at San Jose. And uh, he was uh, known uh, not only for his exploits as a Major League Baseball player, first playing for the Oakland Oaks, uh, the New York Giants, uh, briefly for the San Francisco Giants uh, before uh, he was traded to the St. Louis Cardinals um, just shortly after the team moved to San Francisco in 1958. But we want to acknowledge him more than anything for his community work here with young people, with little leagues. Uh, uh, he was not only a role model, but um, you know, as, as, as deaths oftentimes have a shocking effect on people in the community, it was really uh, the folks in this community here in Santa Clara County involved with youth, youth sports that were uh, the most shocked by Ernie's passing. So thank you uh, to my colleagues for remembering Ernie Brolio today. Thank you, Supervisor Cortese. Colleagues, that uh, brings us to three additional adjourn in memories, and these are um, always difficult, but these are particularly difficult. And um, that, of course, is to adjourn our meeting today in honor and memory of Stephen Romero and Kayla Salazar and Trevor Irby. And let me first mention that we do have friends and family who are here in the chambers with us for this acknowledgement. We want to thank you and express our sympathies. See, we also have representatives from the city of Gilroy, including the mayor and the city administrator, Roland Velasco, the mayor and city administrator gave, and I think we also have a council member or two with us as well. Thank you for being here, and please know that we share in your grief. Um, before I turn to Supervisor Wasserman, uh, I, I do want to say a few words, and that is that the loss of any life is a tragedy, but it is particularly tragic when those we lose are so very, very young. A six-year-old boy, a 13-year-old girl, a 25-year-old young man, young people who will never have a chance to laugh or to cry or to know joy or to know sorrow, to fall down and then get up again, to hug or be hugged, to love or be loved. Who knows what life had in store for them, what potential has been lost. We obviously can't know and now we will never know. Stephen Romero, the little six-year-old boy with just that extraordinary smile that most of us first saw under really tragic circumstances. The newspaper described him as a puckish six-year-old boy with a bright smile, round face and flirty, I think was the way one of his family members described him. A very outgoing kid, very loving. The uncle who called him El Romantico, who had just finished kindergarten. Kayla Salazar, 13 years old, just a few days shy of her 14th birthday, looking forward to that birthday and hoping for a puppy. Described again by family members and friends as gentle and sweet and close with her family. One of her family members described her as a compassionate and loving little girl. Trevor Irby, Friends from the East and remember Trevor is online as a guy with a dimpled smile and an affable nature, a really wonderful friend. An online comment characterized him as a kind and positive soul. He was headed back to Rochester next year with his girlfriend to begin his life as a young adult. I described these three victims, but obviously I never knew them. I read about them in the newspaper. But for their family and friends who are with us today, they were beloved and then gone. But let me say not gone because we will adjourn in their memory today so that they will always be with us. Mr. Wasserman, I turn to you. Thank you. You mentioned it um, at the beginning of your, your speaking points, Mr. President. But I would like to acknowledge we have Mayor Roland Velasco here. 
We have City Council Member Peter Leroy Munoz and City Manager Gabe Gil Gonzalez from the City of Gilroy. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all to everyone else, family members of the three that we're honoring today in memoriam and the friends and family of all those and, and all those affected. I, uh, I had no words at all for what took place here in our county, in our city, at a, at a, a garlic festival, a fundraiser for, for nonprofits staffed by thousands of volunteers, community members, kids doing community service, service clubs, nonprofits, faith-based organizations. All the people there were volunteers trying to raise money for charities and, and less fortunate organizations and individuals and this, this senseless thing took place. And the fact that we're honoring today Stephen and Kayla and Trevor, it's, it's the right thing to do, but it sure as heck is sad. And I wanna tell you on behalf of myself and the board, and I know our president speaks for our board and the rest of us up here, how very sorry we are that this happened to your community, to your residents, our residents, and to all the family and friends that, that were affected. I have to give a shout out to the first responders, public safety, the medical individuals, the hospitals and everywhere else and the whole collaboration that took place, and I'll, I'll look to you three gentlemen, because of your leadership, because of your Herculean efforts nonstop, getting the city of Gilroy to come together in a time of crisis, the Gilroy strong expression came forward, and I think that really, really, really describes well the people in Gilroy, the residents of Gilroy, the men, women, and children and organizations of Gilroy coming together during this time. And I am so sorry we are here today for this reason. We are here to honor those that have passed. We will always remember them and um, we'll continue to work for, with you and, and do all that we can to help prevent such incidents in the future, these senseless incidents. But um, my condolences to all and I look forward to the uh, rest of this morning's event, Mr. President, as far as honoring the three that were adjourning today's meeting in, in their honor. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Supervisor Wasserman. Let me turn now to <clears throat> the rest of our colleagues, beginning with our board vice president, Supervisor Chavez, uh, as well as expressing my appreciation to you, Supervisor, for your work with the families over these last couple of weeks. Thank you. Um, I, I want to start out by um, acknowledging a couple of things that I was not surprised by but really struck by. And one is that in the act of terror, how much heroism we saw. We saw families protecting families and neighbors protecting neighbors and people who didn't know each other protecting each other. And it, for such a terrible event to bring out the very best in uh, who we are as a community, a very diverse engaged, loving community. I too want to share my, um, just my deep appreciation for all of our public sector um, workers who, St. Louis, VMC, the sheriffs, the Gilroy Police Department, all of the support we got from San Jose Police and others in our community, the FBI, just the just the leadership that was that was expressed there. In particular, I wanted to thank um, and acknowledge the the work of the victim witness teams that really got out there and really supported our community. And it just makes all the difference in the world that families and people who um, weren't weren't direct victims, but who had post traumatic stress and other things come on, that we were there ready to respond. And to that point, I also just wanted to say for any of you who are still in need of um, mental health services that we do have a representative here at, that is ready to coordinate. And I don't, if that person could raise their hand, my staff was, oh, well, there you go. Casey always raises her hand. There you go. So, um, so just, just to, to finish up and say the following, um, everybody grieves in their own way. 
And I think the county, and I really wanted to thank Supervisor Simidian for making this a more formal thing than we normally do, in part because I think um, this is an opportunity for us to grieve and to support the families um, and our community and also to move on to healing and action, which we'll be talking more about later in the day. But to that end, I wanted to um, particularly invite up one of the family members who would like to speak on behalf of Kayla Salazar, and if um, I think he would say is here, would you like to come forward now? And we are joined with um, by Kayla's mother, uncles, and aunts, and I, I just want to thank them for allowing us to share um, in their grief because it's a hard thing to do to share the, share a loved one like Kayla with the public, and she's. And the, and the family's willing to do that. So a very hearty thank you for you doing that. Welcome. Thank you. I've been, I've been to this podium so many times, <laughs> but I'm particularly um, touched today. Um, we just wanted to thank um, everybody who has helped us during this difficult times. Um, you know, there's so many things I can say about Kayla. Um, she was born in Marin County. Um, her father, Juan Salazar, mother, Lorena Pimentel de Salazar, who is here, and her whole family love her unconditionally. Her in intelligence, her strength, her tenacity motivated everybody to move forward. She had a love for animals and a dedication to dogs. <laughs> Um, she never gave up and was continues continued courageously to move forward despite her struggle to achieve her academic goals. She made everybody smile, creating engine, like creative videos um, and love science and technology. She wanted to create a career in, in animation, designing and creating characters and stories. She aspired to continue caring for animals. She loved helping others and loved showing generosity for other people. Kayla is a hero for the whole community and we're here uh, not just in the representation of Kayla but um, to all the victims. Um, this is a really difficult pain for us to bear um, and we believe that it's important for us as a family to um, want justice and for all of the victims. We want to ask um, to, to create some type of change. Um, I have come to terms that it doesn't matter um, like whether or not I get all the money in the world or, or the things in the world. The person I lost will never be back with us. But we believe that Kayla was very loved by everyone and will always be in our hearts for her pure, beautiful life teachings that she left with us. She's our guardian angel. Kayla Salazar, her presence and her love will transcend in all of us. And we just want to thank you all for allowing us the opportunity to be here. Um, we do feel like as a family it's important for us to see a change so this doesn't happen again. And there's no another family losing a loved one um, to violence. Um, and I just want to thank you all for that and um, just say that Kayla was our hero and that we'll always have her in our hearts. And um, I know other victims' families couldn't be here, but um, I think we're all just bearing a really difficult pain for all of us. But thank you. Thank you for honoring us with your presence and your family's presence. Thank you uh, very much, Supervisor Chavez. Let me turn to other members of the board who may wish to offer comments at this time. Supervisor Ellenberg. Thank you, President Simidian. Um, and thank you for, for speaking up and for sharing a small glimpse of, of Kayla with all of us. Um, Everyone up here is a, a parent or an aunt or an uncle or close to 
close to a child. And for everyone, this is an unimaginable loss and source of pain. I want to share um, my gratitude for all of the, the first responders and the personnel who helped that night, who continued to help and serve. And I particularly want to call out our medical professionals, doctors, nurses, um, and other personnel. I had the opportunity to visit Valley Medical Center the morning after the shootings and had the opportunity not only to, to talk with some of the survivors, but with so many of the nurses. And what impressed me and filled my heart in the midst of this of this awful tragedy was hearing how many people came in that night, not on their shift, not when they needed to work, not without being asked, not with not waiting to be asked, but showed up, said, how can I help? Stayed through the night, took care not only of the patients, but of each other. I imagine that it's, it's traumatic as well to be on the caregiving end of such a horrific happening. And what I saw that morning was incredible camaraderie, care for each other, um, a dedication to your craft, your profession, and to the humanity of, of everyone in that building. I see that you're all here today, probably not in anticipation of my thanking you for that, but it's just such a, a tremendous perspective. Um, the work that you all do is critical and invaluable, and you're there at the moments when, when we need help and care and support the most. So. I want to thank you, thank you for that. And thank you for all for being part of a community that will be resilient and that will do what so many try to keep us from doing, which is move ahead, care about each other, love each other, and build a stronger community. Thanks. Supervisor Cortese. Thank you, President Smidian. Um, I, um, First of all, I echo the sentiments of my colleagues. I was um, able to attend the services at Our Lady of Guadalupe Church over on San Antonio, which is a church um, that I attend, um, where I attend Sunday Mass most Sundays, uh, where my own children served as, as altar servers when they were Kayla's age and, and a little younger. Um, and there's always a feeling of extended family in that Catholic parish that there's almost a natural tendency uh, to look after one another, um, either because of threats around immigration, um, different, a different kind of violence than this that sometimes exists uh, in that particular area around organized crime violence. It's a close-knit community what was absolutely compelling and devastating during that service was the sharing that the family so generously shared with the rest of us of the photos of Kayla's birthday celebrations starting off at an early, early age, toddler, I believe, all the way up to her most recent birthday. Birthdays are a great tradition for us, all of us and all of our families in terms of a celebration of life, especially for young people. They tend to want to celebrate them more than us seniors, right? But to be celebrating her life at a funeral service while watching that video display rotate those photos of our previous birthdays is something that I'll, I'll never forget in terms of our own obligation to try to do more, to try to do more 
we just have to do more. It's not even a matter of try. We just have to do more. I know on today's agenda, there's a couple of items uh, that we'll be taking up that have to do with firearms violence um, and trying to prevent that. Those are just small steps forward. It, it also struck me while I was in the church that churches themselves have been places of these kinds of attacks. Uh, schools, of course, we're familiar with, and any number of other convenings or gathering places. And this is something different for those of us who have been around for a while. It's a different kind of a, a need for law enforcement, I think, much like before September 11th, we took for granted that our airports were safe. After September 11th, we had to dramatically change our approach. So I appreciate the family's request, Kayla's family's request very much for change as a response to what happened to Kayla, change. Um, we definitely need to change our, our approach just as dramatically as we did with international terrorism after September 11th. This is domestic terrorism and it's something that we need to completely respond to as comprehensively as we possibly can because I believe, and I, I know I speak the same words that my colleagues would speak on this topic, the fundamental, the most fundamental principle of our democracy is that young children can feel safe in their own communities. So we will, we will effectuate change and thank you, President Simidian, for allowing me to say a few words. Thank you, Supervisor Cortese. Thank you again to all of my colleagues. Our thanks again and our condolences to the family, to the entire community of Gilroy and beyond. We will, uh, colleagues, at this time, be taking a brief recess because the board will assemble and then make its way to the James McEntee Plaza to raise our flags once again to full staff. At the direction of Supervisor Chavez and myself, the flags have been at half staff for the past two weeks. That is considered an extraordinary gesture, but it is an extraordinary tragedy. Today, uh, during this brief recess, I've asked Supervisor Wasserman if he will raise the American flag back to full staff and I've asked Supervisor Chavez if she will raise the California flag back to full staff. And we will do that in honor and memory, not just of these three victims who lost their lives, but to all of the victims who have suffered directly or indirectly. We lower the staff, the flags, forgive me, we lower the flags to have staff, of course, to memorialize someone's passing but I hope that as we raise the flags to full staff today, we will take that opportunity to commit ourselves to continue to remember those who have been lost and to keep them in our hearts in the months and years ahead. Thank you all again, and at this point, we will stand in brief recess. We invite all members of the public to join us in the plaza for the flag raising. Thank you.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much. If we could ask you to quickly and quietly make your way to a seat here in the chambers, and uh, if we could ask our board colleagues to please join us at the dais so that we can reestablish the presence of a quorum. So, Supervisor Chavez and Cortese and Wasserman, if you are within the sound of my voice, if you would please return to the chambers and take your seat. Thank you all once again. And again, if we could ask folks to please find their way into the chambers if, as we begin again. All right, then, if the chambers will please come to order, the board is back in session. Supervisor Cortese, I know we have a couple of commendations and proclamations for you to present, and I uh, believe we will be uh, seeing our returning colleagues shortly. I know they're offering condolences to folks in the community. I'd like to ask uh, Bob uh, Clement and Henry Coletto to come forward at this time. Gentlemen. Come on right through. This pool. We've had an opportunity um, actually over the past uh, couple weeks this summer to recognize uh, these gentlemen who have uh, done a tremendous amount of work both from a conservation and environmental standpoint and also from an education educational standpoint uh, with um, uh, a core of volunteers uh, who have served uh, the friends of uh, Kenyatta de los Osos Ecological Reserve um, let me just first uh, start with Henry. Uh, Henry has dedicated 35 years of his career as a park ranger and game warden with the Santa Clara County Parks and Recreation Department and Sheriff's Department. And all of us who have been here for a few decades, uh, uh, like me, <laughs> uh, who grew up in a rural envir environment here, um, know and have known uh, who Henry Coletto is, um, one of the most influential uh, game wardens and, and uh, park rangers and experts on the ecological um, environment uh, and surroundings that we live in here in Santa Clara County for many years. Uh, Henry has volunteered for over 19 years to manage uh, the reserve that I just mentioned under the California Department of Fish and Wildlife with the goals of youth, outdoor education, and natural resource enhancement. He has faithfully taught over 400 youth about responsible stewardship of land and wildlife uh, in their junior hunters program. And he's ensured that over 1,200 youth experience the fun of fishing uh, at stock ponds as part of their junior anglers program. Um, his own influence has resulted in over 100 students participating in field courses at the reserve in partnership with San Jose State University and its biology department. Uh, with that, um, we uh, at the Board of Supervisors uh, unanimously commend Henry Coletto for working tirelessly to maintain the reserve and providing community outreach, education, and research for the benefit of countless students and residents to learn about and enjoy. And why don't we pause for an applause for Henry Coletto, and then I'm going to go on to the next resolution. have them both uh, say a few words uh, if they so choose in just a moment. Uh, Bob uh, has dedicated his career to biological science as an educator serving the Santa Clara County Parks and Recreation Department 
the Santa Clara County Juvenile Probation Department, the California Department of Food and Agriculture, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Bob has been extremely active in uh, South Santa Clara County, mobilizing a strong core of volunteers in service to the friends of the Cañada de los Osos Ecological Reserve as the board treasurer. Bob has volunteered for over 19 years to manage the property under the California Department of Fish and Wildlife with the goals of youth outdoor education and natural resource enhancement. Uh, Bob has also uh, participated in the teaching of uh, the 400 youth that I mentioned earlier about responsible stewardship of the land and wildlife, uh, as well as uh, over 1,200 youth uh, who have had the opportunity to experience the fun of fishing at some of our larger county stock ponds as part of uh, the Junior Anglers Program. Uh, Bob's influence has also resulted in numerous students, um, about 100 of them, uh, participating in field courses at the reserve in partnership with San Jose State University's biology department as well. So the Board of Supervisors again uh, recognizes and commends uh, Bob Clement for working tirelessly to maintain the reserve and provide community outreach education and research for the benefit of countless students and residents to learn about and enjoy. Now in my own words for just a minute, we have 48,000 plus acres of parks and open space, particularly in the hills surrounding this valley, through taxpayer efforts and trust in many boards of supervisors over the years um, that have been acquired, but they don't just stay there as if they are a photograph. And we all know that uh, the wildlife and the ecosystem needs to be monitored. People need to be educated and informed uh, as, as to how to do that work. Um, and what we're really commending these two gentlemen for today is a lifetime, really in their adult lifetimes, they have dedicated uh, their lives um, to that work. Um, and we wouldn't have that open space in the condition that it's in without them. I can say that and speak to that firsthand. So to both of you and Bob, here's your accommodation. Thank you so much. <laughs> I just say say a couple of words. Uh, from the stand, standpoint, the uh, the ecological reserve is basically open to anybody that wants to take and come out there and take and enjoy a day. Uh, and when I say enjoy a day, it's usually doing some type of habitat work out there. It's not just coming out there to take and have lunch. Bob and I have been up there, like you say, for the last 19 years. Uh, we're up there most of the time on Saturday and Sundays, uh, right right through the week, and we have groups coming in. So again, if any of you are interested in that, you can take and go on uh, uh, cdlo.org. That's our website, and our names and phone numbers are on there, and uh, we're open to anybody that would like to take and uh, come out and uh, join us out there. Thank you again. Thank you. Well, I've taught high school for uh, about 17 years, and I teach at San Jose State field studies classes too. Um, Cindy Chavez here was at Overfield High School, so she knows these things. And uh, even though we are a uh, nonprofit, nobody gets paid. Um, we manage 5,800 acres of land. Um, we do have a product, and that's caring young people that realize the protection of the earth is protection of all of us. Thank you. Thank you uh, once again, Supervisor Bertese, and uh, thank you to these two gentlemen for their good works over the years. Much appreciated. <laughs> Colleagues, that takes us to item number seven, which is public comment. Public comment is that portion of our agenda set aside for comment by members of the public on non-agendized items. And as I think many of you know, uh, because these are non-agendized items, the board is precluded from uh, taking any action or offering significant comment. Uh, we adjust the time uh, allotted based on the number of cards that we have, and as of the moment, colleagues, we have 60 speakers, 6-0, who would like to speak, 
And so uh, consistent with the rules of our board, we will ask folks to keep their comments to just one minute. And if you can respect the one minute rule, please, that would be helpful. And just a reminder that uh, pursuant to the rules of the board, uh, we ask that you not chant, boo, hiss, applaud. Uh, the goal here is to keep a respectful, safe place at the podium for anybody who offers their view so that they can be heard respectfully and comfortably. So that being said, I will call a number of folks and if you can make your way up in line and uh, stand one behind another as you come forward, that will help us move along efficiently. We have Laura, I believe it's Nino, and then Evan Dowling, and then Liana Pounders, and then Monica Ramos, and then Dennis Engel, and then Jennifer Salea. And why don't we come uh, up, and then also Maria Hernandez and Connie Chu. Good morning and welcome. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Laura Nuno, I'm an RN from St. Louis Hospital. Um, I've been serving the community for 20 years. Um, I'm here to support my colleagues, the housekeepers, some of those were the responders of the tragic shooting that helped. Um, I'm here to tell, them, tell you to restate their jobs. The housekeepers at St. Louis have lost their dog jobs due to failing an unjust, inappropriate test imposed upon them. Their years of community service needs to be their test. Your mission as county supervisors is to safeguard civil rights, both those who administer and those who receive county services. You have done the opposite here. You are forcing proven, dedicated, hardworking people that have served our community, some for over 20 years, to the unemployment line. They will lose their health benefits. Some may lose their housing. You are making our community worse with your policies. Stop the hostile takeover of our hospital. We have been providing compassionate care for years for the poor and the disadvantaged. Thank Do you very job. much. Our next speaker is Evan Dowling. Folks, I'm sorry, guys, not, not permitted by the rules of our board. And again, it will help us move along both more expeditiously, but also in a way that respects everybody's point of view, no matter who they may be and what their view is. Mr. Dowling, you are our next speaker, sir. SEMA member Evan Dowling. County workers, including SEIU 521 members, are insulted by the county's contempt of them through late uh, contract negotiations. Just as insulting is Jeff Smith and the board members that who okay bullying, retaliation, and micromanagement in the workplace. And age discrimination is rampant. Jeff Smith, you and your supervisors are playing with matches. You feign concern about mass shootings, but you protect corrupt, incompetent, and mentally disturbed managers. Many workers, particularly SEIU members, have complained to you about hostile management while you promote your cynical wellness program. So if some worker snaps and we suffer a tragic mass shooting, I will testify in court on behalf of the victim's families. It is time to fire hostile corrupt managers and agree to contracts that address extreme income inequality in Santa Clara County. Leanne Pounders, folks, really, please. Leanne Pounders, uh, and forgive me if it's Leanna, I can't quite uh, make it out, followed by uh, Monica Ramos. Good morning, my name is Leanne Pounders, and I'm a registered nurse at O'Connor Hospital. I've worked there for three years. Uh, advocating for my patients, my coworkers, and, com and my community is foundational to my work as a registered nurse, and I'm here today to continue that advocacy. Our nurses have continued to reach out to the Board of Supervisors to ensure that all nurses will have permanent jobs in their established units, shifts, and schedules. The county will respect um, our right, that the county will respect our right to workplace democracy by recognizing our chosen union, CNA, and a commitment to bargain a new contract with O'Connor and St. Louis nurses without further delay. To date, our nurses have not really received any commitments from the Board of Supervisors to ensure our community continues to receive that quality care. The community deserves more, and we will continue to demand it. Monica Ramos is our next speaker, followed by Dennis Engel. Hello, my name is Monica Ramos, and I'm a registered nurse at St. Louis Hospital. I'm here today to support my coworkers at St. Louis and O'Connor and the community organizations that have signed this letter in our support. These hospitals are vital to the community and require a strong nursing staff to be committed to patient care. That's why it's important that these hospitals continue their current services and ensure experienced nurses stay in their current jobs, shifts, and schedules. 
to date, 120 nurses have left O'Connor and St. Louis hospitals because of the county's actions. How many more should we lose before the county finally does what's right? The local community organizations that have signed this letter agree that the Board of Supervisors needs to ensure the well-being of the people in our communities. Driving experienced RNs away from our public hospitals serves no legitimate purpose and undermines the interests of Santa Clara County residents. And our next speaker is Dennis Engel. I'm going to be speaking on behalf of Dennis Engel. Forgive me. We we don't allow the allocation of time from one person to another person. So is Mr. Engel here and does he wish to speak? Dennis Engel couldn't make it. I'm, I'm speaking on Dennis Engel's behalf. He's, he's a nurse at, at O'Connor Hospital that has been advocating for his patients for 20 years. The local community organizations that have signed I'm our sorry, community letter represent over 10,000 community members Cut in this mic, county. Please. They are- Ma'am, if you have a written yeah. statement, Ma'am, if you have a written statement, the clerk will be pleased to take it. Let me ask the clerk to please take the stand. Ms. Lanier? Again, folks, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jennifer Salea. Hello, I am Jennifer Salaya. I'm a county employee. Uh, the most asset that you county leaders have been entrusted with is the welfare of Santa Clara County residents and your county employees. But your leadership has failed. The proof is here today with me, many uh, brothers and sisters asking for fair contracts to allow them uh, to live and work in the county they serve. The proof is here with the voices of government whistleblowers denouncing county corruption and wrongdoing. The proof is here with residents frustrated over your lack of action on issues that matter to them. As a mother, community activist, and county employee, I've experienced a broken system that disregards working people and the most vulnerable in our county. So sadly, the bullying and intimidation against me as a county employee dramatically increased the moment I exercised my constitutional rights by uh, running against you for uh, 2020 election Board of Supervisors against you, Cindy Chavez. Folks, let me ask one last time here if people would please refrain from shout outs, applause, stomping, Again, it not only provides a respectful space there, but for supervisors who are trying to listen to the points each individual makes, the more distraction there is, the tougher it is to focus on what someone is saying and what I think and I, I know you want us to hear and understand and respond to. So the next speaker is Maria Hernandez, followed by Connie Chu, and then we'll go to another batch of folks. Well, it seems like you have a chronic hearing problem because these people have been coming here for years and you guys haven't done anything, have ignored them. In my case, you blame my accent. In their case, I don't know why because they don't have an accent. Uh, so there is between the, between the five of you, there are about 100 plus years of political experience. Very pathetic that a century of political experience on this board has not translated into governance that puts humanity first. Your political experience as suffered for many years by Santa Clara County employees and taxpayers is out of touch with the reality and the needs of the people that voted you into office. You are all about cynical identity politics. All of you have disregarded the law and condoned waste of millions of our tax dollars, supported bullying and wage theft against county workers, disregarded the welfare of our children, seniors, and the mentally disabled. Members of the public, we live in a democracy. We have the power to vote these people out of office and restore law and common sense politics. Connie Chu is our next speaker. And then let me list the next uh, 10 who will be speaking. Thank you for your patience for just a moment, Ms. Chu. Diana Acevedo, Janet Diaz, Fernando Espinosa, Christian De Alfonso, forgive me, uh, Erica Garcia, I believe it's Javier Dupre, Angel Kelly, 
and Susanna Pollock. Welcome again. Thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm Connie Chu, and I'm a proud member of SEIU 521. I've worked for the county for over 21 years in the county council's office. I'm sure you were hoping not to see us again after your break, but unfortunately your negotiating team has been stalling and refusing to bargain in good faith. So here we are. Because of this, our members are currently voting on a strike authorization. This is serious. You don't want, we don't want to do this because we understand what it means for our families and our clients, but to see little movement at the table, it feels like we're not being heard. We're frustrated and we have no other option. We believe that you care about the county and about addressing many of the same issues we're fighting for in our contract, so why are we being told that you don't? We have been working without a contract for almost two months. Now is the time to act. You will hear more specifics from the speakers following me. Please urge your negotiators to work with us because our community can't afford to lose services. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diana Acevedo to be followed by Janet Diaz. My name is Diana Azevedo. I have worked as a janitor for O'Connor Hospital in St. Louis Hospital for more than 10 years. This hospital has become a second home for and the employees who have spent most of their careers here. When we first heard the news about Santa Clara County buying the hospitals in DePaul Health Center, we were hopeful. hopeful. Who better to buy these hospitals than a county dedicated to the community? Sadly, we have not seen this dedication realized. We were told in closed doors meeting with management, our jobs we are safe. There is nothing to worry about, but that has not been the case. After the rent exam, letters went to the manager saying certain workers must be terminated within 90 days. This is cruel and unjust. We have kept the hospital running since March 1st, and this is how we repaid. Jack Smith, I will ask you to write to do the right thing, suspend the testing process, reverse the termination notice. Let's meet so we can talk together to this awful situation. Thank you. And our next speaker is. Fernando Espinosa. <coughs> or is it Janet Diaz? Yes? Welcome. Forgive me. Hi. My name is Janet Diaz, president of SEIU Local 5 to 1. Currently, there are 300 employees who work for poverty level wages falling below the county's own living wage ordinance. Blue collar and clerical employees such as food service workers, janitors, pharmacy assistants, library page, and client service technicians are just a few that provide critical services to our community at all county facilities. Our negotiating team's proposal made in June is more than reasonable to lift up our members from poverty level wages, except that Ms. Jimanowski continues continued response is that the board is not interested in addressing this matter. County workers deserve the dignity of fair and equal pay for, for our contribution to the county simply to provide for our families. We ask that you give a clear directive to your negotiators to uphold the county's living wage and do better by all county workers. Thank you very much. Could we hear from Fernando Espinosa? Mr. Espinosa, welcome. Good morning. My name is Fernando Espinoza. I'm an eligibility worker and a father of a two-year-old and a four-year-old. Quality, affordable childcare is vital for our families and the success for everyone in our Santa Clara community. On June 4th, the bargaining team provided a proposal that provides a structure or process to assist workers in affordable childcare while working together to build the childcare centers at existing and new county facilities for residents and workers to access. Unfortunately, Ms. Domanowski, has stated that the board is not interested in addressing child care in our negotiating, but open to talk afterwards. We have heard from some of you directly and your interest in working together to address the issue of affordable and accessible child care in our county. We had hoped that we would, I'm sorry, we could discuss this to see what we could do to help our residents and workers. Not only should the county prioritize affordable, affordable child care for our residents, but we should focus on ensuring access to quality daycare, including day, child daycare, adaptable needs, so parents Thank, thank and you. edible, okay. I'm sorry, able to work and contribute to a local economy. Let's work together. 
Thank you for your comments. Christian D. Alfonso to be followed by, I believe it's Erica Garcia. Good morning, my name is Christian Alfonso and I work for DFCS. Through our negotiations, our bargaining team has been trying to address the blatant disregard for a contract by your department heads and chief executive. We have filed half a dozen unlabor practices against the county. These range from unilateral implementation for our contract to contract the adult bargaining unit at the newly acquired hospitals. It's currently not stopping. Workers across our county are subject to threats, intimidation by upper management staff. This contradicts the condition the conditions of bargaining good faith. We have offered policies adopted by neighboring counties that we can use to address this bullying and intimidation. Ms. Dumanowski is currently not interested. As you have all just shown respect and dignity for the public, I hope this translates into our contract. Yeah. Erica Gar Garcia to be followed by Javier Dupre. <clears throat> Ms. Garcia, welcome. Okay. Oh, no mic, okay. Um, good morning, my name is Erica Garcia. I'm an employment counselor with CalWorks Employment Services. I've been with the county about 20 years. Prior to being a, an employment counselor, I was a children's counselor at the children's shelter. Um, you remember that? It was in a beautiful facility for 14 years, and then it got downgraded to a horrible little facility on Santa Clara Street, and now it's in a new horrible facility on Enlord Lane, and the only advantage of the new one to the old one is that it's above ground. That's it. It's a dangerous place. I've been to all three. I don't work there, but I am concerned for the people that work there and for the children. It is not safe there. You guys, I don't know if we should have been told, it's not a safe facility. The, the, the people that work there can't defend themselves, they can't defend the children, and something's gonna happen. And so we need to do something about that. I also just wanna say that uh, apparently the negotiations, uh, the vast plenitude of sins is being said in your name. Listen to the people. Listen to us. We will tell you what's going on. And Javier Dupre to be followed by Angel Kelly. Good morning. My name is Xavier Dupree, and I work for the Department of Environmental Health. On June 14th, our bargaining team provided a proposal with very specific language to work collaboratively with the county to address the housing crisis that is impacting our community. And our workforce... <clears throat> Your county negotiator took six weeks to counter our proposal, and that was only after our bargaining team pressed Ms. Dewanowski for a counter on this important item. The response on your behalf was that the county is not interested in working on this item with us during negotiations. Furthermore, they claim that this is the, at the direction of the board. Many organizations are already working on this. We have a housing crisis. As wealthy Silicon Valley corporations thrive, Residents and workers like us struggle every day. As we ask you, why are you not interested in collaborating with us in community organizations to address housing in the county for residents in the community? Santa Clara County must do better, and we should prioritize this together. Thank you, Mr. Dupree, and my apologies. I managed to mispronounce both your first and last name, so. <laughs> All right, but then, before we go to Angel Kelly, let me just announce that following uh, Ms. Kelly, we will hear from Lorena Briones, and then uh, Rico Mendez, and then Maybelline, I believe it's Q, and then Debbie Chang, and then Ruckchild Fernando, or Fernando Ruckchild, excuse me, and then Alan Kamara. So first, Ms. Kelly, welcome. My name is Angel Kelly. Board members, I ask you, have you ever started your day reviewing the x-rays of a battered toddler and then proceeded to meet them knowing they are covered in cuts, bruises, and blood? Have you ever had to calm a minor who can't stop crying because they are afraid to take the stand against the perpetrator who sexually molested them? Have you ever been a sounding board for a social worker's trauma and working with a the child they just saw at the hospital with third degree burns covering the majority of their body? Have you ever processed with a new worker who is dedicated but crying, overwhelmed, and feeling they are drowning because there is so much work that even though they are still learning, they are already being given overtime due to lack of staff. I have, and this is what social workers do, work not everyone can do or wants to do. We do it to try to keep the children and families safe in our community. I ask that as a board, you choose to do right by our workforce, that you prevent a strike and support a fair contract. 
Six, six, six years ago, County Exec Jeff Smith asked us if we wanted a good contract, one that wasn't two or three percent. The answer is yes. Thank we you. want and we need a fair contract. Susanna Follick to be followed by Lorena Brionis. Good morning. Uh, my name is Susanna Folsick. I am a social work supervisor for the Department of Family and Children's Services. I've had the honor and privilege of working there for over 10 years. Um, I am here today because I wanted to explain why I decided to vote to strike this morning. Um, I have six social workers in, under my charge. I am currently, as of today, in charge of the health, safety, and well-being of over 115 vulnerable children and their families in our county. I am here today to fight for them. Effective service delivery is contingent upon retaining qualified and exceptional staff in an environment uh, across the country where social work programs are shrinking and it is becoming increasingly difficult to attract um, qualified candidates to do this very difficult work. Um, we are now two days shy of 60 days, uh, two, two months uh, without a fair contract. I am urging each and every one of you to come to a fair contract in Mr. Cortese. Thank I am you, a Ms. constituent Holsick. of your district. Thank you. Leon, L Lorena Briones to be followed by Rico Mendez to be followed by Maybelline Q. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Lorena Briones. I am one of the social services unit negotiators and a social worker for Department of Aging and Adult Services. For over three weeks, our bargaining team has been attempting to talk through our bargaining priorities on wages, health care, and retirement with your chief negotiator, Ms. Lisa Dumanowski. She has stated that she's not prepared to do so, and now, as of last week, claims that she is willing to listen to our concerns about the proposals. Our bargaining team cannot continue to make significant changes in our proposals, only to see minor changes to their proposals, including stating that they are still reviewing certain sections of proposals for weeks with no movement. Ms. Lisa Dumanowski states that her authority at the table is at the directive of the Board of Supervisors. And it's looking to stall, and it is hard to believe that the board is looking to stall negotiations and push workers towards a potential work stoppage over un numerous unfair labor practices and failure to bargain in good faith. Your negotiator continues to state that the county is not Thank interested you. in addressing many of the please, issues please that are plaguing our county rule. and at times even admits the problems too large to fix. Please Thank help us reach Thank an you. agreement please. that helps our Santa Clara community Please thrive. wrap up in a minute. Thank you. Thank you. Rico Mendez. Good morning. My name is Rico Mendez. I'm the proud chief elected officer of SEIU Local 521. We represent over 50,000 public employees, three public hospitals across 17 counties. And it's been the honor of my life to stand next to these amazing workers, examples of which stand behind me today. I'd like to recognize the tragic loss that happened in Gilroy. Um, it impacted our union very severely, with one of our union members being shot, her mother being shot, and her child being murdered. So um, I appreciate what you all did today. I've been able to speak with thousands of workers over my career, and here in Santa Clara County, the demands that these workers are making should be no surprise. Access to affordable, quality child care. Process to expand housing to workers and the community. A pathway to permanency for extra help workers that are currently being abused and decent living wages so that we could live in the county that we work. Very basic requests. We need the county to step up, hear our specific proposals, and come to the table and get a deal. Thank you. Thank you. Maybelline Q to be followed by Debbie Cheng. Then I believe it's Fernando Ruckchild and Alan Kamara. And that will be this batch. Thank you. Welcome. Good morning, my name is Maybelline and I'm the RNPA treasurer. In the recent weeks, we have seen firsthand how this resilient community comes together in a time of tragedy. The teamwork and cohesive actions of those involved, the first responders, emergency personnel, physicians, nurses, and all hospital workers are the result of the many years of experience that these individuals brought to the table. This is a prime example of the importance of retaining experienced individuals. The county needs to do everything in its power to retain these experienced nurses and hospital workers by, by 
providing a competitive living wage. Without it, the staff will continue to leave and cause an unsafe skill mix on the floors that will continue to place patient care in jeopardy. Thank you. Debbie Chang, you're up next, followed by Fernando Rockjaw. Good morning, honorable supervisors. I'd like to take a moment to thank the first responders who quickly responded in making our community that we love safe again. Thank you to the Sheriff and Gilroy Police Department who placed their lives on the line to protect all of us at the Gilroy Garlic Festival. Thank you to our paramedics, nurses, physicians, respiratory therapists, pharmacists, housekeepers, dietary, central supply clerks, sterile clerks, and many more who worked tirelessly into the night because it was the right thing to do. All Santa Clara County hospitals worked together during the time it, uh, during the time of crisis because it took a village. Honorable supervisors, your decisions affect the community. I hope you are inspired by the brave and selfless actions that were demonstrated by our healthcare community. For we are the village, we are the community. Let's work together and keep our healthcare community intact. I thank you. Thank you, Fernando Rockchild. Greetings, Supervisors. My name is Fernando Rocha, a negotiator for and re representing the strong and united membership of RMPA. The former leadership of, of RMPA was neither inclusive nor transparent. Our current leaders on the board champion inclus inclusivity and transparency, and that is why we encourage our member participation and observation of the current negotiations. After all, it is our contract in which the language that will spell out our wages, hours, and working conditions reside. It is our check on management when they try to overreach and intimidate and bully us, or bully our nurses. So we as registered nurses have every right to observe the process as it moves along. Just because labor relations says it has never been done this way before, or that is not how we do it, does not diminish our nurses' right to be observers to these negotiations, especially when labor relations have no logical rhyme or reason for drawing this red line in the sand. I ask the steam body, is this good faith bargaining? In the interest of patient safety and labor peace and a fair contract settlement, I advise, we demand this board to take note and advise labor relations accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. And Alan Kamara, Alan Kamara, forgive me. And before uh, you speak, Mr. Kamara, let me just ask uh, other speakers, Carol Callahan, Matt Leslie, Sherry S. Michael, forgive me, I believe it's Randall, Michelle Pine, Karen and Julie B to make their way up. Again, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, County Supervisors, and good morning to everybody. My name is Alan Kamara. I'm one of the Vice President of RMPA. Uh, County Supervisors, I want to take this opportunity to thank you for your foresight in acquiring the two hospitals in our county. Uh, this crisis has shown how important those decisions were. Um, but when you go to this hospital, there are a lot of anxiety going on. The workers, when they're asked, even some of them when they're not asked, showed up in the time of need for our community. And I ask you to please go around these hospitals and talk to some of these nurses, uh, text SCIU 521, and imagine the anxiety that you will experience. I urge you to talk to, county, to the labor relations. They are going through three negotiations. They are, they are dragging their feet. Please ask them to come to the table and discuss with these nurses. Thank you. Thank you. I have cards from Carol Callahan, then Matt Leslie, Sherry S., Michael Randall, Michelle Pine, Karen, and Julie B. Who's up? Uh, Carol is not speaking. I'm Matt. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisors. We appraisers would like to bring some wage issues to your attention. Our wages are not competitive with comparable counties. ESA unfairly adjusts our base wage upwards when comparing our wages to neighboring counties. We have an outrageous wage disparity issue of 14% between two appraiser classes working on the same tax role, and the wage salary ladder is out of alignment with the appraiser class. First, we would like to point out that ESA's wage analysis is flawed. They don't understand what appraisers do and what skill set the job requires. Second, it led ESA to use inappropriate data in their wage comparative analysis. 
They do not adjust for a county's development stage, and they do not adjust for the complexity, variety, of, or difficulty involved in valuing a major city in the Bay Area. Third, ESA has not taken into account Assessor Larry Stone's input and recommendations in their analytic process. Thank you. Thank you. Sherry S., I believe you're up next to be followed by Michael Randall. My name is Sherry Shankman. In addition to the flawed information analysis, it is unfair that the ESA does not apply appropriate cost of living adjustments to the comps they use. ESA has deliberately ignored the extreme salary gap between auditor appraisers and real property appraisers. The gap is 14%, the largest, dis the largest disparity in the state of California. Most counties in the state of California compensate auditor appraisers and real property appraisers with the same base wage. As further evidence, there is a problem with real property appraisers' salary. The appraiser's wage ladder is out of alignment, even within the appraiser series. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Randall, I believe you're up next. We have a low employee morale issue. Employee morale has reached a critically low point. The past three contract realignment attempts were denied. Studies show low employee morale impacts negatively on the organization. Also, if passed, the split role initiative will send employee morale even lower. Thank you. Michelle Pine. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Michelle from the Assessor's Office. In each annual tax rule, there are only two classes that can determine assessed value, auditor appraiser and real property appraiser. The core responsibility of both jobs is to produce an annual tax rule in accordance with legal mandates, the same annual tax rule. Thank you. Thank you. I have cards from Karen with no last name and then Julie B. Welcome. ESA has not been fair in their choice of comparable data. ESA insists on using unfair comparable counties that share very few characteristics with the Santa Clara County. They should compare us with counties that are just as varied in property types, have similar economic stats and drivers, and require a similar level of skill to appraise the properties. Thank you very much. Julie B. 49 out of 58 counties pay appraisers and auditor appraisers the same base pay. Nine out of 58 counties has a discrepancy no greater than 5%. Santa Clara County is the only county has a wage disparity of 14.25%. It's outrageous. Thank you. I have cards now from Ashok Gupta, Marcus with no last name, I believe it's Nadra, also no last name, Queenie, no last name, Sandy Emerson, Carl Lombard, Mirta Mirabal, and Cabreab Gibrahiwit. I'm not sure if I'm close, but I did my best. Ashok Gupta. Good morning. Speaking of outrageous, ESA still imposes a 7.49 upward adjustment to our base wage to artificially inflate the appraiser's base wage versus neighboring counties. Using this unfair 7.49% adjustment, they say we are 5% overpaid. EPMC adjustment to base wage is unfair. Two appraisers doing the same job at the same career step, but having different start dates can result in having 7% less in take-home pay than the other. Even with ESS unfair adjustment, appraisers are still undercompensated with similar neighboring counties. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Marcus, and then after that I have a card from Nedra. Good morning. My name is Marcus Tai from the SSS office. Assessor Larry Stone is Santa Clara County's expert on what it takes to do our job. He's also the go-to guy in California as far as assessors' uh, jobs are concerned, uh, department. 
His memo to ESA states, Santa Clara County compensation is not competitive with similar local counties such as San Francisco and San Mateo. Of course, we're competitive with, uh, you know, some northern counties, you know. Assessor Stone's email ESA again with his support for appraiser classes one, two, and three. Again, ESA is ignoring an expert's advice. Assessor Larry Stone has written to ESA at least three times, but they have not even put appraiser list on the realignment. It's a shame Assessor Stone's input are being ignored. Thank you. Thank you. I have a card from Nadra and then Queenie. Good morning, my name is Nedra Millwood from the Assessor's Office. Currently, ESA use flawed comparable counties in their wage uh, analysis. Per Assessor Larry Stone, Alameda, Contra Costa, and Santa Cruz are not comparable counties. Contra, Contra Costa and Santa Cruz counties are small suburban communities. None of these three counties have experienced the same economic growth and real estate development pace since seen in Santa Clara County and the peninsula. Only San Francisco and San Mateo counties match the high cost of living and complex development issues seen in Santa Clara County. Thank you. Thank you. We have a card from Queenie followed by Sandy Emerson. Good morning. My name is Queenie from the assessor office. Uh, we would like to share with you, uh, all of you, the most outrageous grievance today uh, because appraisal trees are compensated 10% less than the Cumberbrook counties, 12% um, less than the next class step up, and 14% less than the equivalent class in the auditor appraiser series. Please help us um, to correct this unjust pay disparity and ratify this demoralizing wage gap for appraisers one, two, and three by asking ESA to review appraisers' presentation and assess them, Mr. Larry Stone's recommendation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sandy Emerson to be followed by Carl Lombard. Hi, I'm Sandy Emerson. I'm an SEIU um, 521 member and senior appraiser for the assessor's office. ESA should be held accountable for the continuous vacancy problem we currently face at higher appraisal levels. The best training ground for commercial real estate appraisers for tax purposes is the appraiser one, two, three class. Almost all the senior appraisers at the assessor's office were promoted from this class or from other assessor's offices. If the salary for the appraiser one, two, three class does not stay aligned with the senior appraiser salary, the assessor's office risks weakening this valuable pipeline for skilled senior appraisers. Thank you. Thank you. Carl Lombard to be followed by Mayor Maribel. Good morning. My name is Carl Lombard of the Assessor's Office. The last time appraisers one and two requested and received an alignment was in 1998. We consistently close over 99.7% of all work activities each year. This contributes 65% of the revenue to fund the county's discretionary fund. We need your support to correct the non-competitive wage, fix the appraiser series wage ladder, and end the huge wage gap between the two appraiser job classes, real property appraiser and auditor appraiser. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mayor to Maribel to be followed by Cabria Gibberhewitt. Hello, my name is Myrta Maribal. The current management at Fleet and Facilities intends to change four janitor positions from day shift to night shift. When management first brought this issue up, they stated that it was so that they could even out the amount of staff that report to the supervisors. They wanted to make things fair for the supervisors. This will have a negative effect on the customers that depend on the janitors to clean their areas where they work in. We have submitted a petition of 17 janitors that don't believe this is a good idea. A a petition from 100 customers that will be directly affected by these changes. We are simply asking management to wait until a fair and impartial assessment can be done to see if this is truly needed. Management has not dealt with us fairly or in good faith. Please review the information and help us get more time. It's hard to cover this in one minute, 
I will reach out to, your, to you each individually to try and discuss this a little further. I've made a copy for each and every one of you guys. If you could please review it. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, could I ask that you uh, pick up the copy of the remarks and make sure that they're distributed to the board and to the staff? Thank you. Um, we, as we welcome our next speaker up, let me first also indicate that he will be followed by Robert uh, Brizuela, then by Kay, then by Ray, Ren Bradley, then by uh, Deanna Azevedo, then by Frank Vieira, then by Anita Shamraj, Rachel Chen, and Connie Liang. Welcome. Good morning, my name is uh, Kabrab Geberhewitt and I'm a lead janitor at uh, Fleeting Facilities. I'm also a union steward. Um, county janitors are one of the most underpaid and vulnerable groups in the county. They represent one of the key entry level, level positions that sustain health and safety. They play a pivotal role as a strong recruitment tool for the county. Many county workers owe the beginning of their careers in the county to their times as a janitor. So it is with this understanding that we ask the County Board of Supervisors, the public, and the county employees for their support to help us get a fair assessment of our job assignments and appropriate treatment of our workers. Our current leadership at the Fleet and, Fleet, Fleet and Facilities Department has chosen to reject and ignore the concerns of the workers and the customers, a hundred of whom have signed a petition. Our department has also chosen to ignore the survey being conducted by the Santa Clara County Executive Office Division of Equity and Social Justice, addressing the same concerns and being brought up by the janitors. We would like the board to evaluate, address our concerns, and the impact that would have to the public good before we are forced to bid Thank this you. Friday, August 16th. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that takes us to Robert Brizuela to be followed by Kay. Go right ahead, sir. Um, <clears throat> I'm calling upon our Board of Supervisors to direct management to re-explore a clear and present opportunity to better serve our blind, aged, and disabled clientele of IHSS. How so? Immediately converting all of case carrying social worker ones into social worker twos. Why? Social worker ones at in-home support services are the only social workers in Santa Clara County who are assigned a caseload of approximately 350 IHSS cases, conducting disability assessments, and authorizing claimable hours expected to be done annually, but this is not happening as we continue to hover at or near 80% compliance per state requirements, at which point the state threatened to take over IHSS if we fail to remain above 80% compliance. A pragmatic approach to operate at optimum efficiency and with a full tank of fuel, not at or near empty, which has been the common place for several years. Grandfathering social workers ones into social worker tunes at IHSS is not only a new and a reasonable request as we are currently working out of class as social worker twos at IHSS in spite of the existing side letter agreement. Your help is needed to better deliver services and demonstrate we are truly a just culture with Thank competence and Thank character you. at Santa Clara County. Please. Thank, Thank you. you. And that was Mr. Brizuela, yes. K to be followed by Ren Bradley. No sign of K. We'll come back. Ren Bradley then to be followed by Deanna Azevedo. Good morning, I'm Ren Bradley. I'm one of the vice presidents of our union and I've had the pleasure and sadness to be at St. Louis and O'Connor over the last three weeks and seeing how these janitors and stock clerks and, and uh, health service representatives are being treated unfairly and having to take tests that have no relevance to their jobs. The janitor specs were last done in 1952. When you took over these hospitals, you did not do a comparative analysis of the work done at community hospitals versus VMC. I urge you to do that, and I urge you to throw out the tests. They're discriminatory. They speak to the institutional racism that continues to go on in Santa Clara County. And we, and I know you want to stop this. So I'm asking you, I'm begging you, I'm urging you to come down to St. Louis, walk in the steps in some of these workers, walk in some of the steps of the O'Connor workers. On a side note, this is the worst contract negotiations I've ever been in. I've not contracted over, I've done over 100 contracts statewide, and I'm, urging you to step in and do something different. Thank you. Next speaker, Diana Acevedo, to be followed by Frank Vieira. Is Diana Acevedo with us? 
coming up right after. Oh, thank you. All right, we must have two cards. Forgive me. Hi, I'm Frank Villar from St. Louis Hospital. I've been in lead uh, 11 years already with the beautiful team I have, and this is test. It's messing us up. Uh, we had this tragedy in, in Geroid. We were there working when people were coming in. <coughs> I'm sorry, but everybody stepped up, and I would like help for you people, for for, for us to. to this test is a mess. It, it was not just janitor. It was um, engineering stuff. Are we serious? We, we are 100% workers of a hospital. We're not, we don't take tests. That's, we don't do that. But you can walk through my hospitals. I know everybody been there. And thank God, it's everything good and beautiful. And everybody stepped up on every, any situation. The, the doctors, the nurses have it. They call housekeeping. They call, hey, you are here for us for the rest of our lives. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, three cards from Anita Shamraj, Rachel Chen, and then Connie Liang. These are students, are you still here with us? Yes, come on up. It's your turn to speak, and thank you for your patience. Thank you all for your patience. Again, it's Anita Shamraj. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Anita Chamraj, and I'm a rising sophomore at Monta Vista High School. And today, I'd like to talk about fugitive dust or mining. According to a 2014 report from OpenSpace.org, there have been elevated levels of calcium dust at Rancho San Antonio due to mining at Lehigh Cement Plant. Elevated levels of calcium have harmful effects on those who breathe it in, including respiratory issues as well as kidney failure, filtration problems. Now, consider who goes to Rancho San Antonio. It's families taking their kids on a hike. It's teenagers tasked with taking their dog on a walk. Teenagers like me. The elevated levels of calcium dust will impact these people. According to a 2019 Mercury News article, Lehigh is planning on building a second pit despite outcries from locals who have felt the impact of fugitive dust. It's up to you, council members, to vote on whether or not to allow Lehigh the second pit. Please, do the right thing and keep the 2012 reclamation plan. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Before you step away, Ms. Shamrash, Anita, if you could come back for just a second. If you have remarks in writing that you would like to share with us, you can get them to the clerk of the board either now or at some other point, and she'll make sure that they're shared with all five members of the Board of Supervisors, okay? okay? Thanks Thank very you. much. That takes us to Rachel Chen, who will be followed by Connie Liang. Honorable Supervisors, thank you for allowing me to speak here today. My name is Rachel Chen, and I'm a sophomore at Monta Vista, Monta Vista High School in Cupertino. And I'm worried about the impact air pollution from the Lehigh cement plant has on our community. Lehigh is situated next to a densely populated area where many students live. The California Air Research Board lists Lehigh as the third highest polluter in California. The Lehigh cement plant releases 26,000 tons of emissions per year and 17 toxic air contaminants above chronic trigger levels. The United States Environmental Protection Agency has determined that Lehigh is out of compliance with the Clean Air Act and is at non-attainment for both ozone and PM 2.5, also known as particulate matter. Lehigh's pollutants are detrimental to our health and prevent us from living our lives to their full potential. PM 2.5, only one of the many pollutants that, that are emitted by Lehigh, has been, has been determined by the EPA to cause heart attacks, aggravate asthma, and cause many other life-threatening symptoms. Today, I'm asking you, on behalf of Bay Area's youth, to please reject Lehigh's plans to expand their query. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And uh, we have one more speaker on this subject, I believe. Come right up. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Connie Leong, and I'm a rising senior at Saratoga High School. I will be addressing the offenses of Lehigh Cement Plant. The INRIX Global Congestion Rating found that the SF Bay Area ranks third in the entire nation for worst traffic congestion. The economic loss is estimated to be around $2,000 per person. The last thing we need is more vehicles on the road. However, Lehigh Cement intends to fill the North Quarry Pit by importing aggregate rather than filling with on-site materials as was outlined by the 2012 Reclamation Plan. This would increase traffic by up to 666 trucks per day for up to 30 years, worsening congestion, debris spill, pedestrian safety, and straining our local road infrastructure. Our local roads would face more jams, more idles, and more toxic fuel emissions. On behalf of Bay Area students, I implore supervisors to uphold the 2012 reclamation plan rather than give in to Lehigh's new and destructive demands. Thank you. 
Thank you. Before we step away, uh, Ms. Liang, um, for you and your two uh, colleagues here, uh, if you want to introduce yourself to uh, my staff person, I think you may have already had a chance, Christina Lowquist, who works with my office on these issues, please do so. Uh, we appreciate it. All right, thank you. That takes us to our next speakers. And please bear with me while we get organized here. We have cards from Kate Lee Hain, Henry Shi, Forgive me, I'm having trouble reading it. It's uh, Jenna Vera, and I can't, uh, Rias, Rios, uh, and we may uh, want to ask the clerk for some help with a uh, Spanish language interpreter. I believe there is an interpreter available. Then uh, Jane Geiger, and Rhoda Fry, and Deanna Mieters the Dagon, and Richard Zappelli. So let's start with uh, Kate Lee Hain. Thank you for your patience. Good morning. I'm Kate Lee Hain from Make Prez Safe, an advocacy group for victims of childhood sexual abuse at Presentation High School. To date, we know of over 40 victims of sexual abuse at Presentation, myself included. Abuses range from pornography to groping to rape. There are over 12 abusers over 20 officials who broke mandatory reporting laws, but not a single criminal charge has been filed. Sexual predators are free to, free to roam our streets. The officials at presentation who covered up abuse and directed others to break the law, who intimidated kids out of filing police reports and knowingly endangered thousands of children, no charges. Are the police and DA actually investigating or are they just placating us? We can't get any answers. We can't even get copies of our own police reports. Please join me in urging them to investigate and prosecute these people. Thank you. Thank you. Henry Shi. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Henry Shi, and I'm a junior at Los Altos High School. Now, I hail from Mountain View, which, if you do not know, is named after the beautiful black mountains you can see along the horizon. Today, I want to discuss that Lehigh operates a quarry and cement plant there. Now, fortunately, in 72, the county is granted an easement guaranteeing protection of the aesthetic of that ridge line. Now, while the 2012 Lehigh Reclamation Plan promised to honor the deed, a new amendment would dramatically reduce the ridge and expose all Lehigh operations on the mountain. Now, while this is ostensibly for finalization of stability, the county's own 2012 geotechnical analysis demonstrates that there's no need for this new amendment. Now note that per the easement, your constituents own the view. That horizon is ours. That Lehigh has no valid justification for the new amendment is symbolic of how little they care about the county. This is a labor issue, public health issue, and legal issue. I please ask that you reject this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Genevera, and I think it's Rios, forgive me, I'm just struggling with the last name. And, uh, is uh, Genevera here? I'm going to come back to that one in case uh, she's had to step away. How about Jane Geiger? Please come forward. Sorry, I missed my tea. I'm Janet Geiger. <laughs> ah, forgive me. I missed your tea. Janet Geiger. Thank All you. All right. So, yes, I was just about to tell you on my little thing I wrote here. I am Janet Geiger. I'm a Bay Area native and resident of Santa Clara County for the last 29 and a half years. I'm an avid hiker and retired landscape architect. I raised my three children here. I have two, and I had two dogs die of kidney disease. That will because of Lehigh. <laughs> anyway, um, I am here today to speak about the Lehigh Quarry and the cement plant located one mile from my neighborhood. There are many important issues to discuss regarding this business, but today I want to speak about the scenic easement that was established and promised in 1972. It's been violated by irresponsible mining practices on the site. Already the ridge has been over-excavated, and uh, I'm going to just say they're messed up. They're over by 50 feet already, and they want to take another 100 feet to fix their mistake. I beg you to uh, don't sell us out, and... Um, don't even issue new use permits. Thank you very much. Thank you. That takes us to Rhoda Fry, who will be followed by Deanna, Mirza, forgive me, Mirza Dagon. 
Good morning, I'm Rhoda, representing myself today. Ever since the quarry blasting shook my house, I've been all shook up. I'm here to make sure that you have copies of letters from the mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District, City of Cupertino, and the City of Los Altos. None support the Lehigh Hanson Permanent Day Quarry Expansion Plan, all prefer the 2012 plan. Why does the county, as lead agency, habitually allow Lehigh and Stevens Creek Quarry, whose con conditional use permit expired in 2015, to be out of compliance? Could it be jobs? But DOL lists between 20 and 30 jobs at the quarry. But Lehigh has been importing out of state, non-union, likely at non-area standard wages. They built the illegal road without proper erosion controls. They are not your constituents. Supervisor Simidian, when you were state senator, I traveled to Sacramento and I asked you about Lehigh and you said it was a local issue. Now you're here and you're saying these issues are complex. What are you doing for the citizens of the Greater Bay Area, your constituents, to protect us from negative impacts of these quarries and their massive expansion plan. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please, folks. Deanna, and forgive me with the pronunciation. <laughs> Hi, I'm Deanna Merzladegon. Sufficient permanent supportive housing will take decades and billions of dollars to build. It cannot be built quick enough to help those currently living on the streets. I have submitted a proposal to the Board of Supervisors to temporarily create transitional housing and full-time safe parking at the Santa Clara County Fairgrounds. It would be an interim solution. While, general, while Fairgrounds general plan development proposals are being evaluated and planned, I ask you to table to defer any referrals and or discussions regarding the Fairgrounds so that temporary solutions such as the one I have proposed can be strongly considered. It may save countless lives. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Richard Zappelli to be followed by another batch of folks and we'll call them up uh, in just a moment. Mr. Zappelli, welcome. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm here representing World Neighborhood Neighborhood Association and an event that happened in 2014, in fact, it was September, it'll be almost five years today and we had a supervisor at that time Ken Yeager called a special meeting on homelessness uh, at the Willow Gun Center and we had over 200 people in the meeting and three television stations there it was a time when homelessness was manageable now it's five years later and it's out of control and considered crisis thing so I'm in here in support of tr transitional housing at the fairgrounds or any other place the county can can help us within that I, I respect human human rights, and these people have human rights, but we need a place to house them. If it's just temporary, a tent city or whatever, I urge you to please give us your attention. I know you must all be thinking about this, and it's probably all in your minds, and I'm sure you have a solution, but if you do, please share it with us. That's the main concern we all have. Is we're not hearing from the county. Thank you. All right, we have uh, cards remaining from I believe it's uh, Michaela Jones, and then pa Pam Holmquist, Aaron Resendez, Scott Largent, Fernando Zasueta, John Carlson, Gary Wesley, and Michael Benipeo. So again, is uh, Michaela Jones here? And please let me know how I did on the first name there. Welcome. Thank you. My first name is pronounced Michelle Michelle well, Jones. Way off. Hang on just a moment, Ms. Jones. Uh, given that uh, needed tutorial, if we could restore the full minute. Thank you. Go right ahead, Ms. Jones. Thank you. Thank you for your time. My name is Michelle Jones, and I am an employment counselor for the County of Santa Clara with 27 years of dedicated public service. I am also an active community change agent in the D4 Buena Vista neighborhood. I come before you today. I come to ask you, to urge you and your team of negotiators to act immediately in favor of a fair contract for the county. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments and thank you for your patience today. I know it's been a long meeting. Pam Holmquist to be followed by Aaron Resendez.
Pam Holmquist, perhaps had to leave. Aaron Resendez, are you still in the room? All right, then, how about Scott Largent? Mr. Largent, I thought I saw you. There you are. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I sent you guys all an email with the uh, 911 calls and the calls for service the other night at City Hall. Um, I've received no calls myself. Do you know where Armando's at? Do you know where the man is at that was up on the roof till 4.30 in the morning? Have we done anything to contact behavioral health to figure out where he's at? Did we figure out why hundreds of calls went through 911 that were blocked? All the information's up on YouTube right now. You guys could do an investigation immediately and not wait 364 days for grass to grow and have the PD or the county look into it. You guys need to find this man. He was suicidal. He damn near jumped for an hour straight. And if I didn't have Sean Cartwright down there supporting me, this man probably would have pulled me down with him. Why are you people not doing your job? And this is your district, Cindy Chavez. You should start figuring out where that man's at. You should get on the phone with Tony Tolis. And basically, I, I think you people need to start firing people. If you need help doing it, I can show you how to do it. Next speaker is Fernando Zasueta to be followed by John Carlson. Mr. Zasueta, good morning, good afternoon, almost. Good morning, I'm Fernando Zasueta, president of the Raza Historical Society. I'm here because of the uh, historical heritage grant program that the county administers, in which recently we applied for a grant to restore and rehabilitate the Cheki House in the History Park in San Jose. Uh, there were four applicants. They granted funds to three of those four applicants and denied any allocation of funds to us. After they had made their initial allocation, they found they had $72,000 that had not been allocated. Instead of returning those to say us because we brought to their attention that those dry rot and termites and uh, failure to maintain the property, they distributed additional unallocated funds to the other three. I'd ask that you reconsider those uh, allocation of funds, at least that uh, had not been previously allocated, because it wouldn't uh, harm them, because they would have gotten their original allocated funds. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. John Carlson to be followed by Gary Wesley. Mr. Carlson, are you in the room? You are. Please come forward. Good morning, I'm John Carlson. I was born and raised in this county and my job right now is to promote gun safety. Shortly after the terrible mass shooting in Gilroy, an investigator contacted me and I provided what assistance I could. Santa Clara County has created a dangerous situation by limiting the right of the law abiding to keep and bear arms. This sends a dangerous message to those who would perpetrate such violent crimes. California is among a shrinking number of states that requires a license to exercise gun rights in public. A prohibition started only in the late 1960s with its roots in racism to unfairly target the Black Panthers. Santa Clara is in the minority of California counties that will not issue gun licenses for self-defense, denying its residents equal protection under the law please direct the county sheriff to license any applicant who is not statutorily prohibited from possessing firearms. Thank you. Thank you. Gary Wesley to be followed by Michael Benny Pale. Mr. Wesley, welcome. Gary Wesley, a resident of Mountain View. After the San Bernardino attack on December the 2nd, 2015, where 14 public employees were killed, and 22 were injured by two terrorists, a man and a woman. I addressed my city council down in Mountain View. I wrote to school boards about the safety of schools, and I appeared before you. Seemingly nothing has changed except maybe more active shooter drills. In Gilroy, apparently there were no fixed cameras that could have warned the police of the attacker sooner or confirmed whether he had an accomplice on scene. Security cameras in public places 
at government buildings, at schools, advertised surveillance will help. Thank you for your comments. Michael Benny Pale. Good morning. My name is Michael. I'm the VP for the Nurses Union RNPA. This coming Friday is our second time at the negotiations table with the county. So far, the county is refusing to increase the release time for four additional nurses to reflect the increase in our membership resulting from the acquisition of the two hospitals. We need the release time in order to better represent our nurses, the nurses that this county continues to lose daily due to poor pay and second-rate treatment by management who favor contract traveler nurses over our very own coded county employees. Furthermore, the county negotiators are refusing transparency by denying nurse observers during our negotiations. It is imperative that we as nurses are able to hear and participate in matters that will affect our lives while we negotiate our wages, benefits, and working conditions. Nurses demand this. Our voices will be heard and will not be allowed. We will not allow it to be muted by the county. We demand the five of you board supervisors to advise labor relations in this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Let me uh, just make sure that we didn't overlook anybody who was out of the room. Uh, Carol Callahan, I have a card. Last call, not here. And Kay, with no last name, are you here? And we had, uh, I believe it was Genevera Rios, Ms. Rios. And Pam Holmquist, please come forward. I knew if I went through that, we'd find someone I had simply missed while they were out. Welcome. And then I do also have a card from Aaron Resendez, who I do not believe is in the room. Well, thank, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak on an issue. Uh, my name is Pam Holmquist, and I'm the manager of infection prevention at St. Louis Hospital in Gilroy. And I'm here today because I'm really concerned about our housekeeper group. Uh, my job at the hospital, if you can imagine, I've been there 10 years now. When I first came into the hospital, one of the things that I first inspected is, the, is how clean the hospital was. And I was very pleasantly surprised. The corners were clean, no dust bunnies. You, that for, for someone in my kind of position, that's very important because it allows me to go on to other issues because the transmission of infectious disease amongst patients or amongst um, staff to patients or patients to staff, that's our job, to not have that and to have low hospital um, associated infection rates. The cleanliness of the hospital for me is everything. I love the team of folks and what I'm concerned about is that we're losing half of them Thank because you. they failed a written time test. And I'm hoping you could do something about Thank you very much. them in this. Thank Colleagues, you. we've got uh, three more cards that have come in here at the last minute. Let me just ask, any other cards? We really do need to wrap this up. If you wish to speak and haven't spoken yet, please fill out a card now. All right, then these will be our last three speakers. And that is Ramon Martinez. Mr. Martinez, are you here? Followed by Trina Mooring. Followed by S. All right, Ramon Martinez, are you in the room? Second and final call? No. Well, would this be Trina Mooring who's making yes, the report? Welcome. This is me, thank you so much. Um, I'm here on two issues. I wanna speak regarding labor relations and then contract negotiations. Labor relations in the last three years have become very de defiant regarding our contract. They're directing executive management in my office, the district attorney's office, to discipline uh, members uh, for reasons that uh, they feel is adequate. Um, however, in the last four or five months, we've had a number of uh, members that have been terminated, and in lieu of termination, they have resigned. Uh, I don't think that labor relations uh, is helping our members. In fact, they're, they're hurting our members. I would like to see some changes in that area, particularly with Mitch Bielsbach. He is a problem for us. Next, our contract negotiations. Please, in good faith, bargain with us. Thank you. Thank you. I have a card from S. Why don't you come on down if you like? I 
I really hope you guys will look into the systemic failure that led to Scott and I being left on our own with the suicidal man atop City Hall. Uh, what he went through was horrible, and what Scott and I went through was horrible. We should not be there trying to keep somebody alive for over 10 hours. I was going through all my first aid training in the ABCs, knowing that if he fell or if he jumped, that I was the first responder, because Scott was up top, I was at the bottom, so that I was gonna be the one doing first aid. I was the one who was gonna be doing CPR. I was the one who was gonna be making tourniquets. I should never have been in that position. The system failed. It failed Armando, it failed Scott, it failed me. There were over 20 some odd calls to the 911 system that came from the suicide hotline. The suicide hotline called 911 and nobody came. There were dignitaries that called 911. Scott called, I called. We called and said he's not even talking to us anymore. He is literally on the edge and obsessing about suicide. Nobody came. Thank Nobody you. was our first responder. The Thank system failed. Please look into it. Thank you very much. Ramon Martinez? Not here. Okay. All right. Colleagues, that uh, completes public comment. Those are all of the speakers that we have. We'll say thank you again to those of you who took time to be here with us. And um, that will take us to item number eight, which is the consent calendar. And uh, just so folks know, it's my plan to call a recess after we identify consent calendar items. So if you can hang in through the consent calendar, I thought that might let some folks decide whether they needed to stay or go. And uh, then we will take probably a 15 minute recess at that point. All right, item number eight, the consent calendar. Madam Clerk, we have the consent calendar in our published agenda, but we also have a goldenrod copy, I believe, which is the most current version of the consent calendar. And if I could ask my staff to grab a copy of the goldenrod sheet for me, please, I would appreciate that. But meanwhile, if we could ask, ah, I'm being rescued by the county exec, thank you. If we could ask you, uh, Ms. Lanier, the, on behalf of the clerk's office to uh, read the revised consent calendar update, which is now before us. We have a request from administration to continue item number 10 to September 10, 2019. Item number 10 is a public hearing acquisition of real property for a public park. We have a request from Supervisor Ellenberg to add item numbers 23, 24, and 31 to the consent calendar. Item number 23 is to receive report from the Office of Supportive Housing relating to the adopted policy for leveraging and aligning resources to Forgive me, Ms. Lanier, forgive the interruption. If folks could exit as quietly as possible, please, and Ms. Lanier, if you could speak up a little bit, please. Thank you. Item number 23 is to receive report from the Office of Supportive Housing relating to the adopted policy for leveraging and aligning resources to assist in the long-term build-out of the county housing production plan. Item number 24 is to receive report from the Office of the County Executive and Facilities and Fleet Department relating to county controls to prevent bid rigging in public works contracts. Item number 31 is to approve agreement with San Jose State University Research Foundation relating to providing scholarship administration and monitoring services in an amount not to exceed 300,000 for period August 13, 2019 through June 30th, 2021 and has been reviewed and approved by County Council as to form a legality. We have a request from Supervisor Ellenberg to hold item number 34 to August 27, 2019. Item number 34 is to consider recommendations relating to a donation and sponsorship policy for county agencies, departments, and board of supervisors. We have a request from President Simidian to hold item numbers 35 and 36 to September 10th, 2019. Item number 35 is to approve surveillance technology use policies for existing surveillance technologies that have been reviewed and approved by county council as to form and legality. Item number 36 is to approve surveillance technology use policies for existing surveillance technologies that have been reviewed and approved by County Council as to form a legality. We have a request from Sheriff Lori Smith to hold item number 37 to August 27, 2019. Item number 37 is to consider recommendations relating to the in-car video recording system. We have a request from Vice President Chavez to hold item number 39 to September 10, 2019. Item number 39 is to consider recommendations relating to bids for construction of main jail and Elmwood custody health services staff work area modifications. We have a request from Supervisor Wasserman to add item number 40 to the consent calendar. 
Item number 40 is to approve an increase in the supplemental work allowance for relocation of the second floor dental suite at Main Jail North, contract number 18-31, awarded to Agbayani Construction Corporation, increasing the su supplemental work allowance by 200,000 from 100,000 to 300,000 for a new total contract encumbrance of 1,009,000. We have a request from Supervisor Ellenberg to hold item number 51 to August 27, 2019. Item number 51 is to adopt resolution delegating authority to the county executive or designee to negotiate, execute, amend, or terminate certain types of agreements relating to community outreach programs that promote health awareness and or support the employee wellness division in an amount not to exceed 1,800,000 for period August 16, 2019 through August 15, 2022 following approval by county councilors to form in legality. And approval by the Office of the County Exec. The delegation of authority shall expire on August 15, 2022. We have a request from Supervisor Ellenberg to remove item numbers 86 and 115 from the consent calendar. Item number 86 is to ratify county sponsorship of Santa Clara County Fairgrounds Management Corporation in the amount of $2,000 from the Office of the County Executive Office of the LGBTQ Affairs Fiscal Year 2019-2020 Budget to support 2019 out at the Fair Family in Entertainment Stage. Item number 115 is to consider recommendations relating to professional services agreement for social science and analysis professional services. We have a request from Vice President Chavez to remove item number 121 from the consent calendar. Item 121 is to consider recommendations relating to the Vietnamese American Services Center. And that concludes my list. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Clerk. C colleagues, I know there may be some additional changes, additions, deletions to our revised uh, calendar update. Uh, what I'd like to do is ask uh, each member in turn uh, if you have any changes to offer at this time. And uh, after we complete that, we will hear from the one member of the public that the changes are as announced and we will then vote. So let me start with Ms. Ellenberg. Ms. Ellenberg, no additional changes. Supervisor Cortese. None. Su Supervisor Chavez, take a moment. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm interested in um, take, removing, I, deferring item 115 for, to our next board meeting. I was going to ask the board to uh, <clears throat> hold it until further notice. Okay. That's, that's fine by me. Excuse the interruption. Supervisor Chavez, you said next meeting the county exec said till further notice. I just want to make sure that the I'm request is. I'm comfortable with his further notice. Further Thank notice. You. Thank you. Um, and then for item um, 119, I'd like to pull it for discussion. And that is a, it's a JOC, and I'm trying to better understand our terms under which we're using them and not. Any other changes? None? No, thank you. All right, then uh, colleagues, uh, on item number 24, which uh, Supervisor Ellenberg has asked to add to the consent calendar, I'm fine with that, happy to let it stay on, but I'd like to ask if the administration is okay with a report back in six months on this item. This is the uh, contracting bid rigging issue. Uh, does that work? Surely. All right, then. Request will be noted, please, in the minutes. Then um, on item 31, which Supervisor Ellenberg is also asked to pull from consent, uh, here again, I'm happy to uh, leave the item on consent. I'll be an I vote on the item. Uh, but I did want to just indicate that while I think these scholarships serve a worthy purpose, uh, I have uh, been a little anxious about how much direct benefit our county receives. I, I couldn't help but note that fewer than half of the recipients are identifiable as working for our county or even nonprofits within our county after the program. Uh, so I, I'd like to see if we could get a little more rigor going forward in terms of tracking what happens to the folks who get the scholarships, uh, seeing if we can encourage uh, more specifically folks who are going to work in our county and uh, give the benefit of their education to our county. Uh, and say that, um, at least for the foreseeable future, I certainly could not support um, any increase in the level of funding. But I will be an I vote today with those exhortations. And 
Uh, on item number 40, uh, which Supervisor Wasserman asked if we could add to the consent calendar, I would like to ask Madam Clerk that that stay on our regular calendar. I have just a couple of brief questions there. And um, that are, uh, th those are my uh, items today. All right, Mr. Largent, would you like to come up and speak? You are the one card we have so far. And if anybody else wants to speak on consent, please turn your card in now. This is the last call for cards on consent. Thank you, uh, Freddie, Tiffany. Thank you, thank you. I'm uh, a little confused about county comm and, and dispatch over there. What I'm getting at, because this does tie into the consent calendar, uh, when, when I, prior to being taken in by the San Jose Police Department with my motor home, um, when I was still using, I, uh, I, I made a call to 911. I made my way from my motor home into Walgreens. Um, you know, I was at the point of, I'm just done. I was under 100 pounds. It, it was time to get off the meth. I mean, it really was. And I made it into Walgreens, and I sat down in the card section there, and I was just done, okay? I was, I am throwing in the towel, I need help, okay? Law enforcement wasn't really taking me in. I wasn't being arrested. I didn't have a criminal record. I wasn't on probation or parole. So I asked for help, and they called through the dispatch center over there, through County Comm and through 911. I waited and waited and they cleared out that Walgreens and I thought help was coming. I needed to go somewhere. I needed to go to EMS. I needed to go to the hospital. I was damn near dead. When they told me somebody was there for me and I walked out of there, I thought, you know, this is it. I can go get sober and I can be in my little girl's life. A San Jose Police Department car was out in front and I walked up to the side and he rolled down the window and he says, Mr. Largent, we're not your effing cab. If you want to go to the hospital, you can take a bus or walk. That's what I got, trying to ask for help. And this is what that man got on the ledge the other night that needed help. He was suicidal. He was on a meth-induced psychosis. This man needed help. You allocate a ton of money trying to say you're providing help, and it's not. I have been filming people dying on our streets and putting it all over YouTube right now. Your stuff is not working for these people. Damage control, get out there and start doing something. I, yes, I'm going to go to Supervisor Cortese and then Supervisor Ellenberg, please. Supervisor Cortese? Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to jump in front of the line. Um, I earlier said I didn't have anything uh, to suggest on the consent calendar, but I'd like to ask that item 119 be uh, carried over to the next regular board meeting. Um, it is on consent. It, um, it is um, just, a, it's a contract item. And I just got a message from my staff that we're trying to take a little harder look on that just to be prepared uh, to vote up or down on it. That's, I'm assuming a week isn't going to uh, create a, uh, any kind of a significant timing problem. Thank you, Supervisor Cortese. I believe, Supervisor Chavez, you had asked if the item could simply be pulled from consent. I'm fine with that solution. Okay. And I just wanted to ask both of you, uh, given your interest, would you like to leave it on so that you could have some questions today before it comes back, or do you just want to pull it? Pulling it. All right. Then the request, Madam Clerk, from uh, the two members of the board is to okay. pull the item, but hear it. To, no. Sir, pull it and defer it indefinitely. You're, you're I just want to defer it for a week yeah. and just bring it back next week and so I could prepare more cogent questions to, to bring up. Got it. Thank you for, the, for uh, clarifying my confusion on that. So Madam Clerk, the request from two members of the board is that item 119 be deferred until our next regularly scheduled meeting, which I believe is August the 27th. Is that correct? All right, good. Clear as mud. Got it. All right. then. Ms. Ellenberg, thank you for your patience. You had uh, additional comments, I believe. Thank you, I did. I, I didn't have any changes um, and glossed over the fact that I did want to make a couple of comments um, on several items. Uh, the first one, item number 49, um, and given that the, the, the new chief psychologist position is part of the jail reform implementation planning, I'd like to uh, know what our timeline is for a presentation to the board on the implementation plan especially since that um, is likely to involve staff and resource application. 
So while that item would remain on the uh, consent calendar agenda, there's a request for uh, information. Dr. Smith, do you want to respond now, or do you want to just bring that back at some point in an off-agenda report? I think it's best for us to respond through County Council with a <coughs> confidential memo because some of it does involve the uh, litigation that we're facing. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Um, <coughs> uh, with regard to item 59, uh, just kudos on this one. I'm, I'm really pleased to see the additional investments to address mental health needs among the unhoused population and a continued partnership between behavioral health and the Office of Supportive Housing. And what I really think is worth highlighting from this ledge file is that since 2012, over 1,200 permanent supportive housing slots have been added to our network. And with the mental health services provided, 84% of permanent supportive households maintain their housing for more than a year. This action would add 243 more slots to come up to 1543. And while we are busy building more housing, and I know we're gonna talk about that later, I really just wanted to call out um, the hard work and the partnership of our county departments to expand these resources to meet a really critical need. So thank you for that. And then finally, uh, on item number 67, this is a, a reclassification that represents kind of one of the many elements that's underway as the staff at St. Louis and O'Connor integrate into the county system and shift from provisional positions to regular hires through our standard process. Uh, and as Supervisor Smidian knows, at HHC over the last months, we've tried to track progress and resolve the staff integration issues. But I would like to ask for an off-agenda report to be provided by ESA to map out in greater detail the future phases of the staff integration process, key milestones, reclassification reviews, processes to resolve discrepancies or disputes, and an outline of the major issues expected over the next six months and beyond. In, in a nutshell, all of that is to say a, a concern about the speed with which we are transitioning people into, from, um, from transitional, provisional to permanent hiring, and like to get more details off agenda or at the next HHC meeting. Okay. All right. That's it. Thank you. We've heard from all of our speakers on the consent calendar. We've got all the changes duly noted. Colleagues, everybody clear about uh, the, what the revised consent calendar would look like? If so, then we'll ask the clerk to please display the voting panel on our screens. We have a motion to approve the revised consent calendar from Supervisor Chavez with a second from Supervisor Ellenberg. We'll ask all five members to please vote on the screen at this time so that we can announce that with all votes having been cast, the clerk will display and indicate that the calendar has now been approved on a 5-0 vote. Colleagues, uh, that brings us to the end of item number eight, our consent calendar. And so uh, for that reason, I'm gonna ask that we take a 15-minute-plus uh, break, be back in the chambers and at our seats promptly at 12.20. Thank you all very much. We'll see you then.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it is in fact 1220. So if we could ask all members of the board to please return to the dais and take their seats. And if the chambers could please quiet itself. Again, folks in the chambers, if we could ask you to please come to a hush. And that, uh, for the record, we are now back in session following a 15, 20 minute recess. We finished uh, with item number eight, which was our consent calendar revision and adoption. That means we are now at item number nine. And item number nine is the public hearing on uh, TEFRA, Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act of 1982. And because this is a public hearing, I'm gonna be a little bit more formal. And uh, having announced the item, number nine, uh, I'm going to uh, indicate that there will be a public hearing. I'm going to ask the department staff to please come forward if they're in the room and uh, provide a brief verbal report telling us uh, what it is we're being asked to do and your recommendation. And again, uh, these are fairly common for us, so I think you can be brief. Good afternoon, I'm Alan Minato, the county's finance director. I'm joined up here by Maria Oberg, who is the uh, county's treasury administrator. So the item that you have in front of you today is uh, basically initiates a hearing pursuant to the what, Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act of 1982. Waste Management Incorporated is seeking to issue bonds for facility improvements at two of their sites located in Santa Clara Valley. And so that's my presentation, sir. Question, clarifying questions for members of the board. I have just uh, one or two real quickly, Mr. Manal, before we formally open the public hearing. Uh, yes, Mr. Cortese. I, I just have a request for information and I don't wanna preempt your questions, but if we can at uh, some point in the next week or two, either from council or from yourself, um, get a, a, a written primer on what now qualifies under TEFRA for tax exempt bond issuance in terms of the types of projects. That's all, that's all I'm looking for. Th I don't need it for today, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor, and thank you, Mr. Bernardo. And uh, to that point, actually, um, one of the questions I have is, there's $300 million uh, bonds here, as I understand it, but only 26 million that are relevant to Santa Clara County directly. And my question is, are we a, a, the, a, the singular authorizing agency for all 300 million or just for the 26 million? I believe for the full 300 million, not just the 26 million. I'm not sure that it's, it matters to me today, but when we're getting the report back from Mr. Cortese, that would be a helpful clarification because I'm wondering as I sit here, does that mean that since we're less than 10% of the total authorization, that there are six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 other authorizations required, or are we somehow the chosen one, even though 90% of the uh, benefits are going in other directions? Don't have a problem with it, I, but I just, I'd like to know going forward how that process works with a little more clarity, and I think I can piggyback on Mr. Cortese's request if he'll let me. And then, um, the, uh, to the, again, to the questions that were raised uh, in the request for information, um, private sector entity, obviously, uh, with waste management, so um, that you're uh, gonna advise us and the county council's office is gonna advise us that it, uh, given the determination of public benefit, uh, that we are still in a position to authorize these for a private entity, yes? On a TEFRA hearing, yes? Okay, getting a yes, okay. Then um, thank you very much. I think those were my uh, two questions and I'll look forward to reading the report you share with us at some point in the future. Uh, that being said, if there are no other questions and it don't appear to be, we will formally open the public hearing. The public hearing is now open. I will ask, are there any members of the public who wish to speak on this item? Ms. Lanier. And I see your staff uh, creeping up behind you. Let me just make sure none of those cards are on this item. They are not. Then uh, if there are no members of the public and there appear to be none for the record, who wish to speak, we will um, formally close the public hearing and uh, now is the time for a, a discussion or deliberation by our board and in the 
absence of any comments, we'll ask the clerk to please post the voting panel on our screen so that someone can make a motion. And motion by Cortese and second by Supervisor Chavez. And just for the record, that is to approve the staff recommendation as contained in our published agenda, confirming head nods all around. We'll ask all five members to please vote on the screen. That being the case, we now ask clerk to please display the results and we can announce that the motion carries five to zero. Thank you to you both. Okay. That takes us then, or would have taken us, to item number 10, but we had a request from the administration to continue that to our next board meeting on August the 27th, I believe. So that takes us to item number 11 and uh, we're into board referrals now. And this one is from Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. This this item um, is a, this is my referral, and its origin actually um, came from a referral that Supervisor Wasserman and I did back in um, 2015. Our referral back then was for staff to produce a unified inventory of all the county's land holdings, which, by the way, had not previously existed, and we were specifically referenced a request for an inventory of publicly owned land in Santa Clara County potentially suited for affordable housing. Now that we've had plenty of success approving housing for, for the homeless community, I know we need to start to prioritize the opportunities on co county land. We already own vacant land um, right next to the hospitals and the clinics and that are, I think would be good locations for us to consider for disabled housing, for example, and, we, and people who are medically fragile. And we chose a future hub location that was perfect for foster kids and actually might be um, assist us in addressing the needs of foster children on that location or young adults. So this, re this referral asks our staff to both ed evaluate these five properties but also to ask that we get the, the original request of all of our lands that may be appropriate for, um, for permanent supportive housing and overall our Measure A program. And that would, that's my uh, motion. All right, we're gonna ask the clerk to please uh, put the voting panel up on the screen so that Supervisor Chavez can lean forward and make the motion to that effect. Uh, before I go, and I see a, um, a non-functioning second. There it is, a second from Supervisor Cortese on our screen. Uh, before I go to other members for comment, we do have three cards on this item, Supervisor Chavez. Oh, yes, I thought definitely. I would take those cards before we go to the board members, if that's okay. Card from Ev Evan Dowling. Maria Hernandez, and S. So, Mr. Dowling, are you still in the room? Yep. Don't see Mr. Dowling, all right. Ms. Hernandez, no. Nope. S, if you would like to come forward. And then, um, Mr. Largent, are you wanting to speak on this item as well? Great, thank you. If you would just bring your card forward at the time. Um, I wanted to thank Cindy for bringing these forward. I really wanted to thank her for not bringing forward the petition for the relocation plan. Um, a lot of the signatures were, I believe, fraudulent. They were posted on sites that were frequented by unhoused people. Um, and so if you don't read uh, the contents of the petition, the way that it was written, you were easily duped into believing that it was really from a good place when it wasn't. It was simply a relocation plan by people who were upset that they almost had people with cooties in their neighborhood. And so they relo wrote this relocation plan um, not with the best of intentions. So a lot of people signed the petition thinking that it was really a good idea when in fact it was just people who didn't want those people in their neighborhood. Um, so several unhoused people later found out about it and were like, hey, I want my name taken off of this. Um, so I appreciate you not bringing that petition forward. Um, it's ironic that some of those people are the same people that fought to maintain the Columbus statute, just saying. Um, also, um, just a small correction, uh, if you could use unhoused, not homeless, that'd be super cool. You know, you can be unhoused, you can have a home and still be unhoused. Um, and I'd like to see if we could look into having domestic violence shelters. Obviously we don't have enough of those. We need more family shelters. 
Um, we are getting so many families of six and eight that need a place to go. Um, I know Sunnyvale is bursting at the seams um, and we definitely need more shelters for women, children, families. Um, and I know Sunnyvale is going to open their expansion and we thought that we would have room, like, you know, just some space, but that's just gonna be full. So we definitely just need more shelter space in general. But thank you for uh, killing off that relocation plan. So sorry to see it go. Thank you very much. And our next speaker is Scott Largent. Mr. Largent, come on up. Thank you, everyone. Scott Largent. It seems like everything that we're trying to do as far as putting people somewhere that are suffering is just not working out. I, I know we're building new buildings and we're doing all these things and we say a lot in here. Um, where I'm at, I'm documenting this. I have a friend of mine uh, that's a, a filmmaker and he does documentaries and we kind of reconnected. Um, he saw a lot of the work that I was doing on YouTube. Um, he saw the similarities between that documentary that was made uh, up in Seattle, Seattle is dying. And what his main focus was opioids. And now, of course, because we have a methamphetamine problem, he's wanting to do a documentary about what's going on here. And a big part was the footage that I'm getting right on a street level right now. And the way I'm capturing this stuff, and I'm not trying to embarrass people out there, I'm capturing the worst of the worst because they're gonna die. And I say that they're being left to die, that's what's happening. They are being left to die. And, what's, and, and San Jose Police Department and our county communication has the power to not allow responses for these people. They become like, oh, it's so-and-so, no big deal. Oh, they're always doing this, just leave them be. There's a gal that her name is Chevelle, and she's been downtown. I mean, she's got a great personality. I actually really like Chevelle. It's gonna be sad when Chevelle's dead because we are just leaving her there. Chevelle is trying to shoot honey not heroin, she does already shoots heroin, but honey into her veins. She's drinking coolant, okay? She's drinking all these other different chemicals. The jugs are all out on the side right there, right in front of City Hall, right across Chevron. And I keep wondering, why are we just allowing this every single day, and why is nobody doing anything? And I know that property there sold for about $16 million. Are we allowing this to have the property levels drop so more developers can come in and get, you know, I, I don't understand, I'm confused, so thank you. All right, thank you very much. Let me confirm with the clerk, we have no other speakers on this item, we do not. Supervisor Chavez has offered her motion, it has been seconded by Supervisor <coughs> Cortese, forgive me. And uh, we have a request to speak from Supervisor Wasserman who will be followed by Supervisor Allen Burke. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, on this item, I appreciate it being brought forward and especially the part on the bottom of the first page says this referral also requests administration to scan the inventory of county owned properties and report back on any others which can be recommended for the development of Measure A housing. Um, surprisingly, I got a number of emails and phone calls but lots and lots of emails with people concerned about, for instance, the fairgrounds being in or not being in, what other properties, did we acquire the hospital so that we could build housing? Um, all these different perspectives and angles. And what I told those people was, this is a request from the board, which I'll be supporting, to administration to come back with a list of properties suitable for housing considerations for affordable ELI, VLI, the Measure A monies that we're looking for. The idea of having housing for individuals, especially in the ELI and VLI categories, near medical facilities, that makes sense to me. I've, I've said from day one that services should be near where there's transportation, and excuse me, housing should be near where there's transportation and services. And I, I see the five that the supervisor called out here, and um, that, that's fine. But what I'm most interested in is that sentence below to administration, to staff, to come back with any and all for us to consider and talk about and with recommendations. And what makes sense for us to spend Measure A money on to increase affordable and ELI and VLI housing throughout Santa Clara County for the unhoused and all the others um, that, that we can help. Thank you. 
Thank you. Supervisor Ellenberg. Uh, thank you. I was, I'm, I'm going to start with my comment, but I have a question maybe about Supervisor Wasserman's that I'm not sure I fully understood. But I too heard um, from many constituents um, on, this, on this issue, and I believe that it was a group of my constituents who um, had started that petition. So I wanted to take this time to kind of specifically address uh, that concern. Um, in, in, in my view, the fairgrounds is a community gathering space serving not just the county as a whole, but also the families that are living in the immediate surrounding neighborhoods. Um, and I'm guessing that most of us have been there and there is a dearth of open and community space in this part of the county and the fairgrounds serve as a place to provide programs and services to every member of this community. And it is significant to me that it appears that the people who are advocating for housing at the fairgrounds live in neighborhoods that are not adjacent to that property. Uh, this neighborhood, which is part of San Jose City Council District 8 and County District 2, mm -hmm. or 7 and 2, thank you, um, is, is struggling and resource-strapped. Resource There's a Title I elementary school adjacent to the fairgrounds. And without any shadow of a doubt, we are in the midst of a crisis of homelessness. And, it's and it is incumbent on our government to use every tool in our arsenal to alleviate and eventually eliminate this crisis. We also need to be careful and responsible in our alleviation efforts to not create new or further challenges, not to place disproportionate onus on any single neighborhood, and to ensure that this responsibility is borne collectively. I will be voting yes today to ensure that our county properties all find their best and highest use for every resident. So, my, and my question uh, for Supervisor Wasserman, um, the motion as it, the, the referral as it stands does preemptively exclude one property, but that language that you quoted also says any other property. Can you clarify if you are excluding any properties? Thank you. It was not my intention okay. to exclude any properties. Um, I think that's an area where Supervisor Chavez and I may disagree a, a little bit. Um, we have a fairgrounds master plan mm -hmm. that basically has on the map that the community has been told about and that our facilities and fleet has brought to us four areas. One area I think was called parking. One area I think was called um, historical uh, for the fair, the existing buildings. The third area was for short-term purposes and the fourth area was for long-term purposes. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe we've done anything, any, we, we haven't done anything more specific than say parking, historical, short-term, long-term. Mm -hmm. I think that conversation is still one to come, whether or not there is additional housing in that area or not. Uh, there's two different ways to look at it for me. One. There were 500 affordable housing units built in that area shortly prior to my coming here. Uh, you were here, Supervisor, nobody else was. Um, you inherited that, he, that was there. So that that is there. Should any more be added on to that or not? I, I don't know, I don't have any idea what that means. The area around there is high density, has a lot of needs, and do I wanna see housing where the needs are? Yes. The point you just made about the, the school and about the some disadvantages that certain areas around there have, the idea of having housing there instead of housing somewhere else for those people to benefit is appealing to me. I have no idea, none whatsoever, totally ignorant and looking forward to learning, if anything else should be done more there at the fairgrounds in terms of housing. I have none. I'm looking forward to staff coming back and saying, nope, that's problematic, or nope, that's, that's not appropriate. I believe, and this is maybe where you and I differ a little bit, is the community meetings being held didn't talk about housing at, at all. I think you'll agree with that because the fairgrounds master plan didn't have anything specific to share. We had offers from San Jose Giants, for instance, where we'll take all the fairgrounds and build a stadium and we'll build some soccer fields. And this board said no thank you to that and some others. I know we've said no thank you to several things. 
I don't think we've said yes to anything that we've received. So I'm just, I'm supporting this because it says administration come back to the board with a list of properties where high density housing would be, would be uh, appropriate. I'm not closed minded to anything. So Supervisor Chavez, maybe explain, help yes. clarify for me what a yes vote on this means. Thank you, and, and Supervisor Samidian's already offered to jump in and translate if I don't get this clear for you all. Um, so, so the point that there, there are three, really, I'm sorry, there are two actions that we would be taking today. One is to reissue our referral from 2015 that that we have already requested information on. And that had a whole bunch of properties that we didn't even own that are, that these are all new properties that weren't part of that initial, um, didn't have. we didn't have them. So what I'm asking is for the staff to, to, to follow up on the referral that was made by the board um, then, okay. and then to add these specific locations um, to, the, to the discussions, and for them on their own to tell us if there are other opportunities. Now, the reason I excluded the fairgrounds from this process is the fairgrounds has a master planning process, and my understanding is that staff is gonna bring back a discussion of the fairgrounds to us within the next couple of months. And to me, the, the, that the because it has a distinct process, I wanna allow that distinct process to continue. Now, it, so that's my, that's the motion, that's what you'd be saying yes to. Supervisor Chavez, could I ask a couple of questions about that motion? Are you gonna clarify again? No, no go I'm, ahead, just please. Gonna, I'm just gonna please. make sure I understand the motion. Uh, okay. And, um, cause I, I may be speaking Semitian as a second language here, so I just wanna <laughs> uh, make sure I got it right. <laughs> I, I hear your recommended action, the motion that is on the floor and that Supervisor uh, Cortese has seconded as being specific as it indicates on packet page 49 as to the specific county owned properties the five bulleted properties in the memo. Then beyond that, I hear your motion saying, hey, could we get back to the previous referral and even more broadly look at virtually any and all potential sites that are currently county owned. I do not hear your motion referencing the fairgrounds specifically in any way, although your enclosure makes plain why you think it is not well suited to this purpose. But I think it will be perhaps a little bit easier given your point about um, the fairgrounds being in a separate process. If the if everybody's just clear, nothing happened one way or the other. Right. Nobody's right. saying, hey, yes, this is in. Nobody's saying, no, it's not. Uh, we're saying, we're asking you to look at everything and anything. Please get back to that referral from 2015. Please pay special attention to these five sites that we've called out on purpose in your memo. Uh, and uh, we look forward to more conversations about the fairgrounds when it's time when for it more comes. conversations yeah. about the fairgrounds. That was my long-winded, Semidian-esque version of your motion. I just wanted to make sure. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Thanks so much. Supervisor uh, Ellenberg has your line up. Okay, that is that is slightly different from my original understanding, so that is helpful. And what is the timing approximately on when we're going to hear uh, more about the fairgrounds? Can I clarify just? Please, I was Supervisor just Cortese. say this anyway, it was my only comment, is we already have ongoing uh, reporting coming in, uh, well, at least every month for the last several months to committee. Um, and since we both serve on the same committees, right. I'm always F confused as to, <laughs> it's FGOC, CSFC, yeah. CS, noticed together as if they were one committee, but that's where it comes. And when does it come to the board? We, we, Excuse we were, me, when you say when does it come to the board, you're referring we, to the- an update on the, the fairgrounds. fairgrounds master yeah. plan. And I know our staff isn't here, but my understanding is that it was gonna come within the next 60 days because, and, and let me just say why, the there were there were a couple of steps that need to be taken with it and, um, and so once it comes to FGOC, it will be coming to the board, and I think it's coming to FGOC in the, at one of the next two meetings. And the only reason I know that is I've been bugging them. Let me ask Dr. Smith staff. if he can help us. I can try to chime in here. Um, the board's being asked in the um, rest of the agenda to close out the RFP that was done to request outside bidders to propose uses for the fairgrounds. We're doing that because there were no successful or 
appropriate bidders. That has to be done before we can come back and ask for further direction uh, from the board to come back with other suggestions. Um, so we anticipate coming back to the committee within 60 days with suggestions about how to proceed in process. Um, and hopefully that answers the question. I think Supervisor Ellenberg asked though when it comes to the full board. So you referenced the committee, Dr. Smith. The committee and then it would come to the full board uh, two to three weeks after that. So 60 days plus two to three weeks, is it fair to call that 90 days so for the record? About three months from now. What? Within three months, 90 oh, days? around November. Right, okay. but okay. that'll just be for direction the, because the staff has made a number of recommendations in the past which have all been, um, shall I say, not, not appreciated by the board. So at this point, I think it's up to the board to decide which direction we want to go in. Uh, there's been suggestions for commercial, for housing, for recreation, for um, industrial, um, all of those things. Um, so, so we look we forward to a vigorous we won't discussion. Be, we won't be giving you a, a decided event. We'll just give you options. Okay, thank you very much. All right. We still have a motion, we still have a second. I think we have clarity on what the motion uh, contains and does not contain. We'll ask all five members to please vote on their screens. That's been done. Let's ask the clerk to display the results so that we can announce that the motion carries five to zero. Thank you very much. That was item number 11. That takes us to item number 12, which is next up. We are still on board member referrals and uh, this referral, oops, let me, I'm getting some cards. We have about a dozen cards, just uh, so everyone knows. But uh, this referral is from Supervisor Chavez, I believe. Yes, it is. And Supervisor Chavez, we have about a dozen cards. Would you like to present and then go to the speakers, if any, which we do? Great. Uh, the only thing, if I, if I could just say what's in front of the board and then Whatever you'd like. comments, thank you. Um, the purpose of bringing this referral forward is I'm asking my colleagues for your support in placing a five-eighths of one cent sales tax measure on the November 3rd, 2020 ballot. Um, in this referral, if this referral gains support from my colleagues, the staff would then come back to the board with the necessary actions at our September 10th meeting, enabling us to place this tax measure on the ballot. We have been <clears throat> cautioned by our own administration during the budget process last year that the county was facing major bu budget threats due to potential loss of revenue and cost, shift, cost shifting resulting from decisions made at higher levels of government. And since this threat has not dissipated, um, this is an opportunity for us to, uh, for us to add um, resources where we know we still have significant projects that haven't been done. And as you know, Dr. Smith has been cautioning all of us against starting anything new um, because we don't know the future of our county revenues. I, I, we have to be fiscally responsible and at times very cautious, but we also have to be strategic and bold. And it does not seem strategic for us to maintain the status quo relative to the services we offer and relative to the needs of our workforce. Um, I know our workers and residents need childcare, our healthcare and hospital system is growing. Climate change, as you all know, is real and ongoing and one of the greatest threats to our community and we have to be able to respond at a local level. We've committed to reforming our foster care system and to really focusing on prevention. So I, I believe that we're really looking at ways to stem the tide of cost and human suffering, uh, but how we stem that tide and the timing under which we can do it, I think is very challenging and is one of the reasons I'm asking for your support. We've also preserved to commit, um, preserving agricultural land and these funds need to be meaningfully address a broad range of priorities to deliver services to our residents and support our workforce. So according to the calculation provided to us last year, a 5 cent sales tax would generate an estimated $250 million in our general fund revenue annually beginning in 221. And with that, I'm very interested in um, hearing from the public and I'm very interested in hearing from my colleagues. 
and that would be my motion. Thank you very much. Uh, and would you like us to put the uh, voting panel up on the screen so you can leave forward and make the motion? Let me ask the clerk to do that. Uh, so we have a motion by Supervisor uh, Chavez on this referral, and we have a dozen cards, as I say. I note a second by Supervisor Fertese, just for the record. And I'm going to ask uh, uh, the clerk to accommodate us here. We have the two-minute uh, sign-up. Thank you. I have cards from Evan Dowling, Maria Hernandez, Mark Landgraf, Donna Wallach, Ruth Silver Taub, and Rosa Vargas. If you are one of those people, would you come on up, tell us who you are, and we'll keep track of you. And then we'll get to the rest of the cards right after. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, supervisors, Mark Landgraf, External Affairs Manager for the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. As you've heard me say many times uh, in the previous occasions, the Open Space Authority has been working very closely with planning staff at the county on uh, development and implementation of the Santa Clara Valley Agricultural Preservation Plan, which highlights the importance of protecting agricultural lands in our county. The plan in December received the governor's top environmental award and more recently received awards by the American Planning Association at both Bay Area and statewide levels. Agriculture in Santa Clara County contributes over 1.6 billion in total value to the economy annually and is an important local food source and serves as a climate fighting strategy in alignment with the state of California's climate strategies. In order to, to permanently protect from development the highest priority 12,000 acres identified in the Ag Plan, a dedicated local source of funding needs to be established as approximately 500 million over the next 15 to 20 years would be required to preserve those lands through conservation easements. I'm speaking on this agenda item to express our interest in any and all efforts to generate uh, and allocate funding, uh, which has the potential, even if in part, to be applied to preserving our precious remaining agricultural land for the benefit of the people. Time is of the essence to identify a dedicated source of ongoing funding. The authority stands ready to assist as a primary partner to the county and uh, uh, on its ag preservation efforts in any way it can. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for your comments. All right, let me call others who apparently uh, did not come down to speak. Evan Dowling, are you here and wishing to speak? No? Maria Hernandez, are you here and wishing to speak? No. Donna Wallach, are you here and wishing to speak? You are. To be followed by Ruth Silvertow. Well, my name is Donna Wallach. The county needs the revenues for affordable housing for low income people and for IHSS to cover the needs of all the clients and to pay a living wage to the providers. I've lived in San Jose since 1997. This year, my rent increased from $750 a month, all utilities included, to $1,000 a month, no utilities included. Housing is a human right. There should be affordable housing for all the people living in this county. Selling public land to Google has only exacerbated the problem, and if Google is allowed to build their new campus in downtown San Jose, hundreds and thousands of us are gonna be displaced. Those of us who care for the elderly, the handicapped, and children need to live close to our work and not be forced to move far away and then drive hours to get to and from work. For the people who depend on us, their lives depend on us to live close by. In addition, the healthcare system is more of a medical assault system. When my twin sister was dying from cancer, her medical insurance, Blue Shield, prevented her from getting treatments and wouldn't provide her any of the medications that she needed. Also, IHSS could only cover a fraction of the hours of care that she needed, and she needed 24-7 care. We had to pay out of pocket for someone to watch her at night. I took care of her from 7.30 a.m. until 11 p.m. at night, seven days a week, but I could only claim six hours a day, five days a week. IHSS needs to be able to provide all the hours necessary for the clients and to pay $15 an hour to the providers. This is important. Our next speaker is Ruth Silvertaub, to be followed by Rosa Vargas. Hello. Um, 
president and uh, supervisors and staff. Um, I, my name is Ruth Silvertobe. <coughs> I'm supervising attorney at the Catherine and George Alexander Community Law Center and coordinator of the Wage Theft Coalition. I'm here to urge you to put a revenue measure on the ballot so that we can fund housing, health care, and child care services. Um, with the highest monthly housing costs in the nation, many working families are struggling to find an affordable place to live. Um, child care costs are going through the roof, and health insurance is still unaffordable for many. Um, I have had sick clients who uh, had to sleep in their car, which made them even sicker. Just recently, one of our clients was fired because um, the employer changed her hours of work and she could not find affordable uh, child care um, until uh, she f her child care was at 8.15. They changed her time of work from, seven, from 9 to 7, and so she couldn't come into work at the time she was required to come into work, and she was fired. Um, I've had many, many cases where clients um, have become homeless because they've lost paychecks. Um, as you know, uh, wage theft is a scourge, and so many workers and so many residents in this county um, are grappling with the uh, monumental housing costs, uh, the difficulty of finding childcare, as well as problems um, accessing the health care system. So I urge you to put a revenue measure on the ballot so we can fund critical housing, health care, and child care. Thank you. Thank you. Rosa Vargas. And as Ms. Vargas makes her way forward, I'll indicate that uh, she'll be followed by Juan Salcedo, Jim Marshall, James, I believe it's Brighton, Violet Thornton, Carol Worth. Oh, buenas tardes. If I'm interpreting, do I, is there additional time? There is additional time, so we'll ask the clerk to adjust the time to four minutes. That will provide two minutes plus two minutes. Thank you very much. Oh, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Rosa Vargas, residente de San Jose. Tengo 20, 32 años de vivir aquí en, en, ciudad, en esta ciudad. Tengo cinco hijos, mi esposo y yo siempre hemos trabajado hasta dos trabajos y siempre se nos ha hecho difícil pagar la renta. Ya ahora más por los dos tenemos disability. A mí, a mí me dio un stroke y a él le dio un ataque al corazón. Y tengo una hija, una hija que tiene hijos. Ellos han tenido que tomarse el trabajo por la mañana y él por la noche. Y, y por eso hoy pido que hay, haya más programas de cuidado de niños accesibles para la familia trabajadora como nosotros. Por eso es que con todo respeto pido a los servidores que voten por alguna medida que ayude a solucionar el problema. Muchas gracias. Good afternoon. My name is Rosa Vargas. I'm a, been a resident of San Jose and for 32 years. My, I have five children. My husband and I have always had to have two jobs. Uh, paying the rent has always been hard on us as we both have disabilities. I've had a stroke and my husband has suffered from heart attacks. I have a daughter who has kids herself. She works in the morning and her husband works in the afternoon and at night. And today I'm here to ask you to help with um, providing money for accessible child care. We need these programs. Please help these kids with disabilities and their working families. With all due respect, I beg you to vote um, for help to s help us solve this problem. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> all right, Juan Salcedo, Jim Marshall, James Brighton, Violet Thornton, and Carol Worth. Come on down. Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Soy, soy Juan Salcedo, soy residente de San José, retirado y he trabajado y sigo trabajando en dos trabajos para poder vivir para lo necesario para pagar mi vivienda. 
y rento un cuarto con una familia porque no me alcanza para pagar un estudio con mi salario. Para mi trabajo está aquí y ya estoy mayor de edad para buscar otra opción en otro condado que pueda estar un poco más accesible. Tengo 64 años y para manejar dos o tres horas diario, pues ya no, ¿verdad? Hay personas que han tenido que moverse por, la raz por esa razón, pero yo considero aquí a San José como mi segunda, mi segunda patria. Tengo 44 años residiendo aquí y no se me, se me dificulta cambiar para otro lado. Porque aquí el costo de la vivienda está, está muy así. Vive uno a gusto, pero pues con los salarios no alcanza uno. Por eso, ese es el problema más grande que enfrentamos los residentes de San José. Por eso les pido, con todo respeto, a los supervisores, a personas encargadas, que voten para agarrar pues, más fondos para poder sobrevivir. Um, I'm read what was written. I didn't get everything, unfortunately. Um, hi, my name is Juan Salcedo. I'm a resident of San Jose. I'm retired and I'm, I've been I'm still working two jobs just to survive in this county. Um, I, and at my age, I can't move to another city. Um, for me, the only thing that I'm able to get with my rent is to rent a, a room with a family. Um, here's my, my work and, um, and I know I consider um, San Jose as my, my second um, Second uh, second home. My second country, thank you. Um, that's, that's why uh, there are, I know there are many people who have had to li move out of the county um, for these same reasons that I'm experiencing. That's why um, I'm asking to you, the supervisors, um, and to those who are in charge to be able to help us resolve this problem of housing that us residents in San Jose are facing. Um, and vote, please, in favor of creating more funds to be able to um, to be able to uh, achieve this. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Jim Marshall, and then James Brighton, and then Violet Thornton, welcome. Good afternoon, supervisors. Thank you for the time to speak here. I'm uh, Jim Marshall. I'm a resident of the Santa Clara Valley my whole life, proudly. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to afford a home earlier, and, um, but I'm not blind to the situation. I don't think I need to belabor the point that we live in one of the richest areas in the nation and have one of the highest homeless rates in the nation. I myself have neighbors who lived in apartments down the street and are now living underneath bridges. My son had to move out of the area to find an affordable home. Every year I'm a retired teacher. Um, every year we lose three, four, five really excellent teachers who cannot afford to live here anymore and move out of the area. They also, my colleagues cannot afford childcare in the area. Childcare should be one of the highest valued things our society could offer. Bringing up the next generation is a sacred trust and we're blowing it because we cannot, we aren't putting our money where our value should be and that is supporting quality child care. I, I will um, proudly con um, congratulate this county on its wonderful job with health services and Valley Medical is a great thing. My nephew and a boy, who, a young man, who I consider a second son, um, both have had to avail themselves of the mental health facilities, but it's still not enough. Um, there are holes and there are more services that could happen. As a teacher, again, I know the need for wraparound services are great should be tied into the school systems more than they have been. All this can be helped with some more steady revenue. I know sales tax is not a great thing, um, but I think um, for myself, and I think I can speak for many of my neighbors, five-eighths of one cent is not a lot to ask of someone to help their neighbors out. And also, I'd like to urge you to vote for this and put it on the ballot. Let's not take a card from the Mitch McConnell playbook. Let's actually let democracy work and put it on the on the ballot for us, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Jim Brighton. 
Violet Thornton, <clears throat> Carol Worth. Um, my name is James Brighton. I live in Morgan Hill. And I wanted to thank you for giving me a moment to tell you a little bit about my story. <clears throat> Three and a half years ago, I had an uninsured traumatic injury to my arm, uh, leaving it non-functional for about a year, and it required two corrective surgeries. This cut short my life of semi-retirement in Maui. <laughs> um, I returned to what I always considered to be my home, the Bay Area. <clears throat> A great friend had an available bedroom in his condo and offered to rent it to me for what we both thought would be a transitional time frame of about six months, just while I secured a small apartment for myself. It is now two and a half years later and the great friend has become my housing savior um, due, to the, due to this crisis. This is what I have learned in two and a half years of searching for housing for around 2,000 a month plus utilities. I can live like a college kid in a dorm, like in a dorm like setting or rent a room in a private home with few privileges and no rental rights. 2000 a month, you get no sense of housing security. <clears throat> Even a minor case of housing insecurity can and will do damage to your self-confidence, your self-worth, your sense of community, your happiness, and your hope. Everything takes a hit. Our county has gone beyond has just gone beyond what is just a crisis in housing availability and affordability. Urgent, creative, and collaborative ongoing actions are needed starting today. Sorry. I would also ask you to put the tax measure on the ballot to start the process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Violet Thornton to be followed by Carol Worth. Come on down, folks. Thank you very much. My name is Violet Thornton. I've been born and raised in this area. I've worked for Momentum for Mental Health for the past 20 years, and I don't think it's a surprise to everyone that housing is really expensive. This is really hurting our employees. Um, I'm, an, I'm an admin, but what I see is that in my particular program, we're losing case managers sometimes one, two a month because they can't afford to live in this area and they have to move and that really impacts our clients because they're already struggling with their own mental illnesses and then on top of that, they have trust in a worker and then they have to adjust to somebody else and that's really difficult. I am particularly hurt by this because in 1992, I came into the system, I was on SSI and I was supported by the same agency. And when I see it not being able to do what it did for me so that people can rise to their potential, it really hurts. So please, please vote to put this measure on the ballot and let people vote for more access to care, more access to resources for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Carol Worth to be followed by Tim W. And then Carol Garvey. And then Caroline Wynn. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for letting me be here today. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist with Momentum for Mental Health. Uh, we work primarily with people who are insecure, have insecure housing. And when uh, a client of ours has insecure housing, it makes it very difficult for us to deal with the other issues that they're dealing with, their mental health issues and any um, substance use issues until that's, that housing becomes secure. So it makes it very difficult for us to try and help these people get back to a place where they want to be. Um, I don't know if I have anything else to add to that, but it is really difficult to treat, to provide good treatment for these people so that they can move beyond that and uh, take advantage of our other services, including um, employment services and that. So insecure housing is really a big issue for our population. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you. It's Ms. Worth, yes? 
Thank you. Tim W., Carol Garvey, Carolyn Wynn. Tim W. was going to speak for Sarah Billings, it says. Not here, okay. And how about Carol Garvey? Come on up. Hello. Um, my name's Carol Garvey. I'm a resident of San Jose for 64 years. I'm a little older than that, but nevertheless, uh, I'm here to speak uh, for Crystal Parsons. She's a concerned member of our community from Gilroy. She wanted to be here uh, very much, but her husband's in the hospital. So I'm going to just read a few things she wrote on her on this card of why she uh, believes this uh, in putting this revenue measure on the ballot. Um, she wrote, uh, families are not able to afford childcare even when they work. Uh, seniors are not able to attend senior care. Buying and renting is so high, average of 2,400 a month for a one bedroom apartment. And uh, all deserve a roof, education, and opportunities to thrive. And I actually didn't think I had anything to say because I am fortunate and consider myself independently middle class, but um, it occurred to me that every night when I take a, my walk around Bacasto Park, trying to get my steps, uh, 13th and Jackson, there are people bedding down for the night in their cars. Sometimes there's children with them. Uh, sometimes there's people laying on the cement in front of this small school building that's there. And I presume it's because there, it's well light. The lights are on all well lit. The lights are on all night. Um, I know retirees who go without dental care because they can't afford it. Um, they have to pay their rent, or they're sometimes helping family. And um, you know, I I believe that uh, we need to make Santa Clara a better place to live, work, and raise our families. And I'm here to urge you to let us vote on this revenue measure. Thank you. Thank you. Caroline Wynn. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Caroline Nguyen, and I'm a resident of Morgan Hill. Quality, affordable child care is for all is vital to our families and the success for everyone in Santa Clara community. As a mom of two kids with needs, with one children being in the hospital since infancy, finding affordable child care that can facilitate my child's needs and ensure their safety was next to impossible. Three in four of our preschool and school age children are in need of child care services, but cannot find any. Child care services are essential for working families so that parents can go to work and take care of their families. Fortunately, instead of me putting my career on hold, a couple of family members retired early and switched days off caring for my kids, but we pay and we pay a nanny to come once a week to give them a break, but we pay a qualified nanny more than I make hourly, so we can't afford for her to come more often. We need to make Santa Clara County a better place to live, work, and raise our families. I am here to urge you to let us vote on this revenue measure. Our community needs more funding to address our housing, child care, and health care crisis. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I believe that is all of the cards we have for folks who want to speak on this item. It is. All right. Well, then we'll bring the matter back to the board. Again, we have a motion by Supervisor Chavez, a second by Supervisor Cortese. Is there a debate or discussion? Supervisor Wasserman. Thank you. I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, I'm not able to support this motion. Um, my concern is the cost of living we already have in Santa Clara County and additional sales tax adding to the cost. I heard and appreciate and understand all the concerns we hear at each meeting about housing. I know the people of Santa Clara County passed by a two-thirds majority a Measure A housing bond of $950 million just a couple years ago. We spent $250 million of that. There's 14 housing projects being constructed right now. And we still have $700 million to give out to support um, affordable, transitional, unhoused, ELI, VLI, um, housing projects and I'm looking forward to finding locations to do that and to use the funds that the people of Santa Clara County tax themselves because they said this was worthwhile that it was important that we find and provide 
additional affordable housing in Santa Clara County. We are doing that. Can it happen overnight? No. Is it enough? No. Is it something? Yes. But the cost of living here already is so high. And for me, a sales tax just adds on to every single thing that a person buys except for food and increases the cost of living here. I've been here nine years now. Our, our county budget has doubled. Our number of employees are up 50%. The economy's been booming for nine years, 10 years, and I think we all agree it's at least leveling off if it's not gonna slow down. And I'm concerned about raising the daily costs of living in Santa Clara County further. So I'm not able to support this at this time. Thank you. Other comments, if any? All right, if not, then we'll ask all five members to please vote on the screen. All votes have been cast. We'll ask the clerk to please display the results. And the motion carries on a three to one to one vote. And as is indicated on the screen, Supervisor Wasserman is a no vote. Supervisor Smitian is an abstention. And uh, the measure carries on a three one one vote. Thank you. Supervisor Wasserman, you're. He was putting to me. Oh, Supervisor uh, Chavez, you. not Wasserman. I just wanted to ask um, if the county staff could just explain the process. And the reason I, I want to ask you to do that is that um, I know it takes four votes for the next phase, but I thought if you could just explain the next steps more so the public n knows and understands what's happening. Sure. We'll, we'll return at the September 10th, uh, 2019 meeting as directed by the board. Uh, with an ordinance uh, for action. Um, the ordinance itself, in order to pass what would require four votes to go on the ballot, that's in accordance with the California Constitution. Um, but this, this motion only required three votes and we will bring back the uh, requested ordinance. Thank you, and I, the reason I was asking um, ca County Council to clarify that is I just wanted to make sure the public understood the difference between the first action and needing four votes for the sec second action. Thank you. Thank you. That takes us to item number 13, yet another referral, and that's the pay equity strategic plan. So this item, um, this pay equity strategic plan um, request is um, a, a referral I'm bringing forward with Supervisor Cortezi to reinforce and expand the referral, referral we brought together uh, September 15th of 2015 under Dave's leadership. At that time, we were asking staff for the following, a pay equity policy or ordinance to address the county's role as an employer and a contractor to assist the Office of Women's Policy and the Commission on the Status of Women on the completion of a countywide pay equity study to assess county policies and practices relating to hiring, pay, and promotion and their implications for pay equity and to propose an online demographics pay equity dashboard to develop a plan to rectify any pay inequities that were identified. And I know the county has made a lot of progress since then. And on March 14th, 2017, the board adopted a workforce diversity policy. On September 15th, 2017, the board approved the board policy to allow the county to disqualify potential contractors based on pay equity violations and to take actions against contractors that violate pay equity laws. On November 7th, 2017, the board directed administration to develop a business license program for businesses in unincorporated county. In addition to that, the board has directed the administration to develop a pilot program to enforce wage theft violations through the food, um, food facility permits. The Office um, of Labor Standards and Enforcement reported at the December 4th meeting in, uh, in 2018, board meeting, that the administration would bring, be bringing a proposed business license ordinance to the board in six to 12 months. Progress has been made as it relates to our hiring and promoting practices and the mechanism for tracking pay equity complaints. And additionally, the administration and council have submitted two annual pay equity reports to the board. The reason that we're bringing this additional referral forward is because based on these annual reports, we can't with clarity and confidence determine where we are as an employer, where do we need to be, and what will it take to get there. In other words, there are still three outstanding issues. 
a pay equity study, the online demographic pay equity dashboard, and a plan to rectify and identify any um, pay, pay inequities. Um, in addition, I know that we still have some work in our work plan that hasn't come back to the board. So with this referral, we're asking for the administration to come back to the board on September 24th with a proposal on the development and implementation of the County of Santa Clara Pay Equity Strategic Plan. This proposal should either identify in-house resources needed to complete the development and the oversight of the implementation plan or identify if the county needs to engage outside expertise or what support or services they need on the implementation of the pay equity strategic plan. The plan should be structured in a way to enable the county to track progress relative to how we're doing as an employer in terms of pay equity and how can we can work with contractors to, to make sure that they're adhering to pay, our pay equity principles. And lastly, the plan should outline pay equity principles, outcomes, benchmarks, responsibilities, assignments, and timelines. Essentially, a very structured work plan is what we're requesting. Uh, President Smitty, let me just add, uh, in short, um, after that very thorough presentation by Supervisor Chavez, this is probably just one of those situations where committee work is is working or um, producing information back to the board just as it should. I mean, we are in committee trying to grapple with these issues and trying to determine, you know, what else we need or we would like to have in terms of um, uh, in, in terms of um, resources, I guess, uh, to get to the outcomes that the board has already prescribed. So I won't say anything more than that. It's in, in many ways um, reflective, though, as, as you know, f all of you from sitting on your own committees of a much deeper dive that's been happening at the committee level um, uh, over several months. Thank you. Thank you. Comments from other members of the board? If not, if we could ask the clerk to please display the voting panel on our screen so that Supervisor Chavez can make the motion, which he has. And we also have a second from Supervisor Cortese. Before I call on all members to vote, let me confirm that there are no cards from members of the public who wish to speak on this item. There are none, so we could ask all five members to please vote on the screen. That having been done, we'll ask the clerk to please display the results. And we can indicate that the motion carries on a five to zero basis. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez and Cortese, both. Colleagues, that takes us to our next item, and that would be item 14. And here again, we have a referral from a colleague. We have one card on this item, uh, but uh, Mr. Cortese, if you'd like to go ahead and present first, and then we'll take the speaker from the public. Okay, yes, just to, just to lay out what the request is, um, we're, I'm asking for the administration to come back to the board with um, a proposal um, in re response to the inquiries that you see outlined um, on the front page of, of the item here on the development and implementation of a, a pilot program or potential pilot program to test the impact of regular unconditional cash grants to foster youth 18 to 21 in the county. And I just want to say when, um, if any of you have the question, what is meant by unconditional, I probably would if I was reading the referral as a third party. Um, unconditional in the sense that it's not prescribed to housing, it's not prescribed specifically to um, uh, healthcare deductibles uh, or medical costs um, or uh, registration for school or groceries. It is um, the idea that much like um, the few UBI pilots that are out there, it is um, a, a much more fungible or, or flexible fund that would be available. Obviously, we need to know before we would embark on such a thing um, in the context of budgeting cost and effectiveness, the number of young people who could be, who could be included in such a program, the size of payment that would uh, be effective or be needed to cover participants' basic needs in the first place, um, how this kind of a program would be aligned with other support and services and how such a program could best be evaluated, which may be the, um, the biggest issue of all um, in terms of, of measurement of um, the, the effectiveness of the program. Um, I have, I, uh, this was prompted in part by discussions with folks who have been involved at, at a very high level in the philanthropic community with UBI 
um, who have expressed interest in potential public-private partnership that's referenced in the, um, in the referral itself uh, as a potential. And as all of you know, um, with other types of models like pay for success, and I'm not saying this is pay for success, but with those types of models, we've been successful to some degree with public-private partnerships that have um, measurables in them uh, that allow people to um, uh, to advance in the community um, without us uh, having some of the restrictions we would normally have. And I, I just want to say with, um, I have done some preliminary vetting of of the general concept with county council's office. Um, again, as I think all of you know, Greta Hansen uh, in county council's office has been particularly involved in some past models that might be similar to this here. Um, and uh, again, just as full disclosure and hopefully reassurance, I want you to know that this list of inquiries and the kind of things we would have to go explore before we brought this back for any kind of final action or determinative action. Uh, at least the inquiry listed here has been uh, vetted with council as the right questions to be asking before we come back. And uh, obviously, um, county executive's office and the administration um, are expected to to uh, weigh in, and that's called out in the first sentence of the recommendation. So, it's it's. Could be a big deal, could be very, very exciting, but at this point, as usual with referral, we're just, um, I'm just asking for all the questions to be answered before we take any further action. And Thank you. I would like to move the item with that explanation, and I, I know we have Rain to hear from the public speaker. Forward. Great. Um, so we have the screen up for you, Supervisor, and um, then we'll go to Supervisor Ellenberg. Thank you, um, and thank you, Supervisor Cortese, for this this referral. I think it's really innovative um, and something that could work. Um, I want to just add a couple of uh, questions that I would like to be part of the, the report when it comes back. Mm -hmm. um, it's stated that, uh, that we start a basic income pilot program, and what I'm concerned about is whether we are conflating the concepts of of basic income and unconditional cash payments. As, as I understand it, unconditional cash payments would mean n not only um, fungible, which I think is a good thing in the way that you described, but also that the county wouldn't have any mechanism to measure impact or outcomes because there would be no um, reporting on unconditional pa <coughs> cash payments. But by contrast, a basic income program could mean that we can track those outcomes, and I do want to ensure that this program, if implemented, will have trackable, measurable outcomes um, and an appropriate tracking of, of impact, um, certainly at a minimum, so that we know if this is working, how do we expand it, how mm -hmm. do we support more uh, transitional age youth. And I'd like to see two things specifically in the report. Uh, first, what would it look like to an include an experimental evaluation where the pilot would have a test group and a control group to truly measure impact. Um, and uh, your suggestion I, I particularly like about public-private partnerships, so I'd like the report to come back as well with some potential partnerships, um, public-private funding mechanisms that might be available to us, if those are all agreeable. Uh, that's all agreeable, and like I, I said at the outset on the word unconditional, I, that does uh, okay. jump out and it is it wasn't intended to conflate two different concepts. This is a UBI um, or basic income or universal so basic income model, absolutely. And frankly, um, I am a big fan of the pay for success model that we used, uh, particularly on the, we've used it a couple times, but particularly on the homelessness side um, with Abode being um, our third party and, and several private sector investors in, in that. But I didn't want to prescribe and that, of course, is, is very measurable. You get paid when you accomplish the outcome, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to be so restrictive in this as to call out that particular mechanism, but just, I only say that just to, um, to let you know how much I agree with you that um, whatever comes back, it, it, it needs to be, it needs to have our best thinking and our best selves reflected in terms of how we measure success. And the other two items, absolutely. Experimental evaluation, I think that's um, 
a great opportunity as well while we're while we're seizing an opportunity if we choose to do it on uh, on outcomes why not experiment with evaluation as well public private um, we've gotten a little bit of a head start in terms of talking to some of those people already but hopefully administration and council can really um, on their own conduct uh, those kind of discussions and meetings with potential partners before they come back thank you Thank you both colleagues. We do have a card from Amanda Clifford. Ms. Clifford, would you like to come up and share your thoughts with the, oh, did we have somebody else who wanted to speak? All right, we'll come back to you if you do uh, still wish to speak in a moment. Thank you. Hello, my name is Amanda Clifford and I am the Policy and Advocacy Associate for Bill Wilson Center. I am here today to speak in favor of the implementation of a basic income pilot program for young people transitioning out of the foster care system. Bill Wilson Center has a vision to prevent poverty in the next generation by connecting youth and families to education, employment, housing, and positive relationships. We believe a universal basic income is aligned with our vision for future generations of Santa Clara County residents. A universal basic income for youth transitioning out of foster care will prevent these youth from experiencing economic hardship and will ensure foster youth have a safety net as they head to the next stages of life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other comments or questions? Supervisor Cortese, I know your light is still on, sir. Uh, no. Thank you. Let me just uh, speak briefly uh, before I cast my vote for the motion. Uh, I appreciated uh, the uh, ability to uh, articulate the thinking behind the motion and uh, the fact that this is a referral, uh, not a final action. It's a request for some thoughts from our professional staff about how we might go down this path. Um, there are a dozen and one good reasons why I would support this particular referral, but I want to focus on one that is perhaps unique to my own experience, and that is I sat in these chambers 20 years ago. We talked about the challenges that foster kids had. I have heard those conversations year in and year out. I was in Sacramento for a dozen years where well-intentioned legislation was passed, and here we are 20 years later in my own experience, uh, and frankly, these kids are still not having the level of success that they can and should have after they come through our system. Uh, what we are doing now does not work. It doesn't. And so if it doesn't work, then I think it behooves us to ask ourselves, are there different or better ways that we could address the needs of these kids? It's not only in their interest, it's in the interest of the larger community. Not sure what we'll see back from staff. Not sure yet whether it's something I'll be able to support but I'm absolutely sure that these are questions that need to be asked and addressed, and I thank Supervisor Cortese for putting them forward, and that's why I'm gonna lean forward and push the yes. All votes have now been cast. Let's ask the staff to please display the results overhead. Passes 5-0. Thank you all very much. Thank you to our speaker for being with us today. That takes us to our next item, which is uh, item 15. Supervisor Cortese, this is also yours. This, this is uh, just a simple sponsorship re referral um, relative to the annual um, APOLI uh, benefit. This is their 22nd uh, gala and alumni reunion. The amount requested is $1,500. Um, I, I guess that's about it. If uh, anyone, I, I think everyone up here is quite familiar with APOLI and the work of its founder, Dr. Michael Chang. Um, but if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. We'll ask the clerk to please display the voting panel on the screen. I don't believe we have any speakers on this item, Madam Clerk. We have a motion from Supervisor Cortese. We have a second from Supervisor Chavez. We have a light on from Supervisor Ellenberg. Ms. Ellenberg. Thank you. Um, I want to take this opportunity to make a comment again about sponsorships in general. Um, I, I, I will support this. I do think Apolli is a great organization, but I my office has started in the absence of a countywide policy to create our own. We need some measure of when to, when to approve, when not to approve, and I don't want, I don't enjoy being put in the position of evaluating my colleagues' well-intended referrals without any clear common guidelines. What we have at the moment is, does it support a public and non-political purpose? Is it timely? Will it go to a 501c3 or government entity? Um, this particular um, referral hits two and a half. It's not, it's not quite timely. Um, the earliest it, that this could be re reported back to the board is August 27th. 
which is just two days uh, before the event. I held the administration's proposed policy that was agendized today because it didn't actually include any suggested parameters for us to consider. When it does come back, um, I really look forward to a conversation with all of you about what, if any, we consider to be good guideposts for, for making these decisions. I will vote yes today. I will re-emphasize my strong desire that we come together and do this in a more organized and less slipshod fashion. All right then, so we'll ask all five members to please vote on the pending motion. Motion by Cortese, second by Chavez. All five members have voted. We'll ask the clerk to please display the results. We'll announce that the results are 5-0, favorable motion, the motion carries. Thank you, that takes us to item number 16. Supervisor Cortese, I believe this is also your referral, sir. Yes, this is um, an, another sponsorship that was requested by um, that the county sponsors services, immigrant rights, and education networks 32nd anniversary celebration event for $2,000. I don't know if that was tendered to any of the other offices. It was tendered to my office along with a follow up uh, a phone call asking if we would um, ask the county to, to provide a $2,000 sponsorship. So, per uh, first of all, just, uh, let me just stop there and say um, I couldn't agree with you more, um, Supervisor Ellenberg, in terms of getting this sponsorship policy right. I was here before there wasn't one, basically, other than to say that the offices could do what they wanted in terms of their own budgets. Now we bring sponsorships all here regardless of the funding source, but um, I'm uh, wide open-minded to um, changes uh, in terms of how we handle these things. Um, but under the current policy, I know that we had to bring it here um, and ask for approval to get an answer for these folks, and um, I would appreciate support of the item, um, I, I, I do think given the circumstances that we're in in today's world here in Santa Clara County regarding the work the Siren's been doing, um, it makes sense to continue supporting them. Thank you. All right, Supervisor Ellenberg. This one actually clearly meets um, my three-part test, um, so I will be, be voting yes. And I just want to correct a word. I said slipshod, which was not respectful, and I didn't mean to do that. I meant scattershot, which may or may not be better. <laughs> but <laughs> not, not that we're okay, not that we're sloppy, but just that it's a little bit too random for my comfort. Ad hoc, <laughs> situational, <the> <laughs> whatever works, or whatever works. Right, but not slipshod. All right. All right. Uh, in order to move us along, let me ask the clerk to please uh, display the voting panel on the screen. That will allow Supervisor Cortese to lean forward and make his motion, which he has done. That will allow Supervisor Chavez to second, which he has done. That will allow all five of us to vote on our screens. And that has now happened. And before we display the results, I'll go to Supervisor Cortese. I, I just want to clarify something that I think has become obvious up here on, on the, the way we do the sponsorships now, that it's expected that the county executive would administer any uh, uh, sponsorship package items, be it tickets or anything else. Um, it's certainly not something my office is seeking to do under these items that, um, that, that would essentially be delegated by the board back to the county executive if this passes. Thank Got you. it. Thank you very much. All right. Now we'll ask the clerk to please display the results. Motion carries 5-0. Once again, that's item 16 and the motion is carried 5-0. Takes us to item number 17. Uh, this is a board referral again, and Supervisor Cortese, I turn to you again, sir. Yeah, th thank you. This is uh, uh, a referral to County Council to come back to us uh, August 27th with a proposed ordinance regarding the safe storage of firearms in an, unincorpor an unincorporated Santa Clara County. It, uh, there's some background that's listed here in the referral. Let me just say again, in terms of process and vetting, uh, I, this goes back a while. So I don't want to, anyone to feel that it's coming out of uh, current events or being rushed up here for any reason. Um, it isn't. Uh, when we had the firearms summit um, over a year ago, um, we, uh, after Parkland, um, one of the recommendations that was actually made very publicly then and uh, at, the, at the summit itself uh, to over 300 people was from the district attorney uh, Jeff Rosen, who indicated that he felt very, very strongly that uh, we were remiss in not having a safe storage uh, of firearms ordinance here in this county. Um, and that was certainly kicked around by people at the summit. Um, I'm not sure it received uh, 
high prioritization there. Uh, I'll be the first to acknowledge that. There are surveys that uh, that would be available, you know, to the board um, between now and the 27th, if you want to see those that came out of the summit and indicating what people did think was important. But since that time, um, although we've kicked around some language, uh, we being my office and the district attorney's office, and looked at some examples of what's been done primarily in cities in the Bay Area, um, subsequent to that, uh, I went back to County Council and asked them if they could work with that raw material to come back with an ordinance for the board's consideration by the date prescribed here. And so I wanted to get the boards, um, before they do the rest of that work, uh, beyond pre-analysis, I wanted to get the board's um, approval uh, to get the referral out to indicate to County Council and the administration that we really do want to see this kind of an ordinance come back um, uh, on the 27th, if at all possible. Uh, so that's that's it, uh, President Sminian. Thank you. Well, I ask the clerk to please, uh, I do have some comments and questions, and I see that the other, other lights are on, but let's ask the clerk to put the voting panel up. She's done so, so if you'd like to make that motion on the screen, Supervisor Cortese, we now have the opportunity for that, and I see a second from Supervisor Ellenberg. Let me check with the clerk to see if we have any members of the public who would like to speak to this issue. All right, then I'm going to start with uh, member in the absence of any, just for the record. I'm going to go to Supervisor Ellenberg for comments or questions, and uh, then other members of the board, and then myself. Uh, thank you, and thank you again, Super uh, Supervisor Cortesi. I'm as as clear by my second. I'm in support of this referral, particularly as it helps to keep children safe. Uh, data from the Giffords Law Center indicates that 89% of accidental shooting deaths of children occurred in homes with unsecured weapons, and more than 75% of the guns used in youth suicides were stored in their homes. Um, I'd like to make, if you're amenable, uh, Supervisor Cortesi, two additions um, to your request, as my, my only concern with the referral as it stands is its potential lack of, of enforceability. So I, I would first like that the administration include in their report back options for perhaps providing either a rebate, a, a rebate for the purchase of a gun safe or a trigger lock giveaway. This is kind of in line with um, the sheriff's free car seat giveaway and the um, uh, security, home security camera rebate um, that I proposed earlier this year and I'm waiting for a report back on, as an aside. Um, and second, I'd like administration to also report back on an outreach strategy should the board adopt an ordinance. Uh, that would educate the community on safe gun storage practices and encourage people to report when they witness unsafe practices. I, my hope is that both of those additions would encourage greater compliance with the ordinance. Great. So I'm happy to um, include as part of the motion, uh, particularly for the county council, to um, uh, make sure we have as plenty of information on the enforceability of the ordinance once it's sunshine and distributed, um, and then for the administration uh, the county executive's office, um, a response to incentives like rebates, trigger lock giveaways, and, and an outreach strategy to get information out. So that would all be part of the motion. As the county council looks like he's leaning in. Mr. Williams. I, I just wanted to make one comment on the rebate program, which would probably not be something in the ordinance itself, but would be a separate program the county would offer, and I think may not be able to necessarily be responsive on the same timeline. And so I just wanted clarity on that. I think we can meet the August 27th timeline regarding the ordinance, but I don't know what work administration might need in terms of fleshing out anything regarding a possible rebate program. So I just yeah. wanted to clarify that those, they're obviously related, but slightly separate bodies of work. Yeah, through the chair, and, and I would in encourage us to have the ordinance in whatever you think is a final form, sunshine for the 27th. So that we can is it difficult for the board to comment or offer specific edits to the ordinance itself anyway without having it actually circulated. I know you, this would allow you to, to do that. Um, and then um, hopefully Supervisor Ellenberg and the rest of us would be satisfied with at least um, a work plan from the executive's office indicating how they might tackle these other issues that she brought up and that you just uh, referred to. Thank you. I've got couple of questions, if I may, and either for Supervisor Cortese or for County Council. Uh, the first is, um, am I correct in understanding that 
this would apply only to the unincorporated areas of our county. That is correct. Okay, and uh, that, no, I, I just, I, I thought before we had, a, uh, that was my understanding, that was my expectation, but I think it's important to be on the record about that so that folks who um, don't have that understanding uh, now do and won't, won't be um, visiting us with a concern about that in the 15 incorporated communities where 95% of the population lives. Um, the second uh, question is, since this would be an ordinance, presumably a violation of the ordinance would be a misdemeanor, yes? Correct. Uh, okay, good. And then um, I appreciated the reference to, um, that uh, Supervisor Cortese made to uh, looking to what other local jurisdictions have done. Supervisor Cortese and I share uh, Sunnyvale as an example. That's a place where I think some good work has been done that might be uh, instructive. I also think that um, if we can conform our own work to that in other Santa Clara County jurisdictions, if they've got good work to conform to. I don't want to conform to something just because we're conforming, but if there's good work product out there that we can adapt uh, or adopt as our own, then I think it makes it easier in terms of communicating with the public. Here's what the expectations are. Um, I, it's always been my view that um, if you want people to do something, you need to make it easy for them to do it. So the easiest way would be to say, can we get together? Just as we did on the $15 minimum wage, uh, even though that wasn't always <laughs> quite in sync. But uh, I, I, I'm encouraged that we're gonna look at, uh, at other jurisdictions uh, and their experience. Um, it's not dispositive to my vote. I'm an I vote on this regardless, but um, if Supervisor Cortese was amenable to waiting until September 10th, that would be uh, my first choice. Again, I'm an I vote regardless, but uh, even understanding that that would be a first reading of an ordinance, which presumably would require a second reading. It will require two readings. Yeah. I, I think bluntly what I'd like to do is take away the argument that somebody might offer that they didn't have enough time uh, to look at this carefully because even though we're sitting here talking about it, if it doesn't get agendized until the Wednesday before our Tuesday the 27th meeting and there are only three business days, we're gonna hear from folks who say, you know, this came out of nowhere, which would be inaccurate uh, to yep. your point, Supervisor Cortese, about the fact that this conversation has been going on for a while based on your work with the gun summit. I just think it's a little bit of an insurance policy and would be wise, it would also allow for some outreach between now and then so people would be clear about the fact that they knew it was coming and if they wanted to weigh in, they did. So. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with that. So I'm agreeable to September 10th. I, I would ask the county council if we can sunshine the ordinance um, by the 27th or thereabouts. Maybe you can answer. It sounded like you were going along with that anyway for the purposes of the meeting, it would have actually been sunshine prior to the 27th um, right. and delivered or, or acted upon the meeting the 27th. But I just like to get it sunshine as early as possible, consistent with President Sabinian's comments that the longer we have it out there, the longer people can look at it. And that includes us, includes my colleagues. Um, in addition, looking at the the other cities, you know, as we all know, as uh, the cities that have adopted uh, ordinances, not only enlightens us as to what you can do, but in those debates, there have been um, concerns raised about gotcha provisions in, in those ordinances. You know, what happens if I'm uh, step, I'm going outside to load my pickup truck and, uh, you know, enforcement shows up right at that moment. And, and I, I have previously said this to county council, I'll say it publicly, if there were ever an office that could navigate um, those kinds of nuanced concerns and bring us back something that um, makes law-abiding firearms owners feel comfortable that this is not the kind of a thing that's uh, out to get them. It's what we talked about. It's out to prevent suicides and protect minors and so forth um, without, without uh, being unduly burdensome to people that are uh, in a law-abiding fashion coming in and out of their storage facility with a, with a firearm from their own homes and those types of things. So I do think um, the city, I just want to uh, reaffirm what you're saying, President Zemini, is that, and maybe what I noted earlier, is that those city ordinances have been adopted in form in both directions, um, uh, 
none of them were exactly perfect from my perspective, but um, you all get to be the judge of that when, <laughs> when uh, the James Williams version comes back, so. Uh, thank you, thank and you. Um, just to be clear, uh, while the term safe storage is used in the recommended action, um, I, I note that the enclosure also references uh, or disabled with a trigger lock, I assuming that's one of the options that we're hoping county council will be exploring and addressing in a possible ordinance, yes. Yes, yes and I think it's consistent as you're aware of with state law requirements, so. Sure. Sure. Well, Which thank you very much. I, I very much appreciate uh, the accommodation on the September 10th date, and I think it will stand us in good stead as we have this conversation. With and we'll just trust that county council will get it uh, filed for that meeting on uh, with the clerk as early as possible for distribution. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll ask all, uh, all five members please vote on the screen unless there are any additional comments and there do not appear to be any. And again, we have no comments from members of the public on this, Madam Clerk, we do not. All right, all five votes having been cast, please display the result. The motion carries 5-0. Thank you very much. That takes us to item number 18. And here again, Supervisor Cortese, this is your referral. Yes, this is, um, this is a step toward us taking a public position on Senate Bill 5, um, authored by um, our own, member of our own delegation here, Senator Bell, and also uh, Senator McGuire. Uh, this doesn't ask us to take a support position, um, although I have done that in my individual capacity. Um, we understand that there are some concerns uh, through our Office of um, Intergovernmental Relations, but this uh, asks that um, uh, that work be brought back to the board um, with options for taking a position, whether that's support with amendments or support to seek amendments or, um, or something else. Um, I do want to indicate that in prior to um, filing this referral with the clerk, I, I did reach out to Senator Bell's office to specifically ask that in the interim period between now and when this is brought back, meaning soon, um, that um, he make himself available to representatives from county council and the administration to sit down with him um, eye to eye and, and try to work out uh, any concerns that the county has before this comes back so the board isn't uh, caught you know, without that information, trying to make a decision. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor, I'm just gonna confirm with the clerk, we have no cards on this issue. Public isn't rushing to tell us their view on ERAF funding. Okay, let me turn instead to Supervisor Ellenberg. So while the redevelopment agency was great for many cities and buildings, it was not quite a disaster, but a, a, a detriment to school districts. Mm -hmm. So. I would want to make sure that any analysis that comes back um, specifically addresses any potential impacts on, on school districts or public education in general. Thanks, Supervisor. Uh, <coughs> we will uh, need to address the proposal for funding from ERAF because it would significantly impact school districts and the county. Um, so that's one of the issues we'll talk with uh, the okay. uh, representative, Representative Bill, Senator Bell, on uh, trying to find another source of funding. Okay, that, that would absolutely be a concern for me. Thank you, and I'm looking to Mr. Williams, who was leaning in. I was just gonna report that we did have a, a positive initial conversation I did this morning with uh, the Senator's staff um, and the bill has been significantly amended over the last couple months. There's some additional amendments I was informed this morning that will be going across soon. Um, and uh, the, I'm cautiously optimistic, I think those will address a, a lot of the concerns that I think were raised by um, our uh, housing folks, but also there's been amendments over time that have clarified the impact on um, excess ERAF as well as schools uh, and, and clarify that this money is all gonna essentially come from the state general fund. So we'll bring, we can bring more detailed information on that when this returns next week. I would only say that I, if I may through the chair, that I received a, an email late uh, prior to this meeting, relatively late, um, indicating uh, um, from a senior member of, of the senator's staff, a similar, a similar additional analysis, but I, 
I think that that all needs to be verified uh, by all of you before we cast any votes on it. Yeah, and we, we can definitely provide that when this comes back to the board and I need an opportunity to connect with uh, folks in administration on that conversation from this morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Supervisor Wasserman. Thank you. I just want to go on the record sharing the same concerns. I've asked my staff to reach out to Supervisor Bell's office as well. Um, I was concerned about loss of funding to the schools and then, of course, the excess funding to the county. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be a me too on that uh, set of concerns. I did want to particularly underscore uh, Supervisor Ellenberg's request that um, as we analyze what the impact of the measure might be on the capital C county, the corporate entity that is the county of Santa Clara, I want to make sure that we are also analyzing um, the impact on the small C county, meaning the two million people who live here who receive services obviously from their cities, their special districts, and their school districts. Um, my initial research uh, in our office indicates that uh, the school, California School Boards Association is, uh, has taken an opposed and less amended position that may or may not have changed with amendments. Uh, that CTA, the California Teachers Association, had also taken an opposed. Um, don't always agree with either or both. Uh, sometimes the two of them are at odds uh, for a variety of reasons. But when both have expressed concerns, that tells me there's some concern out there in the education community about what the impact of the measure would be. The other thing I would say is, uh, you know, I was a little bit flip a minute ago about the lack of public comment on this, but I dealt with these ERAF funding issues when I was in the state legislature on both the budget committee and the education committee and the uh, chairing the uh, subcommittee on uh, education finance. They are a tangle. They're, they are really, I mean, uh, state budget uh, and funding issues are complex. Education funding finance issues are even more complex and ERAF issues uh, are just painful. Thank you, that's the right word. I mean, they're just, uh, they're really tough uh, to parse. So um, uh, if it sounds like I'm saying the same thing three times, it's because I want to say I really mean it, I really mean it, I really mean it, that I, I'm going to want to know where we are on impact on uh, public education before we get there. That being said, uh, it is a uh, referral, and I'm going to ask uh, the uh, clerk of the board to post the voting panel, and uh, I'll stay open-minded, but I'm going to be an abstention today just for the record. So motion by Supervisor Cortez, say thank you, and then second by Supervisor Chavez. We're going to ask all five members to please vote on the screen. Thank you, and Mr. President, just for clarification, this is simply for, that's through the chair, if I may, Supervisor Cortez, this is simply to receive information and further details back a vote it, yes at this time is to do information purposes not supporting the bill. Yeah, no, take, we're not taking a position today. We're simply asking for um, Thank you. some intense bill analysis and quick turnaround. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Okay. All votes have been cast. Please display the results. Motion carries 4-0, one abstention. Submitting is the abstention. Thank you very much. So that takes care of item. Thank you, Supervisor Cortese. Uh, and thank you, uh, Dr. Smith and Mr. Williams, for the willingness of your two offices to provide the uh, information requested. That brings us to item number 19. We do have uh, one card on this one. I asked Mr. Wesley if he'd like to come up and uh, speak to this item at this time. Is he still in the room? All right. Doesn't appear to be, but we'll ask again uh, following the presentation. Uh, colleagues, uh, as you can see from the enclosure, this is a uh, resolution from Supervisor Ellenberg uh, and myself simply uh, supporting passage of a federal comprehensive assault weapons ban as a discussion we had just a few minutes ago on Supervisor uh, Cortese's referral reminds us uh, at one level these gun violence issues are, are broad and complex. Uh, on another level I, I do think it's incumbent on us to simply ask ourselves from time to time is there something that uh, clearly makes sense and that can and should be done. And in this instance, uh, I thought the answer was yes, and I appreciate the fact that Supervisor Ellenberg uh, agreed and was willing to lend her support to this as well. Um, with respect to a uh, comprehensive uh, ban on assault-style weapons, uh, the, you know, this is something that came to the fore 
quite clearly, quite directly in the recent tragedy in Gilroy because we asked ourselves how could somebody access a weapon like this notwithstanding the rigorous gun laws we have in California and the answer was it could be legally purchased in an adjacent state and the adjacent state is not the exception to the rule. Uh, you know, if it were that might be a matter of somewhat less concern I guess but uh, you know if you go to Oregon, you go to Nevada, you go to Arizona, uh, the states that bound us, uh, these are legal weapons and can be easily acquired. Uh, in fact, there are 40 something uh, states where that's the case. So it seemed clear to me, and the reason for the proposal is that if we want to be safer uh, by reducing the number of these weapons uh, in uh, everyday ownership, uh, that uh, we were gonna need to see some action at the federal level. Uh, next question I ask myself is, is this something that can be done? Uh, and the answer is clearly yes, because it has been done. You know, we had the ban at the federal level for a number of years before it expired and uh, the political climate did not accommodate a change when it expired. So we know it can be done. Uh, I also believe that we know that it had a beneficial impact. The research uh, from uh, the years of the ban and the subsequent years uh, suggests that it can. And finally, is this something for which there's popular support? And just within the last week or so, uh, since the proposal actually, uh, we saw that there was yet another uh, poll showing uh, that there's strong support for such a measure on a national level. In fact, a majority of both political parties support a national ban in this regard. So um, if it's painfully relevant to our own current circumstances, if it's something we know that can be done, would have a beneficial impact and has popular support, uh, then I think we should adopt the resolution supporting passage of a federal comprehensive assault weapons ban. I also think it's clear, having watched the national scene, uh, that it's too easy for these issues to get lost in the larger debate, which is why I chose to focus on this specific thing. I also think it's clear from watching the national debate that Congress isn't gonna act unless they are pushed to act. So we need to push with whatever impact one voice can have, but as you'll see from the recommended action, the, the resolution also directs the administration to communicate the passage of this resolution to other local jurisdictions in Santa Clara County and urge them to formally adopt a similar position as well as to communicate. My hope is that one by one by one, jurisdictions across the country will take a similar view and that eventually the message will be heard. Um, so I'm gonna ask the clerk to please uh, the voting panel up on our screens. I'm gonna lean forward and make the motion and then turn to Supervisor Ellenberg, who again uh, was kind enough to be my joint author on the memo. Supervisor Ellenberg, anything you wish to add at this time? I think you were very thorough. I appreciate being included in the, in the memo, um, in the referral. This doesn't absolve us from doing more work and continuing to work locally, but I think that it's um, it's a statement that we should be making powerfully and loudly. Thank you. So we have a motion by Samidia and a second by Ellenberg. Supervisor Cortese, your light is on, sir. Yes, I'm, I'm gonna be supportive and I just wanna say something that probably won't matter much because uh, people generally don't pay attention to comments that are made like this in, in the external community. But um, even in some of my own staff notes on the item, there's a lot of confusion as to what um, an assault weapon is, and if we were trying to define that here, that would be even more challenging for county council than a storage ordinance. Uh, I know the reports uh, on the tragedies that we commemorated uh, this morning uh, talked about assault style weapons, assault type weapons, uh, some just said assault weapon, um, and as I said, even in some of my notes, uh, I have staff members referring to the capacity or the ability of a, an assault weapon to uh, spray bullets as an automatic weapon would, uh, as opposed to a semi-automatic weapon. Semi -automatic, weapon. automatic weapons are, are already fully banned um, uh, and have, have been since the uh, Pinkerton days. But that said, um, I, I'm fully supportive and um, aspirational, I guess, that at the federal level, they can figure that stuff out and, and make sure to do something useful um, under the circumstances that um, uh, that we're, we're all suffering with right now. So, and that is why I'm supporting the item. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor.
Supervisor Wasserman, your light is on as well, sir. Yeah. Any other members? Let me just confirm once more that Mr. Wesley, who is the only person who's got a card in, is not here to speak. All right, he may have had to leave. Then we'll ask all five members uh, to please uh, lean in and vote on the screen. And all votes now having been cast, we'll ask the clerk to please display the results so that we can announce that the measure passes 5-0. Thank you all very much. That takes us to item number 20. Supervisor Cortese, this next item is yours, I believe. This, this is actually just this is a cleanup item. It falls under the category of sponsorship again, but the board actually uh, previously acted on this appropriation or the sponsorship um, some time ago uh, in support of uh, Assemblymember Calra's uh, beautify our local schools event. The problem was is that the board action specified assembly member Calra as the recipient uh, of the sponsorship, and it should have been um, it should have been the Lowell Elementary School receiving the money. So this is essentially a housekeeping item to make sure that the payee on this is accurately. Um, directed to be Lowell Elementary School in the amount of $1,000. Uh, and this, by the way, did come out of the District 3 um, budget, and that would continue to be the case. Thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, if you could please display the voting panel on our screen. I will allow Supervisor Cortese to lean in and uh, make the motion on his screen. We'll see if there's a second. There is. The second is from Supervisor Chavez. Madam Clerk, do we have any members of the public who wish to speak on this item? We do not. Then we'll ask all five members to please vote on their screens. That's been done. Let's see the vote. Measure carries four to zero with one abstention, the abstention being Supervisor Simidian for the record. And that takes us then to uh, item 21, which is the County Executive's report. Yes, Mr. President. Members of the board, I have three things that I'd like to comment on today. Number one, um, we're expecting uh, very high temperatures in the next two days, and so the Office of Emergency Management has issued a heat warning, which will formally start at 11 o'clock tomorrow, <clears throat> not end until the end of the day on Thursday. We've opened uh, cooling station centers across the county. Um, you can find all of the uh, addresses on the website for the Office of Emergency Management. Uh, we have them throughout the valley. <clears throat> We've also activated the homeless, <clears throat> homeless outreach team to go into homeless encampments and offer support, cooling, and referrals to the cooling centers. And we've um, begun contact with all of the surrounding jurisdictions through the uh, OEM operating stations so that we can communicate all of their actions uh, to each other. So we're very concerned about this. Uh, we advocate that anyone who uh, has a frail elder or um, knows of someone who will have challenges dealing with the hot heat to um, con get them in contact with authorities. Every year we have a number of deaths related to the heat and uh, we would like to prevent that from happening again. <clears throat> Two other issues which were raised during uh, public comment that I'd just like to put on the record. Number one was uh, the issue related to um, the proposed or threatened jumper at City Hall. Um, I know the board is aware of this, but the public's probably not, that all 911 calls in the city of San Jose go through city dispatch. They don't go through county comm. And fire and police services that are dispatched are the city fire and, and police services. I have no reason to believe they did not perform admirably, but... Um, I'd like to make it clear it's outside of our jurisdiction. The second it has to do with the issue of individuals who used to be Verity employees not passing um, tests as part of our merit system. Just for the public's understanding, we're constrained by state um, and uh, local laws 
that require us as part of our merit system to have three types of evaluation for new applicants for membership as county employees. One is a application which states um, that they meet minimum qualifications. Two is some type of test so that they can be ranked. Three is an interview by the hiring manager um, in that rank order. Uh, the issue here is that the test for ranking um, was not passed by some of the individuals. We uh, clearly feel that's a problem. We're working uh, to try to find a solution. Um, at this point, um, probably the best solution that we can come up with is to either move those individuals into extra help positions or into a separate classification uh, that does not relate to that particular test. And we will be discussing that with the union. In order for that to happen, the union would have to agree to some changes in the contract, um, which currently require uh, placement in uh, those positions to be compliant with all of the other classifications. So um, we're hopeful that we can come to some solution. With that, I'll take questions. So I have one. So I have two questions, and then I'll go to my colleagues. I, I'm not sure I understood the, la the second part of your solution relative to the janitors that are being fired or not being hired. I apologize. I, you the said second that part, I'm sorry. You, you had two solutions. One that you, that you talked about extra help and then you, you One talked would about be extra help, but of our oh, you contract with SEIU requires that extra help individuals also pass the test. So we would have to have an exclusion of that from our contract. It's not required by the merit system, but it is required by the contract. Um, the other issue would be to create a special separate classification with a different set of tests and have them apply into that classification. However, that's a longer term solution which we'd require the board to create a new classification that was similar but distinct from the um, classification of janitor plus it would require that no union challenge that creation of that position um, because if they did challenge it, it would go through the um, appeal process to the personnel board and we'd be there for the next year and a half. And so and those, those are, the are just the best things that we can come up with at this point. We're still looking at any other options we might be able to apply. And, um, and thus far, those are the only two options that, that meet the merit system rules. And the reason I'm asking that question is you may recall that some time ago we had a test for social workers that was, um, frankly, it, it appeared to have some significant bias in it. And what the department did was remove the test and use a new test that was frankly had less bias in it and we saw more, not only more people passing it, but more people, back to the point that Supervisor Smidian raised earlier today, more people who had been interning with us and who had come out of San Jose State in particular. So is that a possibility of a new test that's more amenable to the, oh, sorry. The problem with that is timeline because in order to create a new test um, takes some time because it has to be um, approved through the meet and confer process and everyone who took the old test would have to take the new test which means that no one would be able to be hired before the 90 day requirement is met. So that would mean not only the 18 that didn't pass the test but nobody could be hired. So that's that's a problem. We can do that in the as a follow up but from a timing perspective, that would be difficult to get done within 90 days. Impossible to get done within 90 days. Goodbye. Forgive me, I just wanna make sure that our county council is monitoring us for Brown Act compliance as we 
wander into a more uh, extensive conversation about a non-agendized item. I understand, of course, that the county executive's report is on the agenda, uh, but um, both with respect to um, our collective bargaining process and also Brown Act issues, I just think there may be some limits to how far we can go today. Uh, so I just, just asking for a little mindfulness about that as we go forward. Thank you. So I, I have um, an additional question on another topic, but I, I want to defer if any of my colleagues have had thoughts on this particular topic. Supervisor Wasserman. Thank you, and I'm sure our Hobson award-winning legal team will, will be on top of things <laughs> Hobson or Hobson? whenever needed, exactly. It is Hodson with a D, by the way, just to be clear. Hodson with a D, thank you. No pressure. Got it. Um, <laughs> I am thankful to the county exec for trying to find a solution of immediacy uh, dealing with the janitorial situation and the test. And I'm hopeful going forward that we can perhaps look at tests that are more relevant to the jobs that they're testing for. And um, I know that's a timely process, time-taking process that needs to be the meet and confer and the whole union negotiation stuff. But I, I truly appreciate administration trying to find a solution that can be put into place sooner than later and before individuals are lost and financial ramifications, et, et cetera, for people that we have every other right to believe are well qualified to do, do the job. I thank you for that. I also hope, uh, through the chair, if I may, I also hope, um, Dr. Smith, that word of what you're doing can get out there. It is so frustrating when people come up and speak and we're not able to respond or choose not to respond um, when we know something's happening positively in the other direction. And so the what you're working on, if whatever you feel is appropriate, being put out to whomever you feel is appropriate, I encourage you to do so. Thank you. I see lights on from Supervisor Cortese. Yeah, I just, I just want to encourage um, creativity on this, I guess. Uh, I, I don't know if it's a paraphrase of the maxims of equity or not, but um, some of us had to study those. And uh, for every wrong, there must be a remedy. And it just I think there's just some sense that we have a wrong that needs to be remedied, um, even if it's not a legal wrong. It just uh, feels wrong. So um, I just want to add my encouragement. Thank you. And anybody else on this item? We do have three cards from members of the public. Uh, and so I'm going to go to Supervisor Allenberg and then Supervisor Chavez. Thanks. I, I was back and forth because a lot of my colleagues have, have already expressed this. But I want to emphasize, too, um, that this, is, this really is critical now. If we're moving people to extra help, is my understanding correct that they will not get benefits? The more extra help is an hourly pay? Is that, am I correct? Depends on how many hours they work. Okay. So um, I'm, we, I'm hoping we'll that have to work that out. There are solutions that can, can help make them whole um, for sure sooner rather than later. And um, I appreciate your um, willingness to look at this test going forward um, because if significant numbers are not passing it, that really merits a close look on our part. Thank you. Uh, on another subject matter, um, we have been working, I know your staff's been working really hard to get RFPs and RFQs out for all the work we're doing around immigration. And um, we have had um, some concerns from, the, the, from our current vendors about our timeline. And we have a few that would like to speak. And I wondered if, if it would be all right if we had them speak and then if we could get an update from staff in that order. Right. Um, we have Hillary Armstrong from my office ready to respond in detail. Great. But go ahead and do Thank whatever. Thank you. We'll have um, Richard Conda, Robert Yaves, and Monica Lemus, if you'd like to come forward and speak. And that way, it'll be easier for you to respond to their concerns. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Richard Conda, Executive Director of Asian Law Alliance. And we're a member of the Citizenship Collaborative which has received support from the county for many years. 
and we're just a little concerned about kind of the timing of all this. It, it's usually a nine month process to put together everything that's needed to plan Citizenship Day. And so that we understand now that the idea is that the, our current contracts, which are gonna expire end of September, will be extended through the end of December. And then there'll be a new RFP. And so it just concerns us that, you know, when we're in the process of planning the event, and then with the uncertainty of not knowing whether we're going to be funded or not going forward, it makes it difficult for us to really plan in the way we need to plan, just because there's just so many moving parts to putting together a successful event. I mean, we have a lot of volunteers we need to coordinate. We need to work with different um, subcontractors who have specific language issues. There's other issues that have come up since uh, recently, as all of you know, of the, the whole issue of the um, public charge by the Trump administration has now been issued. That's putting things in a little bit of uncertainty. There's also the issue of the Trump administration's plan to do away with the means-tested fee waiver, which is really important to our clients. So because of all these different factors, we're hoping that actually the contracts could be extended through the end of June. That would allow us to complete this cycle for the important work that we do with citizenship. So that's what we're asking. And I know that we've met with most of you and, and expressed those concerns previously. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, so public comment on the reports is actually supposed to be done during item number seven, public comment, because this isn't actually really a venue to bring up a whole different kind of category. Thank you for the reminder. The county council's reminder is appropriate and correct. That being said, since it was my um, oversight in that I've called these folks up, what I'm gonna do is ask if, uh, without objection from the board, we can hear from just these two other folks. We can't actually anticipate that during public comment because you don't know that folks are gonna submit their cards for an item that is 14 items later if they haven't already turned them in. So the county council's uh, reminding us that it does say on the agenda for anyone yes. who reads all that fine print that, that that's the time for comments, not now. That being said, since we've started down this path, um, I think we ought to just, uh, as a matter of courtesy, take the next two unless there's any objection Who's or unless the county council tells me that it's illegal and we're all gonna go to jail. <laughs> I think it, it's, it's fine to hear the public comment, but I, I would caution the board. I think this item has become quite expansive at this point. I agree. I'm President Smitty, and I just wanted to say uh, for the record, maybe, maybe for all of us, is that um, I think making an exception to our own policy is totally within our uh, authority. On the other hand, I just do want to make sure for the listeners and others that um, there's, this does not uh, signal or, or cause any kind of a waiver of our, our ordinary policy not to have public comment on this particular item going forward. Thank I you. agree on all points, and meanwhile, could our next speaker come on up and just uh, share briefly what you uh, wanted to share with us? Hi there. So thank you for the opportunity to comment. While most contracts will be will not be adversely affected by the extensions that have been proposed, um, we feel that the programs for immigrant integration, the PI-2 contract, will be, since executing the event is part of the contract and is a deliverable. The 2019 Citizenship Day event took place in April at San Jose City College, and it took nine months to develop and execute. Over 1,700 individuals registered for the event. Approximately 1,200 individuals participated in the Citizenship Day um, orientations. 372 individuals were screened for eligibility, and for those who were deemed eligible, they received application assistance. At the end of the day, we completed 259 citizenship applications, as well as 147 fee waivers. That translates into a cost savings by the community of approximately $140,000 for services rendered for free. Since the release of the RFP is being delayed, the event timeline may need to be changed for a fall implementation. The selected grantees would then need to take into consideration the cold and possibly rainy weather, which would decrease the number of participants, also parents would be dealing with back to school expenses and maybe saving up money for holiday expenses. During this time of year, people are focused on other priorities and may not have the funds to apply for citizenship. 
Also, due to the administration's anti-immigrant rhetoric and policies, our community is going back into the shadows. Last year, we implemented six citizenship workshops throughout San Jose and San Mateo, where we typically expect 150 people to 200 people. And because of the recent announcements of public charge, the numbers that showed up was dismal. South County event, we only saw 20 people. And that was with the donation of $5,000 from the Office of Immigrant Affairs for media outreach. So you can see how the anti-immigrant rhetoric is really affecting our community. So we ask for the extension. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. My name is Robert Yades. I'm the program director of Catholic Charities uh, Santa Clara County Immigration Legal Services Program. Uh, yesterday, the Department of Homeland Security announced the final rule on public charge. It is scheduled, scheduled for formal publication in the Federal Register tomorrow, August 14th. The rule will harm vulnerable immigrant communities and families. It will threaten family unity and stability. Most of all, it will discourage many eligible low-income legal permanent residents to apply for citizenship. Our county citizenship collaborative has been helping legal permanent residents since 1997 and has helped over 50,000 people become US citizens. The success of the collaborative is careful planning and enough time to plan our citizenship events. Our citizenship day events have always been in April and takes about eight to nine months to plan. With the new RFP that may get implemented with possibly new collaborative members, there will be only be four months to plan. This is not enough, considering the amount of time it takes to plan a successful event. It is critical to do the 2020 citizenship event right. It is an election year and we wanted all eligible legal permanent resident be able to apply and become U.S. citizens in November 2020. We ask that current contracts of citizenship collaborative be extended until the end of the fiscal year, which is June 30th, 2020. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. So what we had asked was for information from a staff person. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Hillary Armstrong with the Office of the County Executive, and I'm here to provide a brief update on this RFP process that is currently at issue. So just to take a step back and provide context, this is regarding um, a line of service with the Office of Immigrant Relations. Ms. Armstrong, I apologize. Oh, yeah. County Council, we okay? I know we've got a request from supervisors, but I just, I, I want to take your admonition to heart. I mean, this, this feels like a report on an item that's not on the agenda, just to be, to be honest. And my recommendation would be that administration provide this information off agenda to the board, so the board has it in a timely manner, and then this can be taken up as a discussion item at the next meeting. We're happy to provide that. I, mean, I, I think part of the reason the information has been requested is because there's a concern about making sure we get answers to these questions in a timely fashion. Uh, today is Tuesday because it's board day. Uh, and uh, So could we get a commitment that this information will be forthcoming uh, in written form as a, an off agenda report within the next 48 hours and would that be acceptable to members of the board? Supervisor Chavez, I know Yeah, I, I would say thank you for the solution. I think that's really helpful. And so let's do that. I also would be really interested in better understanding for the board the scope of what should and shouldn't be in um, the report of the chief executive officer. And the reason I ask that question is I sit on a number of boards and there's a lot of inconsistency about how the what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And so I would be really interested in just getting your thoughts. That also can be off agenda, but something that would sure. be helpful to understand. I, and not just for us, I think the public and Dr. Smith. Great. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Thank Smith. you. That was ably done, ma'am. Thank Thanks. you very much. All right. Uh, and uh, we'll thank the administration and Ms. Armstrong for the willingness and ability to get a uh, report by close of business on Thursday. Okay, thank you very much. Then uh, that, I believe, completes the report from the county executive. 
and we'll go to the report from the County Council's office. Well, the, the folks who just spoke might want to wait just for a couple seconds because one part of my report is to just share with the public that this morning the county did file a lawsuit against the public charge rule uh, challenging the Trump administration's rule that was uh, issued yesterday. Uh, we joined with San Francisco in that filing, which is now uh, public. Uh, other than that, there were no reportable actions taken at the August uh, 12th, 2019 closed session meeting. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much. All right. Comments or questions from the board? I'm going to quickly say none and then go to item 23, which is the long-term county housing production plan. And that was placed on consent at the request of Ms. Ellenberg and with the agreement of the board. Item 24 was also a bid rigging prevention report, uh, was also added to uh, the consent calendar uh, with uh, my comments and a request for a report back in six months, which the administration was uh, good enough to agree to. That takes us to item number 25, which is the sexual assault victim services report. We do have two cards on this. Uh, colleagues, I think what it might make sense to do is take the staff report and then uh, hear from the two members of the public who are here to speak to us, and then go to the board. Thank Good you. afternoon, uh, President Samidian, Vice President Chavez, members of the Board of Supervisors, uh, David Campos, Deputy County Executive. Uh, we're gonna just do a very brief presentation by Carla Collins, who on an interim basis is overseeing our effort to prevent uh, gender-based violence. Uh, there is a legislative file that has a very brief report of our recommendation and the next steps uh, that we recommend the board take with respect to this very critical issue. So turn it over to Carla. Thank you. Um, in the eight weeks since this referral was made, we've been working hard to both provide answers to the questions and prepare a strategic plan that we will be bringing to you on September 4th. Um, to get to this point has required effect an effective team, and for this um, file, it started with our incredible staff over at BMC, including um, Paul Lorenz and Kim Walker, who even on her vacation took time to remind us that words matter and ensure that um, we could stand behind every word of this file. Um, this was a call for information on funding for rape crisis centers, as well as immediate funding to our only two certified rape crisis um, centers in our county. I want to thank also Miriam Singer and her procurement team who have been guiding us and will continue to work with us as we move forward. Um, that also includes in our county exec, um, Gladys and um, Tommy Wim Wynn who are helping us. Um, and of course, um, the rape crisis center providers themselves under the leadership of Erin O'Brien and Tannis Crosby. Uh, as well as their, um, their leadership team, Erica Elliott, Perla Flores, and Adriana Caldera. Um, their commitment to work together on this and answer questions and clarify information needed got us to the point where we are now and have helped shed a light on a path forward that is survivor-centered and collaborative. Uh, regarding the funding, in, in a nutshell, the state mandates who can do services, what those services are, um, in terms of rape crisis center um, services, but it does not come close to adequately funding any of these services. So for our next steps, staff has recommended and is committed to meet the needs of sexual assault victims in a comprehensive, legal, trauma-informed, and victim-centered way. And while it is a state mandate that, um, that should be state-funded, we know that access to rape crisis center advocates is not just important, um, not just a legal right of the victim, um, but it's a best practice and it's a commitment on our part to meet our residents' needs in what is often the worst times of their lives. To address this immediate gap, it is our intention to bring, con um, to, bring to you contracts for approval at the September 10th meeting. This will be one-time funding, not to exceed 600,000, to allow both agencies' times to ramp up their infrastructure as they prepare for the expansion of services. Um, we will also be asking for delegation of authority as we prepare to negotiate ongoing funding for rape crisis center services. Um, we continue to meet with stakeholders in the effort to address sexual assault, and by the September 24th meeting, we will bring forward a vetted implementation plan for your consideration. It will include more details um, on funding by the county to address gender-based violence. All of this will ensure transparent and competitive processes and some of this funding will be negotiated um, to provide direct service, but for 
pro um, for programs and services that are not providing direct service, um, we will have a competitive um, procurement process for that as well. We are currently working with SSA and their contract service team to ensure that this also happens in a timely matter. So this is where we are right now, and if you have any questions. Thank you. Colleagues, would you like to go to questions first or take uh, the testimony from two members of the public oh, first? Oh, testimony first. All right, then let me ask Tannis Crosby and uh, Erica Elliott to please come forward. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Tannis Crosby, CEO, YWCA Silicon Valley. First of all, I want to thank Carla Collins, who has worked incredibly diligently and effectively in a short amount of time. Um, we are grateful that this is getting traction and moving forward. We want to be focused on a date and time certain for those contracts. We're delighted that the plan is moving forward on September 24th. We look forward eagerly to identifying what that plan is. What 600,000 in one-time funding is wonderful. Is it for four months, six months, nine months, 12 months? When will the Palo Alto site open? We want to make certain that we are delivering on these services for victims in ways in which have integrity and quality. We do not want to fall down on our commitment. We want to deliver for you. We want to deliver for our citizens, our community members, our residents, our survivors. Right now, we still don't have the state funding to deliver on services for parents of the 120 pediatric SART victims that we served last year, or the countless number of youth, which is the fastest growing uh, crisis line callers. So we want to remain focused, focused on delivering with a date and time certain. We look forward to verifying that September 24th so we can ramp up with clear and specific deliverables. So I want to thank you, and we want to remain focused and clear, and we want to be successful in partnership with you. So thank you. Let's keep moving forward. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, um, Board of Supervisors and Carla, um, for all of your support in funding sexual assault services here in Santa Clara County. I wanted to provide some clarity and context around the two rape crisis centers in Santa Clara County. Um, so there are two, both um, Community Solutions and the YWCA of Silicon Valley. Um, and we're very dictated by service areas that are um, given to us by the California Office of Emergency Services Branch for the state um, based on zip codes. So I just wanted to clarify that because I know sometimes uh, for domestic violence and human trafficking, we serve the county as a whole, but specific for sexual assault are dictated by um, the state on what areas we serve. So Community Solutions serves specifically Morgan Hill, San Martin, outside in areas, and Gilroy. And uh, the YWCA serves San Jose, all the way in Northern County, the rest of the county for the most part. And this just matters because with the start expansion, what will um, it's gonna be a huge benefit for the survivors in Gilroy, San Martin, and Morgan Hill, because we'll see a drastic reduction in travel time, close to two and a half hours, two hours, uh, once the satellite start opens up again in Gilroy. Um, but for the YWCA, their responses will differ greatly because now they have to only not only respond to VMC, but also to uh, Stanford sites and the expanded start in North County. Um, and so it's important that as the SART expansion expands, that there's expanded funding for um, enough advocates to respond to those sites. Thank you so much, and thank you for all your time. And thank, thank you for you. sticking through a long day. Thank you. All right, now I'm gonna to turn to my colleagues on the board, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, and let me thank the two speakers, and Carla, um, you and David. So a couple things that I, I may have um, confused, and so I wanna make sure I understand what's being presented. Um, at the time that we asked for you to um, come back to us with some strategies, there were a number of components to that motion, and I wanna make sure that I understand the answers to what the motion outlines. Um, first, um, we, we I think the first direction was to make sure we had sole source contracts for the two rape crisis centers by today, but we are we don't have that. We're going to have that by the 24th of September. Of oh, September 10th, okay. Carla, Excuse I'm sorry, the your mic's Ms. not Carla, on. Your mic's not on. Yeah, thank you. September 10th. Okay, great. And then, um, and the reason that we 
the reason that the number 600,000 comes from where and why is it one time? So that is meant to be, um, what it, it's um, part of what we're able to put together now as a sort of a ramp up um, contract and that's the reason that it's one time. It's for the agencies to focus on their recruitment, their training, their development, um, of their, their own implementation plan, knowing that there is going to be growth in the number of calls that they have to respond to, but it's not based on, on them meeting a certain number. It's really for them to design um, and Im start implementing they're ramping up. Got it. So my understanding is that they they actually have infrastructure and design. They don't have people to meet the need. So if for a six hundred thousand dollar one time grant, it's hard to hire people if you don't know how much money you're going to have over what period of time to be able to address the need. So the reason that I. I didn't specify in my motion that I was looking for one-time money is I saw this as an ongoing challenge. If we were going to be looking at any kind, anything that was short-term, I was thinking more along the lines of two years to three years because I feel like we need to go to the state and get them to kick down money for this service. If I may, through the chair, uh, Supervisor Chavez, there's actually two, two things that will be happening when we come back to the board on September 10th, which is what we believe is the, the earliest that we can come mm -hmm. uh, to get the, your delegation of authority. One is for the one-time 600,000 amount, and then delegation of authority for an amount of 2.2 million, which we believe will address uh, a longer term but short term need that we will have time to negotiate and you know once we get the delegation of authority to see what the window of time for that 2.2 million is and that uh, and the reason why we did the 600,000 first is that we wanted to make money available as soon as possible uh, until we then sat down and negotiated what the right scope and term of that 2.2 million should be. So, so that that's helpful. So essentially, what you're saying is that we know we only have two contractors. Right. I mean, that, and that's I know that's odd for us because we have our sole source, single source. I always in, complicate them and not remember the right one. But essentially, we have two service providers, and their services are divided up by zip code. So we do have a. Um, a framework for sharing whatever resources are available to be shared between the two agencies. I'm going to put just stop there. And then the, the source of funds, the other thing I was concerned about was not having the source of funds come out of the $5 million because presumably we've been planning for that for ever. And have those contracts, any of those RFPs and RFQs gone out? No, those won't move forward till after you review the, the implementation plan, okay. September 24th. And, and just so you know, in terms of the framing of the two contracts, if you will, the 600,000 and the 2.2, that was based on our consultation with uh, our procurement department. Uh, and I think there was an, a, an understanding that making the 600,000 available right away would address their immediate need. They were trying to figure out, do we have to go through a competitive process since we only have two? And so based on that, they, they decided that if we get delegation of authority uh, on the 10th, that that will allow us to sit down and talk about expanding the services uh, that they need. Uh, and our hope is that by the end of September, we will have something in place that lays out how the 2.2 million will be spent. Because the needed mechanism is what? I, I, I'm confused about why we wouldn't already have been able to do that based on the information we had when we heard this the first time. But is that because procurement needed the board to take an additional action to the action we took? We didn't request or we didn't receive any sort of delegation of authority to negotiate into contracts. And so right now, if, if uh, this is why we have to wait until or we have to bring the contract even for the 600,000 forward for board approval, um, but we'll be requesting delegation of authority for the 
um, 2.2 million. Otherwise, we would have to wait and um, and bring that forward too. So um, I'm going to come back to this topic in just a minute because I, I want to make sure I more broadly understand when when the when a board member like me is asking for something that can't be done, it would it would be helpful to know it sooner rather than later. And I'm not putting this on you, I'm just saying out loud, I would like to understand a better mechanism for addressing that. L let me just ask a couple of other questions. One of the reasons I've been so fixated on not dipping into that $5 million is we have been working on that $5 million pot for, it feels like three, almost four years. Like, I don't know when we had our first meeting, maybe Tanis remembers that, but we, when we thought of it, when we brought it forward, I mean, it's really taken a long time, and I know that, I'll go ahead, did you need to, want to make a comment? I just wanted to note that there was a- Your mic's not on. Through the chair. I just want to know that for intimate partner violence, there was an amount of five million, actually six million, mm -hmm. that was RFP'd and, and uh, contracts have been awarded through that process. Got it, that's really helpful. Cause yeah. I misunderstood so, that, I thought so. So, so but that, thought, well, okay. that process has already gone so forward, then, that money has been awarded, the contracts have been awarded. Okay, what we're here, talking about is the five million that was added a few months back in June as part of gender-based violence. So this, you, then your recommend, your request is that we not take, I mean, I'm sorry, your request is that we take money from that pot to provide this service? The 600,000 does not come from that pot? No, I meant the 2.2 the yes. million. Yes. And the reason for that is is what exactly? It's, it's consistent with the, the need. Um, it mirrors what um, we did with the instrument partner violence where the primary amount of the funding goes to direct services. To, um, and um, that's the primary need right now too. And then it will also allow for an expansive, um, really strategic plan to look at prevention, at training, at all these other pieces that um, really need to be a part of what we do to address gender-based violence. So then I just wanna, I wanna reiterate a, a concern I, I have just, but I, I, as you guys are thinking about this, I'd love to get your thoughts on it. I, I'm anxious to get as much, to, to not delineate prevention too much from preventing one kind of bad thing to another kind of bad thing. And so what I'm hopeful of is even though the money's gonna be coming in waves, that we're able, by the time we set out the second wave of contracts for this whole body of work, that we're able to align them so that it gives you and the agencies much more flexibility in terms of being able to address what's arising. And I think what made me nervous about this coming out of that second um, pot is that I anticipate that once we get through this next set of contracts, maybe even a year or a year and a half into them, that we're gonna learn about where, we're gonna just reinforce what we already know, which is we have victims that are victims of multiple issues and we want to be able to align those services so that we don't have nonprofits doing three or four RFPs but one to be able to provide services to. Do you want to respond to that, Carla? Uh, absolutely. That's that's the intention okay. of this and we're probably a, a few years away from that. Okay. Um, but maybe but these are being set up so that when the IPV funds um, are about to go out for a new RFP, they'll be combined. Got it, and that's, that's really, I think that that is a really important goal. So then let me go back and ask this um, question. I'm still concerned about the, the, this particular pot being diminished. However, I also recognize it's gonna take us some time to ramp up, um, but I, I just wanna be mindful that I also don't wanna create undue competition between the nonprofits where one feel where others feel like one's kind of big footing their way in and that that's a concern of mine we need all these nonprofits to work really well together i know they're really mature and thoughtful but it, we just need to be mindful of that um, so thank you and i really want to thank my colleagues for letting me uh, dive into this i i just have one last request um, 
we have a timeline where we think the, the North County office will be open, the South County office, and expanded services for Valley Medical Center. What I want to understand is how the next phase of contracting um, is timed to make sure that we meet those needs, number one. And number two, that there is a mechanism for giving the nonprofits the comfort that they can spend that 600000 to lead into this other um, resource. And I don't know if that is why you want to send the letter of intent, if that's the, the mechanism for assuring them that it's okay to spend this money, invest in people, and start moving. I, I think we, uh, we've had some initial meetings and we've expressed our commitment to that. Um, the letter of intent will certainly provide um, the documentation, I think, that will um, completely um, secure that that is the amount we're talking about, that that's needed to, to meet those goals. Um, I feel we have a very strong um, collaborative working group with the, uh, that includes the agencies and um, and that they can trust that the commitment is there, that the 600,000 is only um, so that they can begin the rap, um, ramp up in earnest for what is an ongoing commitment from the county. Thank you, and I again want to thank my colleagues for indulging me. I, I, I feel like this, you know, we're, we're slowly moving forward and I, I wanted to make sure I understood what was gonna to come to us. And I would also ask that as early as possible when the staff report becomes available that we um, circulate it as much as possible so that the other nonprofits that will definitely be impacted by the recommendation understand that. Comments or questions from other members of the board? If not, I wanna just uh, ask a question or two as well, if I may, and that, um, uh, it's been referenced in a couple of different ways, a couple of different times, the linkage between the need for these services and the facilities that are not yet open in the North County and that are uh, hoping to be uh, improved and expanded in uh, both South County and in uh, VMC, as I understand our current status. Um, we, uh, I know that you're working in tandem with our partners at the health and hospital system. Um, we were uh, shooting for the end of this year at uh, Stanford and February 1st, come hell or high water, was my understanding uh, at uh, Stanford. Uh, I just wanna uh, deliberately put you all on the spot and say is it our understanding that those dates still hold? I the February 1st date still holds. Okay, um, anything you can or should share with us if you haven't already about timeline at VMC and South County uh, for these efforts? Uh, my, my understanding is South County will be sooner and it should be this fall. Um, I think February 1st is, is more realistic for the North County um, and that's, that's our urgency as well. We understand that um, without these contracts in place and moving forward, it would be impossible for the community-based agencies to meet that need. Yeah, and I'm gonna cover some ground that Supervisor Chavez covered a minute ago just because I, I, I wanna be clear about the interest of um, other supervisors as well, uh, which I think you know, but um, now I'm gonna, rather than do the deep dive, I'm gonna do the gross oversimplification, which is uh, we know there's an immediate and pressing need for more help in this area, hence the 600,000. We know that that is not the long-term thoughtful answer, hence the need to look at a different number, determine what the real level of need is over what period of time, and then determine our funding for that, but with a timeline, yes? yes. I just want, that's a, I want to sort of underscore that one. The other thing is I, I couldn't help but notice if I read the numbers correctly in the report that the allocation at the state level for the entire state is, uh, what, five million and change. Right. Uh, we're talking about uh, close to two and a half million. We're, so we're looking at a number that even though we're about 5% of the state population here in our county, uh, we're looking at a number that would be 50% of the state's annual allocation, which tells us that somebody's got their priorities skewed somewhere. Um, and um, uh, so any estimate today, and if you said this and I missed it, I apologize, any estimate on that 
that two million and change number is expected to last us. We don't know how long yet because we don't know what the level of need will be over what period. And we that's think still it would be probably the next few years, okay. um, so that the the agencies can um, be sure to continue to yeah. ramp up. And then we'll be actually changing the the funding will be slightly different because we'll have the um, IPV funds open and and. The way we RFP it will be different. Good. The first thing I want to say, I, I want to be clear, it's a compliment, not a criticism, which is, I, th I think you've got it absolutely right, which is, let's not wait forever to figure out that we have a problem that requires right now response. So I'm glad you've got a right now response. That being said, I'm also glad that before you figure out what the forever solution is, that you said we need some time to figure out what's the right amount, how much is it going to cost, and how long will that take us, and where will it go? Having said that, the point that both the speaker and Supervisor Chavez raised, which I want to underscore is, it's hard for people to put long-term solutions in place if they don't know what their long-term funding opportunities are going to be. And that's, um, you know, so I've got a little bit of a cart before the horse, chicken and egg, cash 22. I'm sure I could come up with another cliche if you gave me a minute, but you understand we're going to have to do that in a cooperative and collaborative and iterative way, I think, to get to, to, get to yes. I, Please, Mr. May. Campos. Thank you, Mr. President, through the chair. I just want to note uh, that I know that it is challenging and frustrating that some of these things may not seem to be moving as quickly as possible. But I, I do want to step back and note, and, and uh, Supervisor Chavez has actually been you know, leading this, this effort, but if you step back and, and look at sort of where the county was around these issues a year and a half or so ago, for IPV, for intimate partner violence, at that time the county was spending about 400, 500,000. That amount was increased to 6 million, and now you're talking about an additional 5.6 million that goes to gender based violence. And so, if the state is spending 5 million for the entire state on gender based violence, you have more than $11 million that this county has dedicated in the last year just to this effort. And uh, we are prioritizing this. Uh, as you will see in the proposal that we will bring to you in September, we're creating and recommend the creation of a separate program that focuses on gender-based violence uh, so that we can do this right. Because even though we are building capacity for our partners in the community-based organizations, we also need to build our own internal capacity to make sure that we oversee that and that we get to the right outcomes. And so, you know, uh, I just want to put some context to that because that has been a challenge and, and I credit Carla for jumping into this very quickly, getting us to this point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more analogy, just uh, I, um, on an altogether different matter, uh, I have I've been concerned over a period of time about our reimbursement rate for senior meals, for senior meal programs. And part of the challenge was that it was really hard to, for reasons that are neither here nor there, to calculate what's a fair reimbursement. What does it actually cost to provide the meals? Um, that being said, we knew we weren't providing anything that approached the right number, so we were able to take a step to get us at least somewhat closer to the right number while we engage in a very extended process to figure out, all right, really, sharp pencil time, what is the right number? So that's why I wanted to underscore, I think you've got the right basics, which is real problem right now, know that's the fact, let's do something, and then use that opportunity while we've bought ourselves some time to use the time to good purpose. If we let the clerk put a motion uh, panel up on our screen, we could let somebody lean forward and move approval of the recommended action, and that has now been done by Supervisor Chavez. Folks, please put your cards in early on. I Forgive me, but it's uh, hard for us to manage time if people Come on up. Let's. I was reading about the history of his father as well. Anyway, it was a pleasure to see you again, Mr. Smidian. But what can help mitigate these issues uh, are having some events and opportunities for the public to speak regarding their issues, these partner issues you're talking about, if there are more sorts of uh, county uh, things, events, activities for them to do and uh, ways that they can speak, it would alleviate a lot of pressure that they have, generally speaking. 
uh, then make hopefully the costs go down. Of course, we're in that phase right now, and also in light of the Gilroy shooting. So it's just a, uh, something I felt I need to mention. Thanks Thank you for very your much. Time. All right, we have a motion by Chavez, a second by Wasserman. We'll ask all five members to please vote on the screen. All five votes have now been cast. We'll ask the results. Passes 5-0, thank you again. Look forward to hearing from you soon. And that takes us to our next item, and that would be item number 26. We do have five cards on this item, and uh, Let's begin, though, with a presentation from staff, from supervisor, excuse me, from uh, Mr. Preminger and Ms. Christian, and Mr. Minato, apparently, and somebody who's not Steve Preminger. Welcome back. Good afternoon, Danielle Christian, legislative manager. I'm going to give a very broad and quick overview. The report before you is on a Assembly Bill 857, which creates a process for local agencies to create public banks. The bill requires, um, if the bill is enacted, it would require a local agency to conduct and approve a study on the viability of a public bank before moving forward with an application to the Commissioner of Business Operations for a public banking charter. Um, one of the changes to the bill since the time that this report was provided to the Finance and Government Operations Committee is that voter approval to move forward with an application is required at the next regularly scheduled meeting, excuse me, scheduled election held at least 180 days following a vote of a governing body to move forward with an application. So voter approval to establish one here would be required. There are compelling reasons that are outlined in your report to establish a public bank. Um, according to the author, the bill provides more local control, excuse me, a public bank would provide more local control, transparency, and self-determination in how local tax dollars are leveraged in the banking system by allowing local governments to charter their own public banks. The bill's, sponsors, the bill's sponsor asserts that many private commercial banks engage in practices that could be seen as inconsistent with the values of California communities, such as engaging in predatory lending practices, funding private pension, excuse me, funding private prisons and detention centers, and extracting fossil fuels in environmentally unsustainable ways. There are equally compelling challenges um, that led administration to recommend a, a neutral position on the bill, um, some of which include the substantial investment needed to start a bank, implementation issues, and the inherent risks in the banking industry. These issues raise concern about a local agency operating a public bank, particularly because the venture would be financed and operated with taxpayer money. The legislative file provides more information about these issues. Perhaps the most significant and unanswered question is the constitutionality of a public bank. AB 857 does not amend the state constitution to ensure the legality of a public bank. Rather, it directs that question to local agencies to analyze and address. This transfers the legal risk to local agencies that are considering the establishment of a local, of, excuse me, of a public bank. The Finance and Government Operations Committee did receive a report on this bill, um, along with the administration's recommendation to be, have a neutral position on the bill. Um, the FGOC chose to forward the report with a recommendation to support if amended, uh, with amendments needed to address the concerns expressed by administration, the most significant one being the liability, both legal and financial, associated with the establishment, establishment and operation of a public bank. On status, the bill is currently on the Senate Appropriation Committee suspense file. August 30th is the last day for fiscal committees to report bills to the floor. And September 6th would be the last day to amend a bill on the floor, with September 13th being the last day for bills to be passed. So um, a, a short time frame ahead of it. Happy to answer any other questions, and uh, we have staff here from the finance agency that can answer some as well. Thank you very much. Colleagues, we have five speakers. Uh, if you're open to hearing from them uh, now, I think that would be helpful. All right. Why don't we ask Nassim Nouri, Judy Young, Jerry Hunt, Jacob Tonkel, and Mimi Spreadbury to please come on up to the microphone if you would. We'll hear from you all, and then we'll bring the matter to the board for debate, deliberation, and action. Nassim Nouri, Judy Young, Jerry Hunt, Jacob Tunkel, and Mimi Spreadbury. Welcome. Come on up, folks. Uh, Nassim isn't here. Anyone who wants to come up who I just called, come on up.
Good afternoon. My name is Jerry Hunt, and I'm a retired CPA with a background in international uh, accounting. I worked for six or two companies for six years in Europe, and uh, I had a lot of banking experience transferring money from different uh, nations to the United States. Uh, in the 2003 to 2005 time frame, I was a licensed mortgage agent, and I had concerns about the underwriting weaknesses, which were, which led to the 2008 banking uh, Chisholm or crisis, I should say. AB 857 has passed the assembly, and I guess you've already said is, is awaiting Senate appropriations. And uh, the people here mentioned that uh, it has been amended to comply with the California government section 2307. I would recommend, or a question has been raised about the local granting of credit being constitutional, but I think that's more of a state uh, issue with the state legislature than it is with local uh, organ, or local entities. I would recommend an endorsement of AB 857, which may assist a favorable vote in appropriations. There have been numerous other community endorsements. So thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Come on up. Good afternoon, Supervisors. I'm Judy Young, and I'm going to pick up where Jerry left off and speak a little bit about the constitutionality of AB 857. Um, I'm going to read a summary written by Sushil Jacob, who is with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, and he worked with the legislators to author AB 857. Um, so here is, is what he says about um, the constitutionality of AB 857. Uh, the pro bono law firm Cooley addressed the constitutionality with regard to California counties. The law firm's findings were as follows. We conclude that amending California Government Code Section 23007 would be sufficient statutorily to allow a county to lend its credit. We conclude further that California Constitution Article 16, Section 6, would not be an independent bar to the, legislative, uh, the legislature amending Section 23007 insofar as the amendment is made for a specific limited public purpose. The law firm recommended that we include legislative intent, which was included in Section 1 of AB 857, as follows. It is the intent of the legislature that this act, one, authorizes the lending of public credit to public banks, two, authorize public ownership of stock in public banks for the purpose of achieving cost savings, strengthening local economies, support community economic development, and addressing infrastructure and housing needs for localities. So in summary, the constitutionality in AB 857 to enable cities and counties to create a, a public bank has been addressed in the bill itself. So I urge you to vote to support AB 857 to help the bill finish the last few steps towards passing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me welcome our next speaker up. Good afternoon, Supervisors. My name is Mimi Spreadbury. I live in District 2. I'm a part of Divest Silicon Valley and also Orchard City Indivisible. So I'd like to let you know that AB 857 has already gone through in-depth scrutiny by the following California cities and counties, such as Los Angeles, San Francisco City and County, San Diego, Long Beach, Oakland, Richmond, Berkeley, Huntington Park, Eureka, and counties Santa Clara and Alameda. Th this money would keep money, keep funding within the communities to help support um, more affordable student loans, mortgages to better help people in our community and such as women who have a hard time getting loans as well. So please consider supporting AB 857. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just confirm that Nassim Nouri is not here. And also we had a card from Jacob Tonko. I want to make sure that he's not here and does not wish to speak. All right, then we have heard from the three members who submitted cards and um, that will be the last of our cards on this item, please. And um, that brings us, brings the matter back to our board. 
Uh, could we get a motion panel up on the screen, please? And now, colleagues, are there comments, questions, motions? Who'd like to weigh in? Lots of lights. I saw Mr. Wasserman uh, earlier, so I'm going to go to him first, then I'm going to go to Mrs. Ellenberg, then Mr. Cortese, and then Ms. Chavez. Sure, I'll put a motion up to approve a neutral position. I don't think we need a motion to receive the report. If we do, I'll make a motion to receive the report and approve a neutral position. All right, that's a motion by Wasserman. Let me ask if there is a second to the motion from Mr. Wasserman. Is there a second? In the absence of a second, the motion dies for lack of a second and we'll ask the clerk to please clear the screen and repost so that a subsequent motion might be offered. And that's gonna take a minute given our technology. All right, we have a motion panel up on our screen again, and uh, we have uh, Ms. Ellenberg. You're up next. Yeah, I'm wondering if our um, staff, hi, Danielle, I sort of see you under there, can address um, some of the comments that were made during public comment. There, there's really a, quite a discrepancy between the interpretations. Uh, through the chair, I think the most appropriate person to address the questions about the constitutionality would be county council. I believe the legal term for that is a punt, and it was well done, so we go to Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams. The, uh, the, the bill itself does acknowledge that there are, are outstanding questions regarding the constitutionality of public banks. The way the bill resolves that question is basically to ask local agencies to ask their own legal counsel for a confidential opinion on that question. Um, so in essence, basically city attorneys and county councils would be asked confidentially opine on whether a public bank is constitutional. Um, I think it goes without saying that ultimately the opinion of a law firm or the city attorney or a county council isn't gonna resolve the question of constitutionality. That'll have to be resolved by a court of final jurisdiction. So the bill doesn't finally resolve that question. And what particularly is the, the Analysis options were a neutral position or support if amended. What is the specific amended piece that we're talking about? That I would look back to <laughs> intergovernmental relations on in terms of what specific amendments are being sought. I mean, I can think of some things, but I would. Yes, thank you. Through the chair, so the, again, the, the the concerns with the bill are the exposure of, of liability, the, the legal liability, and then the financial liability. I mean, it is, it is um, a very expensive venture to establish, a, to establish a bank at all. And again, there are, are inherent risks in the banking industry. The report indicates the number of banks that have failed since 2000. Since 2000 I want to, my recollection is the number is 555. Um, so amendments to address the the legal concerns, the question about the constitutionality, putting that risk at the local level, and as um, county council mentioned, that, that still doesn't really answer that challenge. Um, and I don't really know how we could amend the bill to address the financial liability. Let me uh, try to expand a little bit on that. Um, <clears throat> a public bank would envision using taxpayers' money <clears throat> to um, basically run a bank, so it's an investment in a bank. Um, we have very strict investment protocols which limit us both from constitutional requirements and also legal or uh, local requirements to invest in very prudent uh, instruments of investment. We essentially invest in uh, paper that has virtually no risk of losing value. Um, this would be a major departure from that policy and put the county at risk, not only for losing significant revenue, but also at risk for having our credit uh, rating uh, degraded significantly because one of the key, key issues that the credit agencies look for is the safety of your corpus. And if you're putting that corpus at risk, with a banking investment, 
um, that will definitely decrease our rating. Um, that will cause increased ba cost for all of our lending and um, any future, you know, all of our current lending and any future lending. So unless the state is willing to take that financial risk, it puts a huge amount of risk on the, the county coffers. So a vote today, however, um, to support if amended doesn't expose us to any potential liability, doesn't commit us to doing this. It simply says that we kind of like this bill if there are some changes. Does it yeah, do any I, more than that? Does it expose us to anything? If I'm understanding what the board's uh, considering, which was considered in committee, basically what we would be saying to the authors is if you can shield the county and local entities from the financial and legal risk, um, which is a big if, but mm -hmm. if you could, then uh, that would be something that you know would be a reasonable uh, action to take. So I don't think it would commit the county. Well, I know it wouldn't commit the county to anything, but it, I don't think it would be unreasonable. Thank you. Sue Rosicrazy, your light is on, sir. Yeah, and I, I would be prepared to make a motion that would be support and seek amendments and to leave some latitude to uh, the county executive's office um, and, and the administrative team and so forth to to try to work through whatever amendments uh, they think they can leverage, whether it's indemnification or, or anything else. I think it would be, um, I don't know, what, what's the opposite of aspirational? Um, it, it feels wrong to have an opportunity to have the legislature move in this general direction to, which is a basically enabling legislation, as I understand it, which would allow us to, you know, to pursue the opportunity if we wanted to as a board of supervisors, as opposed to a mandate. Uh, if I'm wrong, someone should correct me on that. Um, but it also calls for some things, or at least current, the, my current understanding of the bill is that it, it talks about uh, the potential for partnerships with um, uh, with it, industrial loan companies, financial institutions, banks, or credit unions. Um, once upon a time, I had a lot of experience in that business. Uh, it was my private sector bus business experience um, for about six years to run industrial loan company branches, which were once called thrift and loans that eventually became, uh, through deregulation, somewhat extinct in California because uh, they were essentially almost all um, uh, acquired by uh, federally chartered banks. Um, but th with, those, with those industrial uh, loan companies, which were actually, uh, which actually took in private sector deposits too, consumer deposits, uh, used to do is to provide um, the kind of loans that in the community that I think are oftentimes now the exact thing that um, people are being exploited on, that, that, that we have t in the past as a board of supervisors, you know, taken some pretty strong positions against uh, predatory lending, uh, payday loans that are exorbitant. And the opportunity, when we fought back against those a few years ago, those private sector practices, one of the things that we did was to entertain partnerships with the credit union industry uh, to try to figure out if between the two of us, even to, if it's just to the 22,000 county employees, we could provide an avenue for, um, uh, you know, a, a relatively risk-free avenue for um, the opportunity to, to underwrite um, the kind of advances and things that people sometimes need, even at the lower end of our own pay scale. I don't know if it's a good idea. Um, I don't even know. I don't know what it would do to our, our credit rating. That's a good point, um, Dr. Smith. But I don't think we even know what our total assets are, so I'm not sure. I asked uh, by referral over a year ago if we could have uh, the county not just talk about our budget um, as what is now an $8 billion budget. That speaks to, um, that speaks to uh, revenue and expenditures, but also, try to determine for us um, what the total 
assets are of the county. I don't know how many billions of dollars of assets we have and, and whether the rating companies ask that question or not. Um, it seems like they should, but to think that if we perhaps partnered um, with you know, state chartered financial institutions to get away from some of the egregious federal regulation we're seeing uh, over financial institutions in order to have some flexibility to provide some benefits to our own employees, it's hard for me to fathom that we couldn't craft that or limit that um, in such a way that it wouldn't impact um, our significant assets um, you know, versus liabilities and, and also maintain our, our, our credit rating. All of that is interesting discussion, but it's all implementation, which in effect has nothing to do with this bill. This bill is just asking, would, be, would we be, and, and, and of course we can't pass the bill whether we like it or not from here, but <laughs> just asking us whether or not we would, uh, I think we're being asked whether or not we would take a, a support position to this kind of legislation with, with the right kind of amendments. So I, I think we should at least do that and encourage the authors and the state legislature to keep pursuing this, this line of thinking um, and hopefully someday they'll perfect it. And so I'd like to make that motion uh, support with amendments to be determined by uh, the county executive's office. Thank you, Supervisor. That, um Supervisor Chavez has leaned forward uh, to make the motion. Do you uh, want to ask me to clear the board? Or, all right, so could we clear the board one more time, please? All right, now we're going to post the voting panel on our screens. Supervisor Cortese is going to lean forward and make the motion, which he's done. Supervisor Chavez has seconded. Do we have other comments? I see Supervisor Wasserman and then Supervisor Chavez. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to be voting against the motion, not not supporting it. Um, similar to Supervisor Cortese, as far as the financial background, my family started a bank 30 some years ago, Pacific Valley Bank, Pacific Western Bank, and went on and got acquired, similar to what Cortese said, by Comerica and all and all the others. Banks are risky businesses. Um, the county exec made a point about the county can only invest in things like triple A, quadruple A rated plus as secure as possible. A lot of people criticize we're getting a 2% return, we could get a 4 or 5% return. But we're entrusted with the people's money and we have to be as conservative and safe as possible. I may have one of these wrong, but I believe in the last couple of years we we're funding a jail. We just bought a huge amount of square footage of office space in, I'll call it Dr. Smith for lack of a better term, a corporate business park. Um, we just bought a couple of hospitals. We did all these with lease revenue bonds. We're looking to do a civic center master plan that we don't have the funding for. We're looking to do a fairgrounds master plan that we don't have the funding for. Um, we just it's been 10 years of boom. Almost everybody in this room is old enough to remember when we had a bust. My personal opinion, and yes, I'm probably bringing in 35 years as a certified financial planner, and perhaps I'm being too conservative, I don't know. But to me, it's time to, to circle the wagons. It's not time to expand. And if we're going to expand, and I don't call borrowing to buy buildings or build buildings expanding. But if we're going to expand, we need to focus on what the county mission is. And I respect each and every one of my board members and every member of the administration for all the different ideas and the creativity that each of my, my fellow peers has brought to this board. And it's been fun the last 10 years to do that with our revenue going up and up and up and up. There's dark clouds on the horizon, whether it's 10 years of boom, we're due for a bust, whether it's the issues in Washington DC that we have no control over. There's dark clouds, perfect storms coming. Earlier, whatever, three hours earlier, four hours earlier in the first half of this meeting, 
we talked about a, a sales tax measure because we don't have enough money to do all the things that we want to do. I can't argue with that. We don't have enough money. H how we get that money or what we do is a different question, but we don't have as much money to do what we want to do. And now we're talking about perhaps investing money to loan out money we don't have to loan out that has risk. It's just way too many negative things for me to support. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I, I just want to start by saying um, I, I agree with you. I, I'm concerned about dark clouds on the horizon as well. The reason that, um, I'll just state one of the reasons Supervisor Cortezzi and I were asking this to be considered by our colleagues is that the banking industry um, has been a difficult industry for us to interact with on any number of occasions, both in terms of how much it costs us to borrow money um, to the cost of transactions to, um, frankly, to predatory conduct to, I mean, I, the list kind of goes on. And I don't think we on this board would have the ability or the capacity um, to use a public bank in the near term. I really am thinking about all the options that we want to make sure people who come after us have access to. And right now, um, we, we are not in a very strong position when we negotiate with um, banks on any number of issues. Um, and. And I think the point you raised that's just really powerful to me is that as I think about the last economic crisis, that was a crisis that was directly rooted in inappropriate practices by private sector banks and as at, at, for in large part. And so all I'm asking for is to make sure that we create options for the future. It may not be um, de the development of a bank. It may be the ability to work with other cities um, and counties across the state in a new financial partnership for any number of investments. I think that's particularly true as we think about the nine barrier counties and how much more regionally we're trying to think about how problems get solved. So to me, this, this is a zero risk. What we're really saying is we want to support people who are willing to take on the banking industry, number one. Number two, we want to make sure that there's as many options for um, local and, and, frankly, even state government um, to think differently about our relationships with um, the banking industry. And third, to create options for people who come after us so that they have as many tools as they can to get the services provided they need. May I respond, Mr. President? Please do. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm the one who used the terms, you know, dark clouds on the horizon and we're talking about Washington and the uncertainties. Even without any clouds on the horizon, our tax assessor, different departments, things are leveling off. Even if we just maintain the status quo for the next four or five years, as far as revenue, our expenses, we're in the midst of union negotiations. They're gonna go up some amount, whatever that percentage is going to be. Our expenses are gonna go up, medical costs are gonna go up, labor is gonna go up, Everything's going to go up. Even without any dark clouds, I believe we need to stop e expanding. And with, with all respect to what you said about the cost of money, in our last, and, and Dr. Smith, please correct me if I'm wrong because I do not want to misstate something and, and I sometimes do. It was my understanding that in the most recent round of financing, because the county of Santa Clara has the highest credit rating of any county in the state, that we received extremely favorable cost of money, I'm gonna say around 3.2%. When we sold bonds, um, if it was Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, I forget which house it was. Over here I got the right people that, that could tell me. We, uh, we uh, don't do private individual deals for our bonds. We sell them on the market. Yep. So we, because our credit rating is so high, um, our bond rates are very, very, very low. Contrary to some entities, um, most notably redevelopment agencies in the past, 
where they did individual sales, where they would negotiate individually with one particular bank for a loan. We don't do that. We put ours out to market. We put ours out and to got market. a great price. And we got a great price. Thank you. Okay. Other comments, if any. All right, uh, my turn. Um, I have a great many thoughts on this subject, and I'm going to express them in my vote. All five votes have now been cast. Let's ask the clerk to please display the results. The motion carries four to one. The motion pa passes four to one. The uh, one no vote is Supervisor Wasserman, for the record. Thank you all very much. And that takes us, thank you to those of you who stayed for a long meeting, much appreciated. That takes us to item 27, the voting system procurement. Mr. President, maybe I will interject real quickly. We have staff here if the board has questions, but in the interest of time, uh, I think the board has been informed of everything that's in the transmittal. We're asking you to move ahead uh, with an agreement to purchase our new voting system. Keyword there might be lease rather than purchase. Right. Thank you. I think that's an important. Sorry. No, no, purchase no, no worries. temporarily. <laughs> no. Thank you. <laughs> Colleagues, uh, this item came on our draft agenda as a possible item for consent. And I just thought given both the scope of the expenditure uh, but also the uh, importance of the item and the fact that we are going to a new system and the fact that we have had significant board involvement at both the committee and the uh, board, full board level, that it was probably not a good candidate for consent. And so I asked the administration to please put it on the regular agenda, and that is why it is on the regular agenda on this long day. That being said, if there are not uh, comments or questions, fair enough, but I just didn't think it should be uh, on a consent calendar given the fact that this is really decision day for us uh, going forward in terms of what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. So, Ms. Boucher, um, a brief, <laughs> a brief proposal. You want to introduce the folks who are with you so we know who we're talking to and the people on line and listening in know as well. Sure. Uh, Shannon Boucher, Registrar of Voters. I have uh, Matt Morales from the Registrar of Voters and Alice Bailey from Procurement. Thank you. And do we have comments or questions from members of the board? <coughs> Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. No public cards? I don't believe okay. so. Okay. So the, the only two, I, I, I just want to put a concern out that I've been talking to staff about, but I wanted to um, make sure I shared it publicly. And that is that um, I am concerned very much about the, the tech, technology and how quickly it will or won't proceed over the next four to eight years. And so one of the concerns I had was us um, adopting a system for eight years, in part because how few systems had been approved to date <coughs> by the Secretary of State. And so that led me to a concern that if we, either if we had problems and or we saw a, a technology that made it easier for people to even engage in voting, like there are a lot of new ideas that people have about that, how we would be able to respond really to the, the public's need. And I was hoping the staff could just respond to that. Sure, I'll mention some uh, general information then Matt can talk more about the technology. Um, in, included in the contract is during that time frame, we will receive any software updates that do happen throughout the term uh, at no charge. We also have included in the contract uh, at also no charge a refresh of our servers at any time that we ask. So we would receive uh, brand new servers at any time. And with the technology, we're using a lot of off the shelf components and we're able to uh, bring in different items is my understanding uh, if technology is upgraded. So also um, we can, we have a clause in the contract. We have a convenience, a, clause for termination if need be for any unforeseen circumstances that arise during the time. But Matt, if you'd like to talk a little bit more about the, the technology. Shannon, pieces. may I just sure. clarify? I, I think I heard you say a termination for 
for cause but also convenience? But you said them kind of together. Do you mean term termination for cause or termination for convenience, that those are options? Termination for convenience. So and if what's the earliest time that a termination for convenience could be um, taken? Is there a timeline in the contract for that? No restriction. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Supervisor Wasserman, your yes. right is on, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say what a great job you did negotiating as far as lower price and, and making that happen. Um, I wasn't a big proponent of going forward in this direction, but it was the will of the board. And in doing so, you getting the best price for the county, the, the best terms and all, I thank you all very much. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Um, I've got a couple of questions, but I think I'll just uh, handle them offline. They're not uh, sufficiently broad uh, that uh, I need to raise them now. I will just uh, say uh, that um, I think some board members uh, would know we, we have spent some time and energy over the last uh, year and a year and a half on security matters, trying to up our game given the state of play, not just nationally, obviously, but internationally. Um, appreciate the efforts that folks here have played, uh, have made rather in uh, that and um, undertaking and, and also from uh, our privacy and security folks. Um, I'm going to be bringing a referral to the uh, ASSE administration uh, to sort of continue its good work in that regard on election security and integrity efforts. Uh, probably at the next board meeting, maybe the one after that. Just want to kind of tee that up for now and wanted to underscore the fact that while the acquisition of new equipment that is certified um, is a step towards election security and integrity, it is not the totality of what we need to do. I know the team understands that. I just wanted to underscore that for the record and we'll be talking more about that soon. So if we could get the clerk to please display the voting panel on our screens uh, and um, We'll ask if there is a motion to approve the staff recommendation, confirming once again that we do not have any cards on this, Ms. Lanier. Okay. Somebody'd like to lean in. We have a motion to approve the staff recommendation from Supervisor Cortese, a second from Supervisor Chavez. We'll ask all five members to please vote on the screen. That's been done. Let's ask the clerk to display the results so that I can announce that the motion has passed on the 5 0 vote. We'll say thank you to staff, including folks from procurement, by the way. Thank you. All right. Takes us to the next item, and that next item is item 28. And is Mr. Aturia going to present this item? Is somebody going to present this item? I believe this item is still on our regularly published agenda, Madam Clerk. This is a uh, contingency fund uh, appropriation for projects related to the uh, interface between the assessor's office and the assessment appeals office. And uh, it has to do with an approved project, which uh, basically needs additional funding at this point to complete. So. Did you just tell us we're stuck? You're stuck. Thanks. Okay. That's the staff report for today. Thank you. Uh, could we get the clerk to please display the voting panel on the screen? Madam Clerk, do we have any members of the public who wish to speak to this item? Colleagues, in the absence of any members of the public, are there comments or questions from the, uh, the board? And there is a question from Supervisor Ellenberg or a comment. Uh, yes, this is a, a process comment again. Um, my read of this is that the, this funding should have been included in the 2019-2020 budget. Um, is that correct? Right. It was left out erroneously. Okay, so this isn't then a, a policy-driven decision to take money from the contingency fund. No. That's... What I'm concerned about, because now, of course, we'll have to do the mid-year rebalance, and we talked earlier in, in the last fiscal year, I guess later in the last fiscal year, about what under what circumstances we take money from the general 
um, contingency fund reserve to keep it at 5%. Do you, does this happen a great deal? Is this a very unusual occurrence that something was erroneously not included, not included in the budget and now needs to come from that reserve? Usually we pick it up in June, but every once in a while it doesn't get picked up. So all I can say is out of, you know, $8 billion, 318,000 yeah. um, mistake, you know, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a chastisement as much as it was a question about the, the use of the contingency. No, we reserve. don't usually have this problem at this time of the year. Um, but what happens at this time of the year is that we are in the process of developing the approved budget, which uh, most of the public doesn't ever see, although it's published on line, but it's actually the true reconciliation after what we call um, period 16, which is the final reconciliation from last year's budget. And after that reconciliation, sometimes we do find that there are projects that weren't adequately funded or expenditures that were overrun. Usually we can project them within small range in June, but this particular one we didn't. And the reason it got picked up is because we're doing the final budget. Thank you, that's helpful. We have uh, a motion panel on our screens, colleagues. Would somebody like to move the recommended action? Supervisor Chavez has done that. And we have a second as well from Supervisor Cortese. In the absence of any other comments and questions, and seeing none, we'll ask all five members to please vote on their screens. And we'll ask the clerk to please display the result and announce that the motion carries five to zero. Thank you very much. That takes us to item 29, child care resource and referral for CalWORKs families. Mr. Manicacci is uh, on the memo, Dr. Smith. Oh my gosh, look at all this talent rushing us. We have a team so. from uh, social services to present it. Okay. Who would like to introduce the team and give us a brief report? And we'll ask the clerk, meanwhile, to put the motion panel up on the screen. Hi. Hi. How are you? We're good. You've yeah. been waiting all day, huh? Ah, we have. This is your chance. <laughs> okay, don't disappoint now after oh, waiting eight hours, the okay? The pressure's on. All right, go Hi, to uh, it. I'm Angela Sheen, Director of Department of Employment and Benefits Services from the Social Services Agency. I've got with me Rafaela Perez, who's the Employment uh, Services Director, and um, Melinda Waller from the um, County Office of Department of Education, and um, Michael Garcia, also from the County Department of Education, with me today to help present. I understand we have some questions. Well, let me start with this. Uh, this, uh, we have the staff report uh, from Mr. Manicacci, uh, which I'm guessing you all had something to do with. And uh, it's four pages, so I'm pretty sure the board's had a chance to look at it. What's the single most important thing you want us to know that supplements what you've given us? If we didn't get it at all, what's the one thing we need to get? I'm sure everybody got it, but what's the one thing you need to make sure we got? I'll defer to Rafaela to answer that question. She's Rafaela Perez with the Department of Social Services. Um, the one single um, thing that I would um, ask of you is to uh, take our recommendation in relation to uh, defer any further um, actions on uh, the social services uh, proceeding with a uh, resource and referrals program, uh, given that the uh, what we have uh, put in place at this point is working fairly well. Well, it's working really well uh, with a month uh, of imp within the month of implementation. Okay, thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, um, and thank you all, and thank you for staying to the last inning. Is what it feels like. Um, I want to just draw my colleagues' attention to packet page two forty two, and this is the. Um, recommendations and the first recommendation here is essentially is what 
Raphael was just say, saying, in reference to R and R, based on program performance, SSA recommends deferring any further action. So she essentially read your your one into the record. Let me tell you what my favorite part of this was was actually the second part of the recommendation. In regards to child care provider database collaboration, SSA recommends a collaboration with SCOE to explore best practices to support children and families as well as um, child early childhood education providers, including the exploration of the development of a database and the county's role in this effort. And um, I want to both support that, but I want to want to ask for um, a, a timeline and a report back when we can better understand what is happening related to the two um, organizations. I know we've had one or two meetings, but my expectation is this would actually be prioritized um, as a body of work. And then second, I want to um, interject, and, and uh, Dr. Smith, I, I want to highlight this for you to make sure that there's a, a level of comfort here, which is um, short term to make sure that we are, um, lo long term the report talks about potentially needing to change state law, which I think is something that we, we really should take a look at doing relative to creating security, particularly between the offices of the County Office of Education and counties long term. But secondarily, um, looking at a co-investment co in, in access to a new r and provider that I would also just like to make sure that there's a, both a comfort level, but we can include that more specifically in the, um, in the report. I mean, I'm sorry, in, our, in your recommendations. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> then I, I would make a motion to just, with that, Last edition, the other was a reflection of something that was in the report. Motion to approve the staff recommendation, which is simply to receive the report, also to provide direction as indicated. Uh, that is from Supervisor Chavez with a second from Supervisor Ellenberg. We'll ask all five members to please vote on their screens. We have one member who has not yet voted, but I also need to go to Ms. Ellenberg. Forgive me, my apologies. Uh, I, I just want to express appreciation for how hard you've you've worked to try to make something happen that just seems to not want to happen. Um, and also to appreciate the work with the County Office of Education. I think ultimately um, a strong partnership there is going to be the best way to go ahead, but delighted for you to, that's, to hear that the current system is working, at least for now, and that you're, you're continuing to focus on that. So thank you. Thank you all. All votes have not been cast. The clerk will please display the results so that we can announce that the motion carries 5-0. Thank you all very much. And again, thanks for hanging with us over a long day. Okay. And that takes us to the next item on our agenda, which is item number 30. And item number 30 is the community health clinic subsidy contracts. And... <coughs> This is, uh, you're going to ask for... Actually, report. I was going to ask the clerk to display the voting panel on the screen, then I was going to turn to Dr. Smith, who was going to tell us that as much as we'd like to get to a uh, better system for compensating our clinics, uh, that that's been a challenging transition and that these are funds designed to get us through that transition until such time as we can make that real. You're omniscient. <laughs> there you go. That's a polite way to put it. Thank you very much. Anything else you'd like to offer, offer Dr. Smith? If, if not, then we'll say thank you to Supervisor Chavez for her motion. I will lean forward and push the second button while I check with County uh, Clerk to uh, the Clerk of the Board to see if we have any speakers on this issue. We do not. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, and in all seriousness, as Chair of the Health Committee, we've been monitoring uh, closely um, the sort of challenges of getting to this better place, which I think we all agree is a better place in terms of how we manage health care and reward uh, good outcomes. but. Um, the first go around on contracts was a struggle uh, to sort of make sure that people could continue to do their work. So this is part of that transition. And I'm going to ask all five supervisors to vote on the screen because I've got one more. And now that we have that five votes, we'll ask uh, the clerk to display the result and indicate that it passes 5-0. And we should not let the brief discussion in any way suggest that this wasn't an important item because it's a very big deal to a lot of people who count on us. Thank you very much. That takes us to item number 31, or it would, except that issue's already been dealt with on our consent calendar. So now we're at item 32. Colleagues, I don't want to forestall any uh, conversation, but I sense the 
energy levels may be flagging. So I'm going to ask the clerk of the board to please display the voting panel on our screens. This deals with official county seals use ordinance. I'm going to lean forward and second Supervisor Ellenberg's motion to approve. We have no cards on this item. Comments or questions from members of the board? None. Then we'll ask uh, the uh, supervisors to please vote on their screen. We've got just a couple. Okay. I believe Mr. Wasserman broke his screen. Uh, I see. Okay. All right. We'll ask all five members to please vote on their screen. Getting a little punchy here at the end. I believe your vote is counted. Can I ask a question? Please. I don't, that's what I is said. There, are there, this is for County Council, is, are there any practical considerations we need to be aware of in our offices once this is adopted that are different from what they were this morning? Is it a difference from the, what they were this morning? Yeah, prior to, prior to this item. What, what, what changes for us, if for, anything, as board members? As um, board members. The, based on what I believe to know about the practices that, that board offices have, I don't think there would be a change. I may not be fully aware of everyone's practices as to how uh, seals are being used, but based on my knowledge of, of what's happening, there should not be a change. The number one thing that these ordinances do is prevent outside parties from utilizing the county seal without authorization. Uh, there's not an existing prohibition on that. So yeah, if maybe we can just, I'm going to support this, but get some kind of a practical um, primer on what you were just talking about in terms of when, what, what we mean exactly by outside parties using the seal, because my experience is that oftentimes an organization um, could be one that we approved a sponsorship for today as, as a board of supervisors um, will on their own uh, put up the county seal just on a, you know, at a third party event and a non-county event to, just to try to be nice to us and, and, you know, let the world know that the county is participating. So I just want to make sure we aren't complicit in anything that crosses any lines here and sure, subsequent we, we to this, if you could just give us some do's and don'ts. Um, in an off agenda report, that would be helpful. Yeah, we can definitely provide guidance. Thank you, and I apologize. I didn't have extensive notes for my staff on this one, so I just wasn't clear, but I will support it. Thank you. Thank you. I believe we now have all five votes cast and recorded. We'll make sure that the technology is working well. Up, oh, all five have been recorded and the motion carries five to zero. Madam Clerk, if you could put the screen up for item number 33, which uh, Mr. Williams, I'm gonna describe as a sort of a companion measure, yes? And I'm going to lean That's forward correct. and push the motion button. Uh, and uh, Supervisor Chavez has uh, offered up a second. I'm going to see if there are any questions on this one. Colleagues, any questions? If not, then we'll ask all five members to please vote on the screen. And Madam Clerk, I'm counting on you to let me know if there are any members of the public, but I uh, gather there are not. All five votes have been cast. Please display the results so that I can announce that the motion is carried five to zero. Once again, that's item 33, passing five to zero. That takes us then to item 34, or would have, except we uh, held that on, so I think the next one is actually item 38. Is that correct? All right. Why don't we ask uh, staff to introduce this uh, item, and um, we'll have some comment and questions, and then move to a vote. Good afternoon. My name is David Berry. I work for Facilities and Fleet Department, Chief of Planning, and with me is Consuelo Hernandez with the Office of Supportive Housing. I have before you a delegation of authority to proceed with negotiations with uh, Mercy Housing um, to develop teacher housing at uh, 231 Grant Avenue in Palo Alto. And I'm uh, available for any questions you might have. Thank you. First, let me say thanks to the team, and if I could ask the clerk to please display the voting panel on the screen, I'll lean forward and make the motion on this. Appreciate a second from Supervisor Chavez. A couple of things um, for the team. First, thank you. Uh, as I have said in my office, uh, now it's real. Uh, we had a site. We had the beginning of some funding. Uh, we had interest from school district partners, and now we actually have a development partner who's in the development business 
who can make this thing real going forward. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, in general, I'm a little more formal uh, with last names rather than first names, but today I want to say, Consuelo, it was a pleasure to see your parents at the veranda yesterday. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were understandably and appropriately proud of you. And I rarely get this personal at board meetings, but I wanted to today uh, as part of the celebration yesterday and the progress today. So thank you on that. Um, colleagues, uh, if, if I understand correctly, uh, and uh, the county staff uh, has um, asked, uh, as is mentioned in the report, uh, for folks to submit their proposals. They got four different applications after going through the process. Uh, all I gather from what they tell me, uh, pretty qualified folks. So um, this was a place where we had some real competition, which pleased me. This is the committee's recommendation, and just on the record, this is the committee and staff's recommendation, and it's a clear recommendation, yes? Okay. Um, the one thing I would ask going forward, uh, and it's a small thing, um, and it may surprise you, is, the delegation of authority, uh, which I'm prepared to support today, uh, is uh, for, uh, it says on the memo, for Palo Alto teacher housing. I'd like to take the words Palo Alto out going forward. And the reason for that is um, this is a regional effort. We're trying to bring folks from the region in, and frankly, we're trying to do a, a, a pilot in the general sense, if not in the legal sense, to sort of spread the enthusiasm. And I, I worry that if we keep referencing Palo Alto, I mean, yes, it's at 231 Grant Avenue in Palo Alto, as the memo says, but, you know, we've got four other districts that have expressed interest, uh, and uh, we hope more to come. So if we could just call it the Teacher Housing Project at Grant Avenue or the Grant Avenue Teacher Housing Project, whatever you want to call it, but I just, I don't want people to think of it as a Palo Alto-specific slash limited project going forward. So, Supervisor Chavez, your light is on, and then yeah, Supervisor um, Cortese's light is on as so well. So I think this is really exciting, and I'm, I'm, I agree, I think it's such a great opportunity to see how to make these um, projects work. Um, I have two requests as these documents come forward to us. I think it would be very important to um, create a, a consistent um, kind of a term, she term sheet and mechanism for us to look at these because um, what I'm wanting to better understand is under what terms and conditions we leverage X amount of public dollars to equate to, you know, both what the rate of return is on the lease and also what what we're paying per door, whatever that box is, if it's measure A or whatever the, the, the source is, what the total public investment is, and then what we think that leverages from the private investment. One of the reasons I'm raising it in this example is that the, given that the, the this is, um, it's teacher housing and we have, cash that we're putting in to support the debt service, since the presumably the rents would be much uh, much higher, it would, it would appear to me that that would make sense then that the public sector investment would be lower. Now there may be a reason that that's not the case, but from the staff report, I don't understand what that reason is, and I don't understand how to, uh, how to learn from this and or assess this relative to other projects. Today I'm, I'm I'm not as concerned about it because this is a first and that, that may have some implications. But what I would just ask is off agenda, if, the, if we could get an explanation of, of that um, with, with something that looks consistent that would allow us to measure apples to apples and or understand when we're really measuring apples to lemons. And sometimes that has to do with the, the project mix, right? The housing types that, the, that you're looking at and there could be other other reasons for that, including that we have partners that are buying in, so to speak, and that by buying in, they get a rate, some sort of a reciprocity for that buy-in. But again, that didn't get reflected in the final, and it's just a two-pager on the end where you are in the process. So those would be my requests. But it's not out of lack of enthusiasm. It is really out of more wanting to understand what the implications of the funding structure is, and particularly in partnership with any single developer. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? If not, could we ask all five members to please vote on their screens? And all five votes having been cast, we'll ask the clerk to display the results and announce that the result is a 5-0 aye vote. Thank you all very much. Thank you again to staff. 
I know your five minutes here reflects hours and hours and hours over a very long period of time. So much appreciated. All right. That takes us to jails. Uh, item 40, thank you. I'm, I need to take a deep breath here, so. All right. So, uh, Mr. Draper, no, you're not Mr. Draper. This is Roger Sui, Deputy Director of Facilities and Fleet. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I know it's been a long day. Supplemental work allowance. Um, did we skip 39? We got, I think 39 was held. Okay, no, that's all right. We had a little back and forth there. Uh, so on this item, um, tell us what a supplemental work allowance is and why we have one, please. So supplemental work, work allowance is, is a really contract capacity that we give to the contract to do stuff that are unforeseen or additional scope. So uh, basically it's a, okay, we may be surprised during the course of the project and we want to have some dough stashed aside to deal with the surprises, yes? Correct. Okay. So my question is this, and I, and I really don't have a conclusion. It really is a question. It's not a rhetorical question. The number went up from 100000 to 300000 $300,000 is 300% of 100000 or a 200% increase. Um, so it's one thing to be surprised. It's another thing to be really surprised. Um, should we not be troubled that the number went up that dramatically? Um, this is actually, uh, even to us, it's a pretty high percentage. We don't normally go this high. Um, the, the difficulty in this one is that because we're actually within an existing space and there's stuff that's being purchased after the contract was released, which is the, some of the medical equipment. And because they don't quite line up with what's already been in in the ward to the contractor, we have to make some modifications. We don't think that we'll need the full 300,000, but we don't want to have to come back and ask for more capacity. Okay. All right, I'll just say the, the percentage increase, uh, even though the dollar amounts in the scope of jail construction are relatively modest, uh, I was just startled that we thought we had a contingency and it turned out we had to increase our contingency by another 200%, um, caught my eye. Uh, Supervisor Cortez, I see your lights on and then Supervisor Ellenberg. Can, can you remind me, um, any anyone, um, what our threshold is for application of the project labor agreement? Two million dollars. Requirements, it's two million. Two million dollars. So they're not yet up to, to that. They're at a million nine on this contract thus far. Is that uh, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Right, uh, actually, I'm sorry. Um, th they were awarded uh, eight hundred nine thousand dollars for the contract, of of which hundred thousand was that was for supplemental. So I'm just going with what your transmittal says. It says a total new contract encumbrance of a million and nine thousand. Yeah, nine thousand. Yeah, one million nine thousand. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. You answer the question. Can we get the voting panel on our screens, please, even as I look to Ms. Ellenberg for the next comment or question? Thanks. Um, I don't have an issue with the particular underlying item or, or bid, but in general, concerns about um, the, the capital improvement projects at the jail. There seem to be a great number that are taking more time, costing more than originally um, estimated. Just in this budget, we also have item uh, 39. And in May, I had requested that FAF report to PSJC on the backlog of capital improvement projects. I haven't yet um, seen that report agendized. So if it is not going to come on the next PSJC meeting, I'd like to get a notification as to when we can expect it. Yeah, I, I, I do know that we pulled all information together already. Um, so I can definitely get your data as to when you should get it, but we have pulled all the information Good. from our reports as to what the potential backlog is. Okay, then if, if, if that can get onto the next meeting, that would be helpful. Nope. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do we have a motion to approve? All right, motion by Wasserman and a second by somebody please. Ms. Ellenberg, thank you. Let's ask all five members to please vote on their screens. And we'll ask the clerk to display the results. 
And that one passes four to zero with one member absent, that member being Supervisor Chavez, who had to step away for a brief moment. All right, that brings us to item 41, Unipro Serra Boulevard, no parking resolution. And let me turn to the county council, believe it or not, and see, do we have to do a formal public hearing on this or can we just adopt the resolution? All right, then if the clerk will please post the voting panel on our screens. I'm familiar with the site. I'm familiar with the project. I'm going to lean forward and uh, make the motion. I don't want to cut you off, Mr. Freitas. I know you put on your tie just to talk to us, and I appreciate that. But uh, we have a second from Mr. Wasserman. Any comments or questions for Mr. Freitas? Mr. Freitas, anything that needs to be said? Prepared to take yes for an answer today? Then let's ask the clerk to please display the results. And the motion carries 5-0. Well done, Mr. Freitas. Thank you very much. All right, items that were removed from the consent calendar. Uh, item 86, I believe, Ms. Ellenberg, you asked for this item to come off consent. Yes, ma'am? I did, uh, and and I will quickly explain why. Um, again, it's a, it's a sponsorship question. It serves a wonderful public purpose. The um, LGBTQ programming at the fair, the fairgrounds, Management Corporation is a 501c3, but not only has this event already passed, but um, we evidently promoted the Office of LGBTQ as being a sponsor at the fair. Um, our logo is lined up with Aki and Hope and Project Moore and Silicon Valley Pride without it being approved first. So. Again, this is a little bit different from the sponsorship by board members, but to me, it still um, demonstrates that we are not, we're not careful or responsible about timing issues. I don't know if there was a particular reason here. I'm happy to hear it. It has passed, and I understand that the funds are intended to come from your office budget as opposed to the general fund budget, which is probably the only reason that I don't want to that I'm likely not to vote no. I do think it's it's a great cause and reason, but I think the process really was lost here. So if you want to share anything about that before I decide how to vote, I'm happy to hear it. Sure, through the chair. Um, the, the, the sponsorship itself was not approved through the board, and what you saw was the promotion of our office in collaboration with other entities that support and um, are part of the planning process without the fair. This is the second year in which our county fair has participated in this um, out at the fair campaign. And so through several community meetings, several other organizations of which uh, logos were presented on the advertisement, mm -hmm. um, that was a, a, a publication strategy so that community members could see that this event had been vetted through community organizations. So the logo placement on those advertising was toward that effect. So that was totally separate from the sponsorship. Correct. The sponsorship in question is for directly the, the, the ability for Out at the Fair to provide family-friendly entertainment. That's the sponsorship in a very specific way for that particular stage. Um, and we did, uh, we did explain to them that sponsorship is contingent on board approval, and they were doing so in, in securing um, the entertainment at their own risk in terms of if it was not approved, then it, they would find other means to support that. So the money has already been spent our spon by, for whatever was going to be sponsored for the entertainment. Right, the, the event is over, the, the, the event money is was. Over. They have incurred a cost. And so they relied on, you, you told them that they didn't, that they couldn't officially rely on us, but that was certainly the that suggestion that that would be forthcoming. Correct. And why did the request come in so um, late? Through the chair, um, that um, we were in the planning phase and they had not, we had encouraged them to seek out um, a family an age-friendly family entertainment. 
and that was the, the request that they said in order to do so, it would be great to know that there would be some additional funding that we could lean on, and we agreed to move forward in this fashion um, with the earliest date being this August date. Mr. Dampos wants to answer, mm -hmm. I think, yes. Sure. Thank you, thank you if I made through, through the chair, president's committee and supervisors. I think essentially when the request was made of us, I, I think that the earliest that we could come to the board was uh, this meeting. Uh, going forward, I think that we understand what you're saying, Supervisor. Uh, we will make it clear to folks uh, that unless they uh, come to us for a request so that the approval happens before the event, we will not be in a position to uh, support the event. In this case, uh, we brought it forward to you as quickly as we could, and uh, you know we apologize uh, and recognize that that's not how it should be done. Uh, what we indicated to this uh, entity was that this this is not how we normally do these things, uh, but given the importance of the event uh, for what we're trying to accomplish in this office, that we would non nonetheless, you know, bring it to the board with the understanding that the board could decide, as you could today, not to fund it. I do agree that it's important, and I hope that the organizations that you work with can hear that message, and once we, we get it together here with that message, we can put it out so that you're not put in a position of getting a request so late, uh, because that would have been a shame to turn down. I, I agree with you, uh, but it's frustrating that it happens this way. So I will leave it at that. Thank you. All right. Could we get the voting panel up on our screens? We'll say thank you to the staff. We're looking for a motion to approve, and we have a motion from Supervisor Cortese and a second from Supervisor Chavez. We'll ask all five members, please vote on the screen. That's been done. We'll ask the clerk to display the results, and we'll announce that the motion passes four to zero with one abstention, okay? Ms. Elmberg, I'm gonna call that a message abstention, okay? That's what that, all right. Thank you all very much. So that's a message abstention, all right. Thank you. And I believe that leaves us with just one item, Madam Clerk, and that's item 121, yes. And that's the Vietnamese American Service Center. I believe Supervisor Chavez had an interest in taking this one up. Thank you. Um, so I have a, a question around process. And the question around process is that in the staff report it says, based on a limited number of subcontractors, both the design consultant and the construction management consultant recommended that we do a new bid uh, with a, a pre-qualification mechanism, which I want to I want to talk a little bit about that. But my question is, when we when is it customary for staff to reject a bid and without coming to the board? And it, is that part of the scope of authority that we gave last time? And that's why we didn't hear about it till late, till after that action had been taken? Well, actually, we're coming to the board to reject those bids. Well, my understanding is that the, the you know, Gilbane and others have already been informed that they're, they're not, that we're not proceeding and that they let go of subcontractors already. So practically, I, I mean, a, so from a practical perspective, we, we didn't wait. And that may be a courtesy we provide or not, but I'm curious about that from a, both a timing and a process perspective. It, it may be a timing, but um, that is our intent. It's come to the board to make those decisions, which is why we're coming to the board to reject the bids and to be authorize us to rebid it. Um, I think what <clears throat> happened is Gil Bain was told that we were coming to the board to ask for authority to reject. Staff does not reject it. However, we do inform the contractor of our intent to go to the board. So on the on the recommended actions, I, I'm sorry that I don't I don't see the I don't see the rejection component. I see what what the next steps are, but not not the rejection piece. Correct. I mean, we may have put it actually on there, but that is our intent. Is to come to the board for those decisions, which is why we're here. Um, it may have not written clearly enough to state that. I didn't see that statement in there. 
So when the subs were released from their bids, how did that occur? So the process is, um, because this is a CMAR, we are at a junction now where we can make a decision to either continue on with the contractor, which is still available, or else we rebid the process, um, which is where we're at right now. But we, we already released the subcontractors from their bids. We don't release the subcontractors. Uh, we only have a contractual obligation to the prime contractor, which is Gilbane. What we've done is we've concluded the pre-construction phase, which is what we've advised them. We're, we're ending that now, we're concluding that. So it's just the next process now is how do we award the contract, the construction piece of it. Hmm. Well, let me go to my next question. My next question is that we're, we're going back out for bids because we anticipate that we're going to get a lower cost um, bid. Is that accurate? Uh, that is not necessarily uh, true. We are going back out to bid um, because we don't feel that there was sufficient subcontracting bids that we saw. We're going to go back out. Hopefully, we could get better pricing, but there's no guarantee of that. What it will do is, is uh, at least um, solidify for us that the bids are correct. It's so just that we don't have enough um, cost information to determine that we have the best bid out there. So, Roger, is your point that Gilbane did not have a full complement of subcontractors and therefore you did not believe the cost that they put forward was their best, I mean, was accurate? Not so much accurate, but we don't think they, they received enough competition from the subcontractors. Some of the uh, systems we saw only had single or, single or two bids. So again, my, my, my so your, your point is, is that you do not believe, I, either they didn't, you don't believe they had the best price or you don't believe that they had enough subcontractors to make the bid solid. I'm, I'm not sure I understand what the concern yeah, was. The concern is we, we don't think that there was a uh, large enough pool of subcontractors. By going out, there may be a different contractor out there that may be able to reach a higher level of subcontractors to get the pricing. So we are doing this because we're trying to bring the price down. That you, a minute ago, I'm, I'm, yes. I'm yes. just trying to get really direct because I, I frankly, I want to make sure I can explain this to the community and I, I'm not sure I can, but if we were looking for a better price, we may or may not get a better price. Correct. Okay. So now let me just go to timeline. So we're now saying that the, the, this is going to delay the project by two to three months in the overall project schedule. Is that? Yes, that's correct. And what is that based on? Based on what happens when we go out to bid, it puts us into the, um, into the rainy season, which is November. And so we try and build a little bit of contingency in there in the event that we, we run to, to rain. Um, the issue with us with running to rain, we're doing the groundwork. We can't get proper compaction on the soils. So we're trying to make sure we build enough time to allow us to do that. So this brings me back. Um, so first of all, I, I, I think it would have been wonderful to know b b or as early as possible that this was a decision that you all were considering and that we would have had an opportunity to weigh in on that because the, the critical question here is we have a minimum two or three month delay we may or may not be able to bring down the price. And if for some reason the price comes back higher, then, then what? Th I mean, then what's the recommendation to the board? I think at that point we would at least have confirmation that the numbers that we're seeing is what's out there in the market. If the price comes back higher. Yes? Yes. Okay. Let me try to add. Um, it's not just that we think that there can be a better price, but it's also 
we don't think the Gilbane can complete the project as their bid response suggests. So the question was using our professional judgment, do we think we're gonna have a major delay and cost overrun later in the project? Or do we test out the market and see if there's someone who can respond with a larger panoply of subs and a better worked out price so that we um, do give up some delay in the bid process, but we have some certainty with the results in the end. So Dr. Smith, may I ask, just, uh, this is a, again a process question. When, when that happens, when we get a bid like that, that bid is, why would we not consider that a non-responsive bid? Technically, I mean, well, like it, this is there's two phases of this project since it's a um, construct uh, CMR bid. So the con general con general um, come on general contractor is at risk. So the the f first phase of the uh, bid is to actually design the um, structure, the second bid is to actually build it. And this is where we are, we're in the, the middle between the first and the second structure. And essentially what we're saying is, they did a pretty good job with the design, but we don't think they have the firepower to actually do the build on budget. Okay. So I think, the the message that I would suggest to the public, what I would tell the public is, we think that based on the design and our understanding of their bid for the second phase, which is construction, and our understanding of the market in terms of the availability of subs, that um, this was a decision about whether we actually thought we could get it built in their time frame or not, and at the cost that they suggested. And what we're suggesting to the board is that we go back out for another bid process. Now, Gilbane is certainly, you know, welcome to bid again, and they might bid the same bid for construction, but um, this is, well, I explained it. Thank you. Supervisor Vertese on this item. Yeah, I appreciate all the questions that Supervisor Chavez has uh, it asked. Uh, we've certainly, <clears throat> the two of us particularly, have spent a lot of time, an awful lot of time in community meetings and putting out scheduling information that we've relied upon, the community's relied upon, that has been provided to us by um, the administration. Um, so I share her concerns about <clears throat> um, what's still kind of a fairly ambiguous explanation about why we're going out for a rebid. Um, I don't know um, Gil Bain through any kind of personal or professional relationship. We certainly know them from years and years of doing contracting uh, here in Santa Clara County with municipal agencies with the county itself. Um, as I recall, they were, um, <clears throat> they were the general contractor or uh, at least um, the, the project manager of the San Jose International Airport expansion. So I don't suspect that they would put a, a bid out that they couldn't deliver upon. Um, and there should be mechanisms in place to to ensure us from a, from a contractor that big, payment and performance bonds and so forth, that they are going to produ produce. So they put a price out. Um, I, I think that should be the least of our concerns um, with an organization of, of that magnitude, a coast to coast type of a, a contractor that operates in most of the 50 states as I understand it. That said, what I'm particularly concerned about is, um, I'm sure you have concern. It sounds a little cavalier when you talk about, well, you know, we're gonna get into November and then there's gonna be rain and then there might be more delay. Why wouldn't we, separate out the grading and compaction and the foundation work and, and get that work done now, either uh, particularly if 
if that can be negotiated with Gilbane, which has already produced a proposal, um, it, it seems to me that um, the project delays alone that, that doesn't preclude us from from bidding out the rest of the rebidding out the rest of the subs on the project, the rest of the trades, you know, coming up from the foundation, the framing, the plumbing, the electrical, and everything else. Why wouldn't we do that just to beat, you know, your we, your, your we concerns had, about 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 weather? We actually had looked into that. We actually had discussion with Gilbane. Um, the pricing we saw, as well as the exclusions put the county at a greater risk when they split the work like that. Um, but we did have an extensive discussion with Gabe Gilbane about that. That was definitely a proposal that we put out there to find a way to expedite, get us out of the rain. Well, I think at some point you have to, you have to balance risk um, with accountability to the public and to us, frankly. Uh, if you guys you know, start to get too conservative about risk to the county, I don't know what that means. It's very ambiguous to me again. Um, but, you know, if this is, if this is going to be our MO in terms of how we deliver construction projects as we go into a jail, as we go into s several other projects, a Civic Center Plaza here, affordable housing next door, potentially something at the fairgrounds, um, you're not building a lot of trust in your, in your own ability to deliver. And that's for everybody who's you report to, and with the exception of this dais, I'm talking about up here, um, getting off, this project hasn't even really literally broken ground yet. We did a ceremonial groundbreaking and already we're talking about delays and already talking about essentially planning that put us in jeopardy of, of having weather delays, rain delays, and you start this project, you know, with rain delays, the cost of those, the change orders for those delays is gonna be significant as well. So I'm sure you've analyzed that, but I think the highest risk that you have is your own credibility. I'm just saying that bluntly, okay? So take that under advisement. You know, figure out how to deliver the project on time or risk your own credibility, with, with me at least. I don't speak for anyone else on this board, but I'm, I'm gonna continue to be here for the next 16 months riding herd on what you're doing. It's unacceptable thus far that you put us in this position, period. Understood. We are gonna ask the clerk to please post the voting panel on the screen. And uh, we'll see if there's a motion. And let me just ask staff before we ask for the motion, should the motion include specifically the rejection of the bid? Addition to the the four second three phase, steps. yes. Yeah. So D would be rejection of current bid, to be accurate. Yes. Well, second phase. Well, we they already did the first phase of the bid. Rejection, right? Rejection of the second phase bid. Right. As an item D. Supervisor Chavez, that is your motion, yes, ma'am. Yes. All thank right. You. We're looking for a second on this item. We're adopting the staff's recommendation, A, B, C. I just added a D. That's a rejection of the second bid phase because it wasn't included. That's the body of the language. Okay. We have a motion by Chavez, a second by Mr. Wasserman. And we're going to ask all five members to please vote on the screen. All five votes have now been cast. We'll ask the clerk to please display the results. And we will announce that it carries four to one. Again, the motion carries four to one. Supervisor Cortese voting no on the motion. Thank you very much to staff. Let me confirm with the clerk of the board that is our last item for the day. And let me thank you all for a long day. And without objection, hearing none, we stand adjourned.
Wait, was testing. This is the ordinance list report for the Board of Supervisors meeting of Tuesday, August 13th, 2019. Item number 32, introduction and pre preliminary adoption of ordinance number NS-300.937, adding division B39 of the Santa Clara County Ordinance Code relating to the use of official seals of the County of Santa Clara and of the Board of Supervisors. Item number 33, introduction and preliminary adoption of ordinance number NS-300.928, amending sections A36-1, A36-3, and A36-8 of division A36 of the Santa Clara County Ordinance Code relating to commercial marketing on county property. Item number 46, introduction and preliminary adoption of salary ordinance Ordinance number NS-5.20.07, amending Santa Clara County Salary Ordinance number NS-5.20, relating to compensation of employees adding one welfare fraud investigator position in the Social Services Agency. Item number 50, introduction and preliminary adoption of Salary Ordinance number NS-5.20.14, amending Santa Clara County Salary Ordinance number NS-5.20, relating to compensation of employees adding one chief psychologist position in custody health services. Item number 54, introduction and preliminary adoption of Salary Ordinance number NS-5.20.13, amending Santa Clara County Salary Ordinance number NS-5.20, relating to compensation of employees deleting one half-time graphic designer two position and one half-time social media slash internet communications specialist position and adding one public communications specialist position to the public health department. Item number 58, introduction and preliminary adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.20.06, amending Santa Clara County salary ordinance number NS-5.20, relating to compensation of employees adding one psychiatric social worker two or marriage and family therapist two or marriage and family therapist one or psychiatric social worker one position in the behavioral health services department and one community worker position in the office of supportive housing. Item number 60, introduction and preliminary adoption of master salary ordinance number NS-5.20 for fiscal year 2020, amending the compensation and salary of deputies, assistants, and employees in such offices and repealing all other ordinances in conflict herewith. Item number 62, introduction and preliminary adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.20.01, amending Santa Clara County ordinance Salary ordinance number NS-5.20 relating to compensation of employees deleting one supervising account clerk one position and adding one payroll audit supervisor position in the controller treasurer and amending the salary schedule to add the classification of payroll audit supervisor. Item number 63, introduction and preliminary adoption of salary ordinance number ns Dash 5.20.02, amending Santa Clara County Ordinance Number NS-5.20, relating to compensation of employees deleting seven stock clerk positions and adding seven messenger driver positions in the Social Services Agency, and amending the salary schedule to increase the salary for the messenger driver classification by 3%. Item number 65, introduction and preliminary adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.20.03, amending Santa Clara County salary ordinance number NS-5.20, relating to compensation of employees adding one vehicle use coordinator position in the probation department and amending the salary schedule to add the classification of vehicle use coordinator. Item number 66, introduction and preliminary adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.20.04, amending Santa Clara County ordinance, salary ordinance number 
NS-5.20 relating to compensation of employees amending the salary schedule to increase the salary for the chief radiation therapist classification by 20%. Item number 67, introduction and preliminary adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.20.05, amending Santa Clara County salary ordinance number NS-5.20 relating to compensation of employees, deleting four three-fifths time senior clinical laboratory scientist or clinical laboratory scientist two or clinical laboratory scientist one positions, three four-fifths time senior clinical laboratory scientist or clinical laboratory scientist two or clinical laboratory scientist one positions and 21 senior clinical laboratory scientist or clinical laboratory scientist two or clinical laboratory scientist one positions and adding three three-fifths time clinical laboratory scientist two or clinical laboratory scientist one positions three four-fifths time clinical laboratory scientist two or clinical laboratory scientist one positions, 11 clinical laboratory scientist two or clinical laboratory scientist one positions, one clinical laboratory scientist systems specialist or associate clinical laboratory scientist systems specialist position, one senior clinical laboratory scientist or clinical laboratory scientist two or clinical laboratory scientist one positions, and nine supervising clinical laboratory scientist positions in Santa Clara County, in Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. Item number 68, introduction and preliminary adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.20.08, amending the Santa Clara County ordinance, salary ordinance number NS-5.20, relating to the compensation of employees attending the salary schedule, excuse me, amending the salary schedule to increase the salaries of various classifications. Item number 69, introduction and preliminary adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.20.09, amending Santa Clara County salary ordinance number NS-5.20, relating to compensation of employees, increasing the salary of the director, offered Office of Veterans Affairs, by 17.5%. Item number 88, introduction and preliminary adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.20.11, amending Santa Clara County salary ordinance number NS-5.20, relating to compensation of employees, adding footnote 809 to extend the expiration date for one unclassified senior management analyst or management analyst position in the office of the county executive. Position shall expire at 11.59 p.m. on April 5th, 2020. Item number 96, introduction and preliminary adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.20.12, amending Santa Clara County salary ordinance number NS-5.20, relating to compensation of employees adding one stock clerk position in the county library district. Item number 104, introduction and preliminary adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.20.10, amending Santa Clara County or salary ordinance number NS-5.20, relating to compensation of employees deleting one criminal investigator two or criminal investigator one position in the office of the district attorney. This concludes the ordinance list report for the Board of Supervisors meeting of Tuesday, August 13th, 2019.